Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, everyone else. Welcome back to another one of these. Yeah, it's time for another one of these. No one wants this. They get it's funny because they get progressively like fewer and fewer views, and I, I I don't even I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. I'm gonna keep doing it. This is what I like to call uh, degrowth. <laughs> See, my channel is getting too big. It's it's growing too fast because I keep making good videos. So this this is what I like to call degrowth. Okay, controlled deceleration. Like we wanna wanna keep it low key out here. Okay, we don't we don't we need to slow the growth and ideally keep it in a stable state at roughly a thousand to two thousand subscribers. Okay, if I ever go over, if I if I mean look, I don't think it's gonna happen personally. I don't think it's going to happen. Like, I'm not sitting here, like, thinking my videos are high enough quality that I would ever reach this stage. But let's say, hypothetically, something happens, a video pops off or something. Like, I don't, I don't want to get more than that, okay? I don't, I don't want that to happen. That's, that sounds terrible to me. So this is a little thing we like to call degrowth. We like to call it a controlled burn. A controlled burn. Okay. Welcome back to another 12-hour podcast in the Slice of Life podcast series. Yeah. Uh, I regret a couple of things in the last episode. The first thing I regret is not truncating the silences. Because when I was listening back to it, I was like, should I bother doing that? But then I have to keep recording it. Fuck it. I already have a good ending. So I didn't do it. And I think it's worse. So I think for this one, I'll probably end up truncating those goddamn silences as they were meant to be truncated because who wants silence this ain't john cage okay <laughs> this ain't fucking john cage right the second funny amusing thing i was gonna call it a regret but i, I don't know what it is is that at the beginning of the last one i say i'm gonna do these things and i did none of them and that's really funny i think i said i'd finish send and banker which i did do I also said I'd finish Strike Witches and Neon White, and I didn't do either of those things. Um, <clears throat> and I honestly have very little desire to... I mean, I, I, I said this, but I have very little desire to watch Luminous Witches or all of the other Strike Witches series, the little miniature ones. I'm more likely to watch those ones than I am to watch Luminous Witches, because the first episode of Luminous Witches was so fucking bad, I really do not, I can't, I don't want to do that. If I, I, It looks bad, it looks bad, it looks really bad, I don't want to watch Luminous Witches. So fuck that, um, we're not going to do it. Okay, uh, so to open this episode, before we get on to comments, because I've only just posted the last episode, so we don't, I don't think we even have any comments yet, should I, should I go ahead and take a look? The fucking YouTube is bugging out for me. It keeps showing me notifications, but then when I click on it, there's no notification there. There's nothing to notify me about. Um, yeah. Nope. Nothing yet. It's too soon. It's too soon. No one's commented. I only just uploaded it. Of course no one's commented. I literally... No one's had time to watch any of it yet. Uh, okay. Okay. So I'll get back to the comment responses later. Maybe maybe I've got comments on the previous video, the previous 12-hour video that I haven't responded to. Let me see. Have I? Uh, no, I think I responded to all of these. Oh, someone said I should look into the Tribes series. Tribes, Tribes 2, Tribes Ascended. The movement-focused multiplayer shooters with tons of mid-air combat and crazy air shots. Unfortunately, the series is pretty dead, but it's pretty much the apex of that style of FPS. I've seen a little bit of Tribes gameplay, the original Tribes. I don't know very much about the uh, the later, the, the other ones, but I've seen some gameplay of the original Tribes. It looks fucking nuts. Um, I'll, I, might, I might look into it, but honestly, I can't see how any video game would be more what I'm looking for than Team Fortress 2, you know? I mean, I've, I've, tribes might be good, but I find it, I don't know, I find it hard to believe. I, I feel like it's just exactly what I'm looking for, you know? Like, I can't, if I'm thinking, what do I want out of a video game? 
it's all in TF2, right? Everything, source engine movement, it's in TF2. Uh, you know, first person shooter, obviously. Lots of variety, gameplay variety. You know, I could spend a whole day playing engineer. I could spend a whole day as a hoovy, okay? I don't know. Let's not talk too much about TF2. Uh, Vinny Continiello says, shout out to a 50% non-weeb audience who have no idea who that anime snob is or who I know got excited to find a review of his in the wild on Mal. Uh, well, I don't know if you're listening to this, Vinny, but I will explain briefly. That anime snob is a semi-infamous YouTube anime reviewer who uh, is is known for being like particularly terrible. <laughs> Like, like, generally hated. Uh, these days, I mean, barely, I, I don't even know. I don't, I don't even know what this guy's up to these days. I think he's just, uh, like, ranting about trans people constantly these days. Uh, just known for, like, spamming, like, like, two to three videos every day of just, like, inane nonsense that no one watches uh, and, and all of his opinions are, like, really bad. He's a really bad writer. Uh, he gets in fights constantly with, like, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah. That's, that's, that's who that is. So, um, yeah, that's, there, there you go. There you go. Um, okay, I was gonna say something else. Right, I was gonna talk about something, and that something was punk. That's right, it was punk. It was, it was prunk. We're gonna talk about proper punk. Have I told the proper punk story before? I'm gonna tell the proper punk story. That's how we're gonna open up this episode. Okay, so one time, me and little crazy bitch, we were out in Camden Town at night, getting high and drinking and having a good time. And uh, there we were, and it was late. And the thing about Camden is uh, that during the daytime, it is a touristy uh, hotspot. For those who aren't from London, which is the majority of my audience, let me explain a little bit about what Camden is. So Camden was back in the seven, like like mainly the eighties, actually, uh, the hotspot for like punk and counterculture in London. It was like the place, right? Because it's this old like ex-industrial place, and so it became. Uh, sort of a hotspot for punk subculture. There's a bunch of like bars and venues there and stuff, and uh, it's known as like the the birthplace or like the the hub of the punk and goth and like new wave, new romantic, these all post punk, all of that Camden. But you know, uh, these days, it's just sort of a shell of its former self. It's like a a, a caricature, flanderized version of what it once was, and it's, it's all just, like, tourist trap shops, uh, it's just a massive tourist trap, uh, we were there because, at the time, we were in a band together, and our practice space was near to there, and so there's a couple places where you can get cheap food in Camden, so we would go to practice, and then we would go to Camden to go eat, uh, after practice. Also, I'm shitting on Camden a lot. It is a shitty place, but there is also some really nice stuff there. If you go, like, slightly outside of the, the central main street, there's there's a, a really nice record shop uh, not too far from Camden, like, the, the main part. Um, there's a... What else is there? There's, there's a, a, a ch- Chinese tea shop, ch- tea house, uh, also just off of the main place. Um, there's some good restaurants, probably. I think I've only been to one of them, so I don't know why I'm even saying that. Uh, and, uh, there's something else. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a canal. There's a big canal that runs through the whole thing, and it's really pretty. It's a nice place to hang out. Uh, so, yeah, that's Camden. So, in the daytime, Camden is a tourist hotspot, uh, with a bunch of rip-off shops and overpriced nonsense for sale. It's even worse now than it was then. It's somehow, even despite being a gentrified tourist hotspot... Uh, the last time I went there, it's somehow become, like, more. It's become significantly worse, somehow. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so that's the, that's where we were. In day, I, I, okay, what I'm trying to say is, when it turns to sort of nighttime, 
uh, it's a it's a, a lot of homeless people hang out there. Like not necessarily nighttime, but like around the afternoon to the 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 nighttime, it the, it becomes a place where a lot of homeless people gather. That's for a couple reasons. Uh, firstly, it's because uh, Food Not Bombs operates like a a daily like food drive there, so they like give out free food to the homeless. Shouts out to them. Uh, and yeah, also I think there's just a bunch of like places to sleep around there. Lots of like little cubbies to shelter and stuff. Whatever the purpose may be, there's always uh, a, bu- a bunch of, of homeless people there. And so we were hanging out there at night in this point. And uh, we ended up setting up like, I don't even know what we were doing, but we were just in this place and we just ended up talking to this homeless guy. And this homeless guy, I, I mean, he had, uh, oh, I should clarify, at the time we were both punks as well. We were hanging out in this fake punk place, but we were real proper punks. Um, uh, it was very confusing for us. It was a very confusing time for us. But anyway, um, so there we were uh, talking to this homeless guy. I have no idea, no memory of what we were talking about. Uh, mainly because he was completely incomprehensible. Um, he was drunk off of his ass, uh, but also had a really thick Eastern European accent. Uh, we think we think it sounded Eastern European, uh, and it was just impossible to make out like really what he was saying at all. It was just very hard to understand what he was saying. Um, but what I remember, like, from what we could gather, he was basically, like, vaguely insulting us the whole time, uh, which was pretty funny. Uh, it, he was he was sort of, like, passively, ag- I don't know, even passive, just, like, sitting there talking to us and just sort of shitting on us about how we were, like, fake punks, didn't, didn't know real music, even though we did. Well, <laughs> yeah. He was, uh, then, at one point... Um, and another random homeless guy comes up to us and is like, he says to us, are you homeless? And we say, nah, nah. And then he says, oh, because no offense, but you look homeless. And when we have a laugh about that, and then he just walks off. So that happens mid-conversation. Anyway, um, so then this Eastern European sounding guy starts talking about how he was a, a proper punk. Uh, back in the day, right? And that's why he said, proper punk, in that exact voice. That's how he sounded. He was like, proper punk. And ever since then, that became a, a bit of an in-joke between me and low crazy bitch. We would say, proper punk. And then the other thing that he did was he talked about how uh, he went to Jamaica uh, as a youth. Um, and then what he did was he he did this like, him with his already very thick accent doing a slightly racist stereotypical Jamaican accent on top of that which was so bad I don't even think it counted as racist because it was so incomprehensible as what it was supposed to be um but he sort of said uh something like uh, me and me mates <laughs> smoking on the herbal herb is the sort of thing he said which was hysterical to us at the time and I think he was pretty upset with us for laughing but then he started laughing along with us um so that was odd and then we just sort of moved on I don't really remember um so yeah that was that's what the proper prank is a reference to is that that homeless guy I hope he's doing well okay so now I've got the exposition dump out of the way let's talk about uh, proper prank so I think uh, uh there's a it's a bit odd, right? I've done a lot of research into punk and its origins. Um, and I'm generally very confused about it. Like, there's a lot of mixed messaging. And the reason is because punk subculture... Okay, so th- here's the mythology. Here's the mythology. is You have, like, proto-punk, which is, like, the Stooges. And then punk in real started in London, right, in the 70s, late 70s, mid to late 70s, and uh, it was like the Sex Pistols and the Clash, right, and then maybe the Ramones in America as well, and it was this anti-authoritarian, nihilistic uh, movement, 
about shouting about anarchy and uh, and uh, they all dressed up in fancy clothes with with wacky hairdos and stuff like that. Uh, so what's confusing about this story is that a lot of this was basically invented by the British music press at the time. That there were like a couple of bands like this. Um, yeah, it was a very small movement. Like it, it, even to call it a movement would be an exaggeration. It was a it was a small little thing um, that had actually made its way over to the UK from America, uh, and uh, the U the British music journalism establishment latched onto it and gave it its identity that it had never had, and that's what actually birthed the punk movement was it was basically invented by these music journalists. Um, like, they reported on it, quote-unquote, but in reality, they were sort of inserting a bunch of philosophy uh, and, like, attitude into something that was really a bunch of, like, disparate, independent pub bands. Um, you know, bands that just, like, played their local pub. It's like, they weren't very good. They played energetic, upbeat music to get drunk and have fun to. Um, and they weren't very good at playing their instruments. They were just sort of mates out to have fun. This is not a unique uh, event, right? Like, that sort of thing has been going on since the 60s, garage rock. Garage rock? Garage? I don't know how I pronounce that word in my native accent. Do I say garage or garage? I think I say garage. 60s garage rock, you know, this is like a, a common thing. And so you had this, that phenomenon, and it really had nothing to do with the particular fashion trends or uh, pol politics or philosophy that got injected into it until the the music press got a hold of it and sort of drummed up this whole thing. Uh, which, But then what's confusing is that in some sense, like, what's more authentic? Because those people would have not called themselves necessarily punk music. Also... The original term punk music was used to describe, or punk rock, was used to describe 60s garage rock, right? That's where the term actually comes from, uh, or in some sense. But then the sort of new revitalized term punk music, like punk rock, was originally used to describe those 60s garage rockers. And then punk music was originally coined to describe, as far as I can tell, to describe the band Suicide, the American band Suicide, one of my favorite bands, okay, love these guys, uh, but they sound absolutely nothing like what we imagine punk music to be, right? It's much closer to some early industrial type of stuff. Um, again, that's, that's I, I absolutely love Suicide, you should go listen to their album. Um, So it's all very confusing, because the timeline is really clear. Like, it's very obvious that punk music started in CBGBs in America, in New York. And the second thing that's very obvious is that punk music was pop music. And this sounds very strange, right? But it was basically a bunch of amateurs who were really into 60s garage rock and 60s uh, rock and roll pop music in some sense that felt like the, or they were trying to emulate it without really knowing what powers to play their instruments very well, right? And uh, inject it with more energy and more rawness, take away some of the flowery guitar solos and, and, and technicality of it and stuff. Now, that part of the story is pretty well understood. Um, but the links to the 60s music, which would have been the music they grew up listening to, um... I feel like is is even the 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 British punk rockers themselves they they tried to distance themselves from it because it was also this at least the culture that that grew up in the in the UK was very much a response to the hippie movement and its failings but the music that originated with that had much closer ties to like rockabilly and uh that sort of thing like if you like suicide the 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 guy who the front man of suicide I, 
What's his name? Johnny Vega? Something like that? I'm forgetting what his name is. Hold on. Alan Vega. That's right. Alan Vega. Uh, like, he's he, he has this whole, like, really unique aesthetic that's all sort of feels like... Uh, I don't know how to describe it. If I had to describe the vibe, it's like, imagine... Um, an Elvis impersonator in New Vegas, uh, in Las Vegas, <laughs> not New Vegas. Like, that's the kind of vibe that I get from, from Alan Vega's aesthetic. It's like, like, failing Elvis impersonator in Las Vegas. But, like, that's, like, the true punk vibe, you know, if you think about it. Uh, so it's all very confusing. And this fact that, like, punk music was pop music is a bit confusing to a lot of people as well. Because it's been coloured by the invention of hardcore, which, I should clarify, I'm not criticising any of this stuff, right? Like, I love hardcore. Many of my favourite punk bands are from the DC hardcore scene. Um, but that was much more, you know, influenced by sort of minor keys, heavier distortion, screaming vocals, um, which existed but was much less common in the early punk scene. There was a lot more major keys, a lot more inspiration from early rock and roll that was stripped down. Like, the stereotypical punk chord progression, uh, I'm going to play it on a bass guitar that isn't plugged in now, so it will sound kind of strange, but you'll, you know, the sort of, uh, Oh, you can't even... Will you even be able to hear this? Let me put the... Get right up to the microphone. Oh, I'm tuned in drop D. Yeah. Right, that's like the quick blitz quick bop, right? Or like a, a uh, right, fucking um, what am I thinking of? It's a Misfits song. I got something to say. I killed my baby today, and it doesn't matter much to me as long as she's gone. Right, Misfits, yeah. So, like, that's a major key pop song, right? But what makes it... Which is why, like, it's very confusing to explain in my mind why, like, 90s and modern... 90s to current pop punk is not punk, even though punk was originally a variation of pop music. Because it's all about the attitude and the... It's about the rounded corners versus the sharp corners, you know? It's about not knowing what the fuck you're doing. That's what it's all about. Okay, I'm done talking about this. A lot of people talking about YouTube blocking ad blockers. I haven't noticed it yet. Maybe they just haven't rolled it out here. But, uh, I'm, I'm worried for when it happens. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm worried for when it happens, but, I mean, uh, NVIDIA should still work. I, 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 I hope NVIDIA should still work. Uh, so I'll just use that, I suppose, if YouTube does stop going crazy with the ad block blocking. I was going to say something, I never forgot what it was. You know what's unfortunate? I feel like... Okay, this, this might sound cringe, but I have a, a good reason to do this. I want to grow my Twitter and Discord. Two of the most normie platforms. But the, the reason I want to do this is actually for a valid reason. Which is that I need a way to communicate with... I, I hate to call them my fans, but my fans uh, that isn't this channel. Uh, because obviously only a small portion of people who like my music are in this channel. I need a way to, when I release a new album, let everyone know. 
like I think this is why uh idolatrous hasn't I mean it's doing okay like I don't want to complain about it too much it's also a very it's like one of my harsher albums right like it's not pop music it's not you wouldn't expect it to uh you know have as broad appeal as one of my pop songs uh but in, nonetheless i feel it also starts with a big filter like the first track is is pretty filtery you know uh nonetheless i feel like a big reason why it hasn't uh like, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of how Idolatrous turned out. I think there's a couple... I think Human Sounds is a bit the mix. I could have gone back and given it another pass, mixing it. Uh, I think there's a couple problems like that. But but overall, I'm very proud of how the album came out. And I would really... I think a lot of people would like it. I think they just don't know about it. Uh, and, yeah, I what I need is I need I need to be able to let people know it exists, basically, uh, and, yeah, in order to do that sort of thing, I, I need to grow my social media presence, unfortunately, and I'm not saying I need to grow, like, this is, this is, I I should have probably clarified this, I'm not saying I need new fans, what I'm saying is, I know I have a bunch of people who know I exist, like, vaguely, but they don't know where to find me, and they're not aware when I do stuff, because, like, I mean, it's very simple. Some of my songs have, like, 12,000 views on YouTube. I have, like, almost 2,000 subscribers on my No Thank You channel, but my Twitter only has 800 followers. So, like, I'm really, like, even 800 followers is less than this channel, you know? Like, there is a large portion of people who aren't in my Discord and aren't following me on Twitter, who are fans, who just have no idea, or no way to, like, for me to, to reach out to them, you know, and, and do marketing, I guess you could call it if you wanted to be cynical, uh, which you can be, I'll, I'll allow it, I'll allow it, uh, which I think is just a, I'm, is, is, is just a waste, it's just annoying, it's just, like, unfortunate, like, I think these people want to know, like, it's not like I'm trying to reach a bunch of new people, is what I'm saying. It's like, I have this existing audience who just aren't aware. And I don't know how to get them to be into Twitter followers or whatever, or Discord members, uh, so that they can, like, you know, know when I do stuff that they might be possibly interested in. Uh, and then the other thing is that I'm hoping to grow the Discord and then sort of convert it into away from discord as a platform because obviously discord as a platform is like gonna fail first of all and uh it just sucks currently uh so i want to eventually once this discord like because we're already building a bit of a, of a community base on there it's getting more active i'm trying to be more active on there you know it's it's kind of happening it's kind of popping but i want to eventually turn this like convert some of these discord people into like some other thing i'm not sure what it will be maybe a forum maybe just changing to to matrix instead of discord maybe some 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 other thing away from the corpo internet you know and 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 actually create something that i would like to see more of right because another discord server is not something I want to see more of. Like, oh, another dis- yet another Discord server. I don't want to see more of that in the world. But another independently hosted forum with an actual community that I don't have to, like, you know, something that's that's kind of separate from me, in a, in a way. Something that is, like, an, immerse, an Im- immersive uh, culture on, like, a forum, or maybe I create a live board or an image board or something, right? That, that, like, gives birth to itself in a way and can, can exist away from the corpo net. That's something I actually want to see more of. That's, like, a positive impact on the world, in my opinion. Uh, so if I can do that, that's POG. Uh, I mean, creating the Denpa web ring, I feel like uh, 
was a, a step in this kind of direction where I feel like a lot of people have made websites that maybe they don't keep updated and, and use that much. Like, like I don't keep my website updated and use that much, but, uh, you know, something. Video games, you ever heard of them? I've played a few of them, but I mainly just play one of them, and it's called Team Fortress 2. It's probably the best video game ever made, really. And what's crazy is, they're still making it. And you might be sitting there like, they're not still making it, that game hasn't got an update in 12 years. But it's about to get an update, baby. It's about to get a goddamn update. All I can hope for is that the update comes out before I go to a store. I guess I can play on Dot Smite's computer. Um, that's definitely something I can do. So, yeah, maybe not worth complaining about. Anyway. Uh, what did I want to say? Oh, yeah. Uh, I see people... I, like, there's this weird concept of, like, hours played in video games. Where it's like... Obviously, to a normal person, having a thousand hours in any video game is just absolutely insane. But to, like, a gamer, having a thousand hours in a game isn't, like... That's just, like, oh, you're into that game, I guess. You're, like, still fairly new. But then, like, two thousand hours, I feel like, is is generally supposed to be impressive. But this is what's confusing. So, like, I see people say, like, listen, I got into TF2 back in 2010, and, like, now, I, you, like, I have t 2,000 hours in the game, I'm, like, I have 700, almost 800 hours in TF2, and I started playing this year, <laughs> you know, or, like, within a year from the current time, like, it's not, not even been a year since I started playing TF2, more seriously. Now, yes, yeah, some of those hours, about a hundred of those hours is, um, old, but still, like, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna hit a thousand hours by the end of this year. At least, I feel like that's gonna happen, right? Um, and I, like, from, for some reason for me, it's way easier to play TF2 for longer sessions than it is CSGO. Like, I was always very confused. Like, how are people... Like, you know, I was playing CSGO, like, every day or almost every day for long periods of time. And I would take breaks. I'd take, like, months off. But, you know, I'd play CSGO for, like, every day. And I was like, how are people getting... Like, you see people in CS, they have, like... 8,000 hours, 10,000 hours, 12,000 hours. Like, pros have, like, 18,000. Like, let me look this up. CSGO play, play, players. Okay, that's just nonsense. Okay, this is, ju this is just people who are leaving the game idling. This isn't pros. What's the... Pros, come on. Show me. Um, okay, this is just, I, Google is fucking useless, G this is an AI listicle, give me a real fucking human being. What, are what is this, just show me the answer. What's the thing? Okay, so Simple. Simple has 16,000 hours in CSGO. And I was like, what? I mean, that makes sense for Simple, I guess. He's spending, like, ridiculous amounts every day. But I was like, how the fuck are people, like, spending that long? Because I'd been playing the game for many, many years, and I only have 3,000 hours. Right? Um... But for some reason, it's way easier for me to play for longer stretches, much longer stretches in TF2 than it is for CSGO. Like, CS, I would play for maybe four hours at a time. TF2, I can play for six hours at a time, 
like daily and not not find that odd like i mean oftentimes more like nine hours maybe uh maybe is that healthy i don't know if that's healthy but whatever it is it's it doesn't feel unusual to me and i think there's a couple of reasons for that i think the first reason is that while tf2 is a lot more chaotic and fast paced than cs it's also a lot less high pressure it's lower pressure environment like your team doesn't depend that much on your individual survival like your individual performance there's a lot less stress dying just doesn't mean anywhere near as much in tf2 as it does in cs um and like what determines the high time to kill means you have some level of leeway you know you can it's not like every single decision carries massive amounts of weight and it's all super stressful because you can die from a one tap instantly at any point so you, you can't make a single mistake in tf2 it's a lot more uh casual i guess it's you know you can afford to to be a little ballsy play a little wacky because if you get caught out, you do have the possibility to escape back to your team, back to your medic, and get heals. You know, in CS, even if you make a ballsy play and it works out for you, but you end up on low health, you just have low health for the rest of the round. Like, you can't do anything about that. You know, you're just fucked. Which, when I went back to playing CS the other day, what really weirded me out. It was a really weird feeling, because I, I had low health, like, I, I fought one guy. I had a normal gunfight 1v1 type of situation. And I was on 12 health after that. And I was like, I'm on fucking 12 HP. What am I supposed to do for the rest of the round? You know? Because any time I face... So there's no fucking shot I'm going to be able to do anything. Like, yeah, I'm a, I, I guess I lived. But, but now what? <laughs> fucking now what? I can't heal. What am I supposed to do? And I'm thinking back, I can't remember what I did in those scenarios. Like, what did, I, what did I used to do in CS if I survived with low health? I don't know. I have, honestly, I have no idea what I used to do back when I played the game. Uh, so TF2 is a lot less, you know, high stress. And it's also got a lot more variance, right? Because, like, on an average day... You know, although I'm main demo, I'm pl even within demo, I'm switching. I'm definitely switching between stock and uh, sticky jumper, right? Like depending on which point is being pushed. For example, I, I'm switching to stock to push last, pretty much most games, uh, or I mean, switching to the the sticky bomb launcher to push last most games. Uh, but, like, you know, I'm switching between Demo, Medic, and NG, and Pyro, at least those four, right? Like, I, I, team doesn't have a Medic or needs another, needs another Medic, I'll switch to Medic. Team, although I didn't play much Medic today. I don't think I played any Medic today. Maybe I should have. I did play Medic for one game. Honestly, Medic's pretty fun. I didn't understand the point of Medic, but... I'm getting more into medic these days. It's a it's a pretty good class. Uh, and that playing medic, I don't think I could do for long stretches of time because medic is much closer to the CS:GO experience. Where if you die, it is actually a really big deal for your team. Like you are the most important member of your team. If you if you die and you're out of the game for ten seconds, like your team is useless. They can't do anything, especially if you're the only medic. Uh, if there's a, if there's more than one medic, it's not as much of a big deal. But yeah, and you know, as the longer you manage to stay alive, the more valuable you are because you build Uber. Uh, so yeah, medic much more stressful. But uh, yeah, and NG today I was trying out a little bit of ninja nearing, and it didn't go well for me at all. It went really badly. And then I was playing NG more, and I was just getting completely fucked by spies. 
Just so fucked by spies, man. It wasn't fun. It just stopped being fun. I, 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 for some reason, I just wanted to hard commit to this engineer deal. But, man, these spies, they just kept fucking me. Like, you can try your best to deal with spies. I just don't... I mean, I'm going to be honest. When it comes to engineer, like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. You know? Like, I feel like I'm not too bad at keeping... Like, I'm not... I don't feel like I'm terrible at engineer. But I I definitely feel like I'm not good at engineer in any way. Like, I feel like I'm a decent medic. I feel like I'm a decent pyro. I feel like I'm a decent demo. Maybe slightly better than decent demo. Engineer, like, I feel like I'm just not bad. You know, like, I feel like I'm, I, I, I do, when I'm playing engineer, there is an engineer on the team. And in some games it goes well, some games it goes really badly, and I have no way of knowing what I'm doing. I feel like I'm doing the same thing every time. Like, it's not like, you know, especially on defense. I mean, I, I, I'm going to be honest. I pretty much never play offensive engineer. That's the that's thing I did for today for, like, basically the first time uh, was was try and play offensive engineer, blue engineer. Um, I would say not super fun. <laughs> I wouldn't call it, like, super enjoyable. Uh yeah. Maybe maybe if I'm playing blue NG in the future I'm I should uh go with the guns. I mean I can't play battle NG at all, man. I'm so bad at battle NG. It's like I had one day, like a few months ago, where I decided to randomly play battle NG for a game and did like surprisingly well and I was like, huh, that was cool. But then ever since then I think it's because I was playing against noobs on like a 2 4 server or something. Because ever since then, it's just been. I've just not been able to get anything done with Battle NG ever. But you know, I was playing normal Blue NG. It's just boring, keeping your teleporters up. I mean, you can't help. Like, especially once you get to last, there's just nothing for you to do except like deal with spies who just constantly harass you. And like, why even? Uh. And you can't, you can't even do anything about it. Because even, like, okay, so spy comes, there's three outcomes. Outcome number one, the spy wins, right? They sap your shit and they backstab you and you're dead. And then you just have to rebuild everything. And it's like, just a minor annoyance. Okay, got to push back to the front. Got to get back to the, the, the place, put my teleport down again. That's it. Have my dispenser down again. Okay, cool. Option two is uh, you kill the spy, right? The spy saps your ship, but you turn around and you kill the spy. Okay, great. Now you get like 30 seconds <laughs> without a spy harassing you. And the spy respawns, and a minute later, he's back harassing you again. Because uh, what does this? Spies don't have anything better to do. And try and take out tellies and dispensers and stuff. So that's what they're doing. So it's like, okay, that's pointless. It's like, if, even if you kill them, it doesn't matter because they'll just come back and, do, and beeline directly towards you and bother you again. Um, and then option three, and I found that this is the most common option, is the spy saps your shit, but you hear it, turn around, shoot them, they go invisible. You want to chase after them, but you can't because you have to break the sappers. So you you go and deal with the sappers. Then you have no idea where the spy went. The spy just escapes off into the night. He's done nothing to you because your sentries and, and buildings are still up. You've also done nothing to him, but now he's invis and you've no idea where he is. And then you're like, well, what the fuck am I supposed to do? So you sort of like shoot into corners where you think he might be hiding of course you never find them. And then, 20 seconds later, you're rolling, you get backstabbed. Uh, like, th that's the most common scenario. Or, you don't get backstabbed and just repeats. 
He saps your building, you turn around, you shoot him, he goes invisible. Because eventually, he's going to win. Like, eventually, you're going to get... You're just going to happen to be in the wrong place, and he's going to win. It's very annoying. Sorry, I don't know why I'm complaining about that. I just uh, had a bad time with fucking spies today, man. I just had a bad time with spies. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean... Uh, oh. Yeah, I have no idea how to be better at engineer, to be honest. Because, you know, when you're playing as another class, you can always improve your aim, right? But, like, as Angie, your aim doesn't really matter that much, right? Like, most of what matters is sentries. And once you've learned the sentry spots, on like, the common sentry spots on every map, like, the meta spots, right? Like, what is there to even improve at? I guess... Not including battle energy, I guess the best thing to improve at is like game sense, right? Like knowing when to destroy your build, or like sorry, when to like move your buildings up or move your buildings back, like when when a hold is like a lost cause or like uh yeah, I don't really know. I I don't really know what there is to like. I don't really know how to get better at and en- at en- en- Um. I've been trying battle engine more and more recently and just failing completely. Like just too squishy. Like I I don't even understand how cuz it's like you can't really be on or at least I feel like you can't really be on the front lines. You're just too squishy to be on the front lines with the power classes. So you got to be you can't you're not obviously not supposed to be at the back. So you're supposed to sort of like be in the middle of your team is very easy to get caught out it's i don't know man i just haven't figured it out yet i've watched the uncle dane guide to battle energy video hasn't helped <laughs> i've watched it twice actually hasn't helped anyway that's enough of my complaining fuck what was the other thing i wanted to say that was about how there's a breadth of different classes and loadouts that keep tf2 interesting throughout a day so that i end up playing longer sessions but there was something else i wanted to say fuck what was it oh yeah i think it was kind of linked to what i've been saying which is i feel like i've stopped like when i first was getting really into tf2 every day and every game was this challenge of like how can i improve myself and how can i get better at the game and at a certain point i feel like i've just reached this like average skill level and just not, like, I don't know if I've given up on trying to get better, or it's just that, like, previously there was a, it was, there was a clear path to getting better, there was very clear metrics of, like, you know, improving and stuff, was now, it feels like I just, how well I do on any given game is just fucking random, like, some games I top score, some games I am like almost at the bottom or near the bottom of the scoreboard. Most games I'm somewhere in the middle, you know. Um, and it doesn't feel like I'm doing anything particularly different between these games. It's purely uh, like team comp, team team skill level. Some games my team gets absolutely rolled. And no matter how hard I try, I can't do absolutely anything to to help. Nothing I do, no matter how hard I'm trying to win, the other team is just better. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. The question is, like, people say that there's this thing called pub stomping. But how does one do that? How does one pub stomp? Because it feels like... To be actually good at TF2, to actually do well, is super reliant on having, at the very least, a good medic. Like, no matter how skilled you are at the game, this is just how it feels. There's no matter how good you are, you you need to rely on your team members to a large extent as well. To push up with you, to organize pushes, your medic, uh, your NG... You know, I, that's how, right, 
But then you go and you watch, like, people who are actually good at, like, Banny. You watch Banny, and he just does, he doesn't, I don't know, I don't understand what he's doing. I mean, I've said this before. Like, it doesn't look like Banny's doing anything that crazy. He just is super ridiculously consistent. I don't know. Is it, like, the thing I'm trying to understand is, like, why, uh, firstly, am I actually not improving? I can't tell if I'm improving or not. Secondly, is why am I not improving? Is it because, A, I've stopped trying to improve, or B, because I've, like, run up against a wall, and it's just, like, exponentially more difficult to improve from here versus when I was first starting? I think, if I had to guess, a little bit of both. Um... But, like, I die, or, like, something fucks up, and I just don't know, like, it feels like, like, okay, so sometimes, sometimes I'll have games where I'm like, okay, I've been too aggressive, I want to play a little more passive, I keep dying in stupid ways because I keep pushing out like a madman and playing way too aggressive, so I'll hang back, and I hang back, and then I don't die, but I also barely do anything for my team, like, I'm, I'm hanging back too much. So, but then, like, I'm like, okay, well, we've got to be in the sort of middle ground then. But there kind of is no middle ground. Like, either you're on the front or you're not on the front. That's it. Um. So, yeah, and then a lot of it is also because, like, stock energy, oh, uh, stock, or well, well, it's not even stock, but, like, I have been playing Demo Man without the Sticky Bomb Launcher, for longer than I've been playing with the Sticky Bomb Launcher. Like, the, only relatively recently have I tried to, like, actually get, like, learn this weapon. And I just suck with it. Like, if everyone, you know, people talk about how it's the best weapon in the game, able to dish out the most damage. And for me, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, I feel like I, I just... It's, it doesn't feel that you, it, I mean, I don't know, it doesn't do that much damage, that's all, it does like, not, it does like chip damage, most of the time, it does chip damage, it, I mean, it's good for dealing with sentries, it's really good for that, but it, it just sort of, it's, it's best for like, doing a little bit of chip damage, so that when an, when someone comes towards you, you can, your team can more easily take them, I don't know, I don't really understand, like, you, I can't hold down a choke with it, not really, you know, like, that's what it should be for, that's what it should be really good at, is like, here's a choke, I'm thinking the choke towards last at bad water, for example, like, thin, narrow corridor that basically the entire team has to push through, but you have this corner, and this chuck. Like, this, this is surely sticky spam heaven. And yeah, I stand there, and I do sometimes get kills. But most of the time, I just, like, do some damage, and then nothing happens. And then a scout comes out of nowhere and destroys my shit. Like, because it's, it's I have no recourse against a scout, really, in that situation. So, yeah, I don't know, man. I need to, like, I guess I gotta watch, like, the thing is, you can't just watch competitive, like, in Counter-Strike, if you want to get better, you watch the pros play, and you study how they play, and you learn their lineups and all of this shit, because they're playing the same game as you. In TF2, you can't watch competitive games, because they're not playing casual, they're playing a completely different game, it's not even comparable. Like, what you do to be good as demo in competitive is quite different from, I assume, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I need to do more research. I just ate too many potatoes, but I'm okay with it because it was fucking delicious. I am the the god of mashed potatoes. I make the best goddamn mash in the world. But they got me thinking about one of my most annoying little unanswered questions in life it's rare in the modern era it's rare in the modern era 
to have a question about the world which you'd imagine is answerable but there isn't an easily available answer because we have the internet these days. Like it's something that people must know or at least have ideas about, have theories about, but it's just impossible to find this information. It's a rare experience. Um, so on the one hand, I almost don't want to answer this question, but I also am very curious. And that answer is, that is it. It's a very specific question. If there are any historians who are fans of the No Thank You Backwards channel, uh, please tell me what you think in the comments. Uh, and that is this. Once you start doing research into the ancient world and the medieval world, one thing that comes up rarely, but does come up, is the insane quantities that it seems like average people ate. People probably ate around 4,000 calories a day back then. Uh, and there were, there were these, like, uh, for example, there's a, a, a historical document that is basically like a, a record of um, how much, uh, so like, if I remember correctly, it was a, uh, like a group of monks who were staying at a different monastery for a while. I think this is what it was. And there's like a record of like what supplies the monastery had to get in order to like feed their guests, basically, right? I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I, I, I don't know if I'm exactly correct about that, but it was something along these lines. It was like a group of people staying at a place and there's a record that's historical of, like, it's a historical document, first first primary source, right, um, uh, of, like, what they ate, basically. And it's just insane. It's, like, gallons of beer per person, just, like, mountains of bread and cheese. It's ins it's an insane amount of food. Like, it's, ins it's ridiculous. And... I've looked this stuff up, like, why did they eat so much? <laughs> How did they eat so much? Because that's not the only example, right? This is, like, a well-corroborated thing, is that people back in the medieval period, at least, and going back even further, although I haven't really looked into that, just ate a lot um, and drank a lot of beer in the medieval era, right? Um... And you look for information on this, and the only thing anyone says is, well, they lived very active lifestyles. You know, they were peasants working in the fields all day. Of course they ate a lot. They had to. They were basically, like, doing as much exercise as a modern professional athlete every day. Which, you know, is very questionable for a number of reasons. Uh, like, that's the answer. That's the only answer you will find on the internet, at least that I've found. I've looked around. I've looked at this for, for quite some time. I've tried to find an answer to this, and that's the only thing you will find. Here's why that's not a satisfying answer. I'll give you two reasons. Firstly, is I question that analysis of how much a peasant exercises, mainly because uh, their lives were very seasonal. Like maybe in the summer, when shit has to get done uh, all the time, they had to do a lot of exercise. Like, yeah, then, then I can imagine it. But in the winter, there's nothing to do. You've done all your preparations, all your food in the, the summer months, right? In the winter months, you have nothing to do. Like, you have very minimal work that actually gets done during the winter. This is true for, like, every Northern European society. Um, and, like, with that sort of climate, right? Because just, you can't do anything, you can't do anything, right? There's nothing you can do. Um, so it's like, w were they eating that much all year round? Were they preparing all the food... Like, when they, when they preserved food during the summer months, were they preserving enough food to sustain them on that 4,000 calories a day throughout all the winter? Like, that's a, a lot of fucking food to preserve. Or was the situation where they ate loads and loads during the summer months so that they could eat much less than they required? Like, to fatten themselves up for the winter, basically. And then they would lose weight over the winter every year. I imagine... That sounds somewhat believable. That sounds that sound, but I've never seen anyone confirming or denying it or even suggesting it. They only just the only thing I can find is well, they did a lot of exercise. No one actually says this. That's just a guess. It's just me theorizing. You know, I I have no idea. So that's the first thing. It's like, 
well, this whole thing is very seasonal. It depends how much someone is exercising as a peasant doesn't stay consistent throughout the year. It changes a lot. Um, does their diet change with that? That's my question. And the second thing I have as a problem with this is when you talk to professional athletes in the modern era, all of them say the hardest thing about being a professional athlete, about their training regimen, is eating that much food. It's just like people who actually have to eat 4,000 calories a day struggle. They do not find it easy. Like they find it, it's it's gen, generally like grueling. And they're not just eating three meals, they're eating like many meals throughout the day. Like you look at a lot of these athletes and they will tell you how like it's torture to eat this much food. Like it's insane. But these people were doing it voluntarily and they didn't have any, you know, nutritionists. Like most of this would have been carbs, bulk carbs, right? Or bulk fats. Um, so it's like, they're not, it's, 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 I don't know. It's insane to me. Is it just because professional athletes in the modern era are, 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 are like forcing themselves to eat loads and loads of protein and that wasn't the case for peasants? Is it somehow easier to eat 4,000 calories of carbs a day? I don't know. I just don't know. I've never personally tried it. Uh, and even if I did, it wouldn't matter because I don't do that much exercise compared to a peasant. So whatever I said, you know, it wouldn't even be relevant. Is it? Is it that? Like, what is it? Like, how are, the, how are they physically managing this? Like, that's too much food for a human. Like, you, you, I guarantee you, you don't know anyone who does that. That is, if you tried that, you would fail, because it is too much. Also, I should clarify, this isn't just a European thing. You look back at the old um, ukiyo-e prince from Japan, in feudal Japan, and you look at the amount of rice that they put in their bowls each day, and it's fucking insane towers of rice. The like there's I don't remember the exact thing, but in Japan and China, you know, there's there's very consistent evidence as to like how much fucking rice these people ate a day. And it's an insane amount. It seems like this was just true all across the board. That people just ate this insane amount. But now we live in a world where people are eating you know, maybe half a day of what their medieval ancestors ate. And yet, we have massive problems with obesity. Even though, compared to a peasant's diet, we're eating much fewer carbs, eating way more protein, right? Um, and many people go to the gym, even if they don't, if it, like, you're telling me they're just doing that much exercise. They're burning an extra like 2,000 calories a day compared to us. Do you know how much exercise it takes to burn 2,000 calories a day? That is an incomprehensible amount of exercise. That is like back, that is just too, no one's doing that. I don't believe it. I don't, be, I don't I'm going to be honest, I don't believe it. <laughs> That's too much. I don't think it's even humanly possible. Maybe if you're an ultra marathon runner, that's the only thing I can imagine. And that you're telling me that that's how much they were doing, even though, well, I don't know, man. It just, it doesn't, I don't personally think that sounds reasonable. Maybe I'm wrong. So there's this, there's this, there's this weird, like, conflict between we're, we're obese now, modern humans are obese, right? But we actually eat way, like, and assumedly, obesity comes from the fact that we're eating too much. That should be obvious, but got to point that out, right? Not just doing, not doing enough exercise, but eating too much. Well, how come we had these people who were eating way more, way more, than we were, to the point where if we tried to do it, it would be very uncomfortable, and the few people who do do it find it very uncomfortable. Athletes. I don't want to... None, none of this adds up. You know what I'm saying? None of this shit adds up. I need an explanation. I need it to be explained. And I'd, I'd, I don't think they just did a lot more exercise 
is like, it's too basic of an explanation. Like, that's the obvious part, but give me the actual information, the details. That's what's actually going to help me answer the question. How? Not just like, that, that answers the question of why did they eat so much? That's not what I want to know. I want to know how did they eat so much? Because that is too much food. Like, you, you couldn't, if you asked me to eat 400 or 4,000 calories worth of bread or rice in a day, like, I don't think I could even do it. I would throw up. <laughs> There's just too much carbs. It's not possible. Like, even, I don't even understand. I don't understand. It's too much. It's too much goddamn food. How are they doing it? You know what I'm considering? And I don't know if this is a good or bad idea. I'm pretty sure it's a bad idea. But ever since I started doing these podcasts, I've been thinking that it doesn't feel right to have on this channel for some reason. Like, you remember in the first few episodes how I, I used to constantly be like, okay, this one I'm, un- I'm uploading to IDMR, not the main channel. And then I would never do it. It's because something has always felt off about the fact that these are like alongside my other shit. I don't know what it is exactly, but this kind of just feels like bonus content for some reason to me. Um... So I'm thinking of, like, I don't really know what to do about this problem. I I had the thought, you know, I have these, I have this members, this join button now. I have a join button now. I don't know if you noticed. I have a join button. Um, and, like, maybe, maybe this is an exclusive to the join button thing. But I feel like, I mean, on a practical level, I feel like I don't have enough subscribers to actually merit anyone giving me any money like i don't think that would happen um like like it would be like two people you know which is like what like at most we're talking like best case scenario like two or three people um which is just like why put so much effort into a podcast if only two or three people are going to listen to it is the first thing and then the second thing is like it feels weird to charge money for something that I would normally do for free. It's just like an arbitrary paywall. Um, I guess the point of it would be not to actually make money off of it, but just to like act as a barrier so it can be like clearly delineated. But in which case, I should just make put it on a different channel, you know? Because the other thing is, um, they don't. They're getting less and less views. Or fewer and fewer views, if you want to be pedantic about language. They're getting fewer and fewer views um, with each one, you know? Like, the original 12-hour podcast, let me see. That got a 1,000 views, right? Then the next one, well, it wasn't 12 hours, but the next one, that got 500. So we instantly cut in half. And the next one... I got 800, oh, it went back up, and the next one, I got 600, going back down again, next one, 500, and the most recent one, well, it's currently on 250-ish, um, so again, they, I mean, by the looks of it, I think people are fed up, I think people are fed up with it, and why wouldn't you be, you know, who wants to listen to me, that, this is just, this is just too much. It's just too much content for anyone to consume. Um, it's it's like you have to dedicate too much of your life to keeping up with my podcast because I'm just putting them out too fast. I'm putting them out too fast. So whatever happens, this one's definitely... Get, I, I gotta slow down, take my time with this one. Maybe, maybe even if I finish it, I'll schedule it sometime in the future. That's definitely gonna happen. But also... I'm just considering, like, maybe, maybe this isn't main, main, mainstream content. I don't know how to explain it. Something just, it just feels off. It just feels like this should be somehow more clearly separated from videos, you know? Well, I don't know if that makes any sense, really. I have to give it more thought. Because it takes a lot of... Like, assuming I truncate the silence on this, or whatever, I don't know how it's going to go. But... 
you know, let's assume that I record this for 12 hours. It does me a service because it lets me get thought out, get thoughts out of my head. That's why I do it. It's fun to just talk to myself. I'm also alone in my apartment for months, so you know, it's good to get my ideas out there and not go insane. Uh, so does it really matter if anyone watches it? That's the question. I don't know. We need to do more thinking on this subject. Like, I need to... I don't... I honestly don't fucking know. Because it, it's not like this shit get, like... I Some people seem to like them. But also, people... I think, I think the last one was just the moment that everyone stopped caring. Because it was too soon... Like, I just did three that were too close to each other. I, I don't think anyone ever guessed the end of them. Yeah, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure what to do about all of this, you know? Yeah, requires requires more thought. After literally weeks of arduous, like, once every few days reading for 15 minutes at a time and then giving up, I finally finished LA's route in... Keen Koi, and I'm now reading, um, the next one, which I've uh, uh, embarrassingly forgotten the name of the girl. What's her fucking name? Uh, come on, brain. I am retarded. Uh, uh, names, names, Raina, that's it, Raina. Uh, I'm now reading Rainer's route because, unfortunately for me, in order to get to the good route, which is uh, Dia's route, you have, which everyone knows is the best part of the original novel, is very clearly established. That the, as I said in one of these podcasts once, it's very clear they put all the interesting stuff in one character, uh, and then you have to read through all four other routes before you unlock that route. Um, now I'm pretty sure Akane's route is probably short like if I just had to guess I have no evidence to base this off of but she fits she, I mean she's a side heroine like in in vibes um so that's probably the case so I probably have this route then a side heroine route and then the actual Dia route and then the the true ending route which I have no idea how long that's gonna be um I think I realized that part of the reason why I stopped reading this is because a lot of the stuff that I was praising about, or not necessarily praising, but I was saying, like, oh, the way that all of the, like, upcoming events and drama is, like, very clearly telegraphed ahead of time is actually a good thing because it makes you want to keep reading so you find out the specifics. Like, you know what's going to happen, but you just want to know, like, okay, I want to keep reading so that I can find out exactly how it happens. But in this case, um, well, uh, LA was just the least interesting route for me, like, already on the surface, because she has nothing interesting about her. Like, I, I don't really know what, like, otaku fetish LA is supposed to be appealing to. Like, Sylvia is the obvious main heroine route, right? Like, like there's one of, there's a, a similar archetype to Sylvia in every visual novel. Um, and then Raina is like the sort of, well, I mean, she's a gyaru, but she's also kind of the tomboy archetype in that, like, she can crack dirty jokes with the main character and, like, sort of have a sort of more casual friendship since she's a commoner and all the other girls are, like, not. You know, they're, like, aristocracy. So, like, that's kind of an appeal, right? And, like, as a... Just as a person, she's much more, like, down-to-earth and chill. Like, she seems like the sort of person that I would genuinely want to be friends with in real life out of all of these characters. Um, like, she's very approachable and stuff. Like, it's really obvious her appeal. Rhea, as I've said, is 
uh, you know, clearly the most interesting narratively, even though I haven't read her route yet. It's just like obvious that they're setting that up. Um, and then even Akane uh, has like a lot of moe to her character. Like she's got a lot of like very classical moe aspects to her character, um, even though she's not like super interesting to me. I would still say she's more interesting just for the moe elements. Like, L.A. has nothing. Like, she's she's got no interesting backstory that isn't already revealed in the Sylvia route. Um, and since you have to play through both anyway to complete the game, you already know the interesting backstory going... It, it's strange. Um, and even that is not, like, that interesting. Uh, she's not, like, particularly got an interesting character design, in my opinion. She's not particularly got an interesting voice acting. And, like, you'd imagine, or at least I would imagine, if I was writing this visual novel... Okay, so her defining character trait is that she's a female knight, right? All the other girls, we've got, like, Gyaru, pr literally princess, delinquent, and... Um, I guess, like, sporty Genki girl archetype for Kane, right? All of those are, like, I mean, maybe delinquent not so much, right? But other than Rhea, the other three all are, like, very stereotypical, submissive fetishes type of girls, right? Even the delinquent, you could argue. But... If I was writing it, I would have made L.A. like way more dominant as a character. Domi domineering is like a negative term, but like, like femdomy. I'm not necessarily saying in a sexual way, although that would have been something at least interesting <laughs> compared to what... There's a lot of sex in that route, and it is generally boring sex. Uh, but... So that might have been a bit more interesting. But I just mean, like, a little more outgoing personality-wise. A little less submissive as a person. Like, the fact that she's a... Ver I mean, I guess it makes sense to have her be submissive, given that she's literally a knight who serves royalty, you know? Like, I guess that makes sense. But there's also the opposite that you can do, which is, like, she's a knight, she's in the, she's, like, a, which is, like, a military role, she's also a noble, and the main character is a commoner, like, there's a lot of space for her to be much more outgoing than she was, and more, what's the word I'm actually looking for, it's not outgoing, it's, like, headstrong, that's not really it, like, willing to put herself out there and be forceful in her being be an actual character not just capitulate to whatever the main character wants be more of her own person which is what Rhea and Reina both are by the way a little to some extent um, I don't know man maybe I'm maybe the visual novel has enough but I'm just not super like if you're not going to go down the BDSM route with it then the sort of super submissive girl archetype is just not very... In, like, super innocent submissive girl archetype is just not very interesting to me. It's not personally appealing to me. Um, like, yeah, I mean, if you're going to go down the BDSM route with it, then I'm okay with it. Then you're then, it's, then it makes sense. But if it's just for the sake... Then it just feels sexist, to be honest. <laughs> like, it's, I don't, I don't even know if I want to call it that, but it's like... It just feels, rather than sexist, it just feels like it doesn't, you, you didn't bother to write a character with their own goals and motivations. You just made them submissive to the main character. And so it's like, kind of boring writing, I guess. Which, yeah. Um, but anyway, now I'm in the route that I'm more interested in, but we'll see in like 10 hours time if I'm actually still interested in it. While I'm here and talking about visual novels, as I often am, I just want to make a point, and it's a point that I made uh, in the, the Dust Bowl live stream, uh, but I, I feel like it's a very important point. So, as many of you may know, my favorite visual novel is Subarashiki Hibi, 
which is many people's favorite visual novel. Uh, it has a bit of a reputation. But my second favorite visual novel is called Cross Channel. And it's a close second. Like, it's a close second. It's not like... There's not a big difference in quality between them. They're both, like, very, very good. However, Subahibi is generally widely recommended, whereas Cross Channel is uh, widely derided for having terrible translation options. People will discourage you from reading it until you've literally learned the entire Japanese language because the three translation options that are available Yes, this visual novel has three different translation options, which is very rare, uh, are so bad and unreadable that they completely change the meaning of the work, and it's just, listen, nonsense. Fucking nonsense, okay? If if you're a visual novel enjoyer, even if you're not a visual novel enjoyer, um, don't let any of this shit discourage you from reading Cross Channel. It's great. It's amazing. You know, the, the the worst you'll get in terms of bad translation that I noticed is, like, some of the font cropping being off. Maybe some typos here and there. Maybe the translation is a little bit too literal. I personally would prefer that a translation as closer to the literal because, you know, it's just my personal preference. But And, uh, you know, that's it. That's about it. The people who say it makes the, it, it's unreadable, these people are fucking insane. Okay, do not listen to them. Do not let this discourage you from reading Cross Channel. It is super worth reading. If you, uh, I would rather, you know, there's, there's, if you, if you want to know which of the three translations to pick, pick the, the Amaterasu translation that is generally considered to be the least bad by all these people who really care. That's the one I read, not even knowing about any of this drama, um, no, not even knowing there are multiple translations, and it was good, okay? Like, this this idea that it's, like, some mess that ruins the... It doesn't, okay? it it It's perfectly good. It's good. It's great, in fact. It's amazing. It's one of the best visual novels. Um, so go, go read Cross Channel, go, go read it, go read it, it's really good, it's not for everyone, it's definitely not for everyone, uh, but it's, it's a very good visual novel, and don't let these people who tell you the translation ruins it, meme you into believing that, because it is, it is, I'm confident enough now to say, it is simply not true, you know, I would have imagined I need to to, to, like, if I really want to say that confidently, I have to learn Japanese and then read through it in Japanese and English back-to-back -back and compare the two. But, look, if I already know that the visual novel is good translated, then I already know it. And I'm not stupid. Like, it is what it is. It reads like a translated piece of text. But that's fine. If you're an otaku, you are used to reading things that sound like they've been translated from Japanese. You're already used to it. That's fine. That's how things are. You, you that that won't bother you. It will not bother anyone who's like familiar with any Japanese media. Go ahead and read it. There's no reason not to. I mean, there's no reason not to on the grounds of the translation. I mean, if you have some trauma related to the events of the visual novel and don't want to read it because of that that's fine or if you just are like you know what visual novels they're too damn long i don't want to read them that's fine too um but if you if you have any interest in visual novels i wouldn't recommend it as a first vn okay let me let me clarify this actually i wouldn't say it's good necessarily as your first visual novel you should read ever probably not a good idea um, I would say you should read some, pick any random moege to read, like, if you've never read any moege, you might have a sense of what's going on, but it does play a lot on, like, genre tropes, and you, if you're an otaku, you, like, know, like, you're, 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 even if you ha just, like, have watched anime, 
you'll kind of understand what it's going for. I still would say, like, this is like a... It shouldn't be your first visual novel. You need to understand some of the tropes, some of how visual novels work before you go into this. Um, but, like, not that much, right? Like, you don't, you don't have to be super experienced. And you definitely don't have to fucking speak Japanese. I saw a debate on A the other day where someone was saying that, like, the term... Uh, cute girls doing cute things felt like new faggish to them um and there were some people sort of in the thread arguing about like this terminology right like slice of life versus cute girls doing cute things versus um iashi k versus um slice of life comedy uh to specify more directly and um What's strange is that I saw this thread and at the time I just sort of skimmed it and didn't really think about it. But just randomly right now, well, it's not actually random because someone in um, Kinkoi just said th- this word. And I was like, and it made me remember the thread, which is in Japanese or, or in Japan, <laughs> they call slice of life Nichijoukei. And that if we could just call this stuff Nichijo K or just Nichijo, that's, I mean, maybe it'd be confusing with the anime Nichijo, but Nichijo K is what the genre is called in Japan, which is also a very descriptive term. So I propose if you for some reason have a problem with cute girls doing cute things or um, slice of life being too, like, I can understand slice of life too broad. Yashi K, too specific. Cute girls doing cute things, too memey. Nichijo K is like, I mean, it basically just means slice of life, to be honest. So I don't know how useful it actually is to differentiate. You may as well just say slice of life at that point. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't really know why I'm bringing this up. <laughs> it looks like the death of Twitter was pretty much set in stone at this point. Or at least the, 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 like, increased shittification of Twitter. Which, which really, like, what we're really talking about here is the, the, it's something very sad. It's something very sad to me as someone who, well, I don't even know what to call it. I, I, I used to pride myself on being, being very online, being an online lane-pilled type of person, but now... Everyone is an online type of person. Um, but, so, I mean, you've all seen posts about this. Like, you don't need me to talk about it, but just to run through. Uh, we got, you know, Reddit fucking itself. Google is unusable these days. YouTube is, like, trying to shove shorts down everyone's faces and starting to block ad blockers, which I haven't noticed. Like, people are complaining about it, but it's... it. I guess it hasn't been rolled out in my region or whatever. Uh, and also trying to kill Invidious, which isn't working, because, well, I don't know. It's sort of working. We'll see how it goes for them. Um, what else am I to, what else happened? Uh, well, I guess all the other ones are basically dead already. Like Instagram, I've never used it uh, and have no desire to. Facebook has been dead for for years at this point. Uh, what other fucking places exist on the internet? You know, they're all dead. They're, they're all either dead or dying. Uh, they're being killed either on purpose or... I mean, Discord's going to kill itself as well soon because it's running out of money. Um, I guess all of these platforms ran out of investor money or... Uh, something I don't I don't really know what's happened but whatever it is it's bad uh, people are calling it the death of the public facing internet or the death of the public internet that like all of the actual internet discussion will happen behind closed doors on the sort of private internet um, so Twitter dying um, I think it's time for me to move on from Twitter at this point I I just don't think it's a uh, 
useful for its original purpose for me anymore. Um, and that's an interesting thing, because that's this is opening up uh, the question for me, which is, okay, uh, so where do I go? Because I want some way to communicate with um, people who, you know, to let people know if I'm doing something interesting with music or support artists that I like and share their stuff and, and this sort of thing. Um, I need somewhere to go to replace Twitter, ideally. I say that. There are three options for me, okay? So here are my three options that I've laid out. Option number one is the most obvious one. It's Mastodon or the Fediverse in general. Um, so I would jump ship to Mastodon just like lots of other people, and that would basically be that. It would sort of be a seamless transition. Uh, I don't know how much of my existing following I could move over to Mastodon, uh, but but I would, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, could be interesting, could be interesting. Mastodon, definitely the most seamless option, right, because it's the, the most popular alternative, um, and yeah. I have a lot of problems with Mastodon, though. Uh, the, the number one problem with Mastodon is that every Mastodon instance is still, like, they haven't solved the, the fundamental problem, which is that every Mastodon instance is either a super giga ubu hug box or just, like, Nazis and no one else. Uh, like, there's no, like, nice middle ground, which is kind of annoying. Now, I don't particularly post anything edgy or have any intentions of posting anything edgy on, on a public-facing platform, uh... You know, I'm 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 24. I'm I'm not 16 anymore, right? Like, I'm I'm okay with that. That was my notification, not yours. Um. So I think moving to a hug boxy platform isn't terrible. I just like ethically don't like uh sort of jannies, like like power tripping jannies, uh. But I guess, hopefully, I would never run into that sort of thing. I, yeah, I just ethically don't like it. Um, however, Mastodon is good because, you know, it's it's, it's fast, it's distributed. That's all cool. Uh, but then, yeah, you have the uh, issue of, like, what instance you choose. Uh, honestly, at this point, I've, I've looked through a bunch. Like, the one that I used to use, that I got banned from, is now, like, shutting down, which is definitely a big problem with these sorts of things. I kind of don't want to just join the standard mastodon.social instance. Um, I don't know why I don't want to do that, though. I feel like the reason I don't want to do it, I actually do know why. The reason I don't want to do it is because when I first was getting interested in Mastodon, like, 10 years ago, when it first existed, there was, like, just like every federated service, they, they, they tell you, like, hey, Everyone's going to use the main instance that we run. If you can avoid it, please do so that you don't put too much pressure on it. Like, that's the that's what I've been trained to think with Mastodon, mate, all of these, like, d decentralized federated platforms or whatever you want to call them, protocols. Uh, that I've trained, you, you get trained, like, if you can avoid using the main one to avoid putting pressure on the server, then do that. But I think Mastodon has probably, like, received a bunch of investor money or, like, crowdfunding money or something to, like, support large growth since it's, that's what seems to be happening. So that is definitely a possibility. Um, like, it's probably okay for me to just join the, the main central thing. But if I am going to move to Mastodon, I do want to, like, shop around for a good instance for a good while. Uh, okay, so that's the first option. Then the second option is um, just don't replace it with anything, right? Just just, just leave Twitter and then just leave social media. Just don't replace it with anything. There's also a viable option, probably better for my mental health to do this. Maybe, arguably, because that's the other problem with Mastodon. It doesn't solve, it doesn't really solve any of the like structural problems with Twitter. It doesn't solve the, um, the way that the feeds are curated, the way likes and retweets work, which is some a system that I'm not the biggest fan of. I have a bunch of problems with it. it. Like, it doesn't solve a lot of 
uh, it just recreates those issues in a, a friendlier packaging. So that's something I'm not a super big fan of either. Um, so yeah, just leave Twitter. Now the, the big disadvantage for this, like it wouldn't be that much of a burden on my life to just not scroll Twitter for like 30 minutes a day. That's fine. I can replace 30 minutes of my day with other shit that's more interesting to me. That's that's not a, an issue. The actual problem with it is that like I need, I, I uh, am a musician and I need a way to communicate to people when I have an album out or something. And that's what social media, like that's that's what always brings me back to social media is that like if I ever quit, next time I make an album, I end up logging back into Twitter just to post like, hey guys, album. And then I end up like back on Twitter. So I think quitting cold turkey is probably not the best option just for like my own, uh, I, I don't really want to call it a career because it's not like I really make any money <laughs> for my own, uh, you know, being able to do some self promo, a little bit of advertising, a little bit of marketing, which is something that's important. You know, I, I, I spend a lot of time working on my music and stuff. I want people to hear it. And I also want ways to communicate with people that, that, you know, not just about music, but about other things that I'm passionate about. So it's definitely an option, but it's also not ideal. Uh, and then the third option is to leave Twitter for something more obscure than Mastodon. So the options there would be basically blog plus RSS or maybe like TWTXT. Uh, I wish there was a catchier way of saying TWTXT. Twitext. Maybe I call it Twitext. Uh, those are probably the best two options, blog plus RSS or uh, Twitext, because there's no reason I can't just like micro blog on my own blog. Uh, the problem with this is it's much smaller reach. Very, very few people, like I bet no one in my audience even knows what Twitext even is. Uh, I would be willing to bet you you don't know what it is. If you do, shouts out to you, but it's a, it's a fairly obscure protocol. Uh, and it's not, uh, as far as I know, it's not something that you can like, unlike the other Fediverse alternative type things like Pleroma and GNU Social, um, Twitext isn't activity pub, so it doesn't fit into the, the standard activity pub Fediverse. It's its own uh, little microcosm. Now, as software, I like Twitext the best out of any Twitter alternative because it is super minimal, CLI, um, self-hosted, it's the most decentralized, the most minimal, the best programmed, you know, it's it's that. But it's also by far the smallest. Uh, very, uh, yeah, it's, it's not super commonly used. It also requires some technical know-how to get started, which would require, it, like, if I'm going to self-host, I need to like set up a headless Raspberry Pi server or something, um, which is kind of annoying. <laughs> uh, uh, so then blog plus RSS is the next option. Now, obviously, I already have a blog. It's nothankyou.neocities.org forward slash blog dash posts, I believe. But you, you can just find it on my Neocities, right? Um, the problem with this option is... Uh, that it's just a little bit of a pain to use because it's NeoCities and nothing is automated. Like, if I want to make a new post that's just a Twitter post, that's just, like, you know, a short paragraph, it means I have to, like, open up a text document, which is in my, like, uh, template, my, my, my HTML CSS template. Uh, well, it's just HTML, actually. My HTML template document, I have to open up that document on my ThinkPad, copy it to make a new one, uh, then write my short text post, upload that, then m manually add that to the list of entries on my blog post page, then manually add that to my RSS feed, which is just too, like, I'm just never going to do it, to be honest. Like, <laughs> it's just never going to happen. Uh, like, it won't happen unless I feel like I have something longer form to say, which is just kind of annoying. Uh... So, 
the best option for that would actually be to migrate my blog to like WordPress because that does automated RSS stuff. Like I don't know that you can automate RSS on NeoCities. Let me look this up. Um, let me see. Da, da, da. I will just pause the recording. Oh, Neo Cities actually does have built in RSS, which I actually remember. Like the second I saw that, I was like, oh yeah, I remember this now. Uh, I just decided to set up my own RSS feed because it would be less cluttered. But if it has automatic RSS, I just switch out the link from my feed to the Neo Cities feed the auto-generated one, and then just use that. So I can try that out as a Twitter alternative. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to go. But, I mean, let's see. It, it, it encourages me to use my website more, which is pretty cool. Um... It doesn't solve the issue of, like, uh, it, it takes a while to write a post. <laughs> that's, that's the issue it doesn't solve. But maybe I can get something going that makes that faster. Uh, we'll have to see. So I've decided the best option is probably Mastodon. I forgot that Blue Sky existed. And this really makes everything more complicated. Like, the fact that the guys that made Blue Sky didn't make it compatible with the Fediverse is such an evil move that they market themselves as, like, we're against walled gardens. But then it's like, oh, but by the way, uh, we're also a walled garden because we're the only ones using our weird fucking protocol that we made up, even though there's already a protocol that exists and has been in common usage for years. It's it's so bad because it obviously Blue Sky has a lot more publicity with normies than Mastodon does. It has a much like it I, it probably has like VC investments behind it. It has like robust server infrastructure. You know what I'm saying, right? Like. I'm going through my Twitter right now, trying to find people to follow on Mastodon, and they're all moving to fucking Blue Sky instead. Now, I, I don't believe that I have any reason to go to Blue Sky. I found a Mastodon instance that is, like, fine, you know? I guess I will slowly follow people. Um, you know, I, I don't fucking know. I'm just looking through... But no, no one, no one, so I think Neo Cities is going to be, um, a lot more popular, you know, I've already seen, like, three people, including me, linked to their Neo Cities, um, instead of, uh, you know, uh, some, some Instagram or whatever. Oh, fuck, what am I talking about? Right, yeah, Blue Sky, annoying as shit. But I found, I'm not going to reveal it, just, I mean, it doesn't matter, because by, I mean, I'm sure this will be public by the time this gets posted, so I'll just tell you. I am currently at, no thank you, at layer8.space. Um, so I guess I will uh, post this in my Discord. I'm just going to be like, fucking shilling this to people, um, uh, yeah, I guess I just show this to people on my Discord and then follow them back, wait, that's not how you spell Mastodon, it's Mastodon, um, yeah, fucking, that fucking all the people like the actual cool people I follow don't seem they're either just I don't know man I don't follow any cool people anyway 
maybe maybe I just have to like I don't know. I don't know what to fucking do about this. I think focusing on neo cities Okay, okay, okay. So this is the real the real truth of the matter at hand. I like if I'm talking plans, which is to go ham on everything I have access to shelling Discord. Because Discord, while it's dying, doesn't look like they're going to kill Discord servers anytime soon, right? Like, they might put voice chats behind a paywall or image posting behind a paywall, but NeoCities and Discord, I doubt, are going to go down anytime soon in the way that, like, Twitter is and whatever. But the point is that Discord is, like, very direct communication. I can pretty much guarantee that anyone who's in my Discord will see my posts. I, I'm, like, fairly certain of that. Which means I can slowly bridge the Discord over to Element, right? I can do that. I can turn it into an Element space or a Matrix space over time, and people can migrate over, and then we're fully, you know, de- we're fully defenestrated, we're fully federated, then then I don't have to rely on any of this shit anymore. I just have to, like, push people over to a Discord, which then goes to Matrix eventually, and then, uh, and then we're, we're Gucci. Uh, I need to fucking find people to follow on Mastodon. This is always the hardest part of Mastodon. Like, the two other times I've set up a a Mastodon and a Pleroma thing is finding people to follow. Very annoying. Well, I'll figure these things out, I suppose. Yeah, ain't no one staying on Mastodon. Uh, I've pretty much given up. And at this point, the reason I've given up is because... uh, it's because of two main reasons. Uh, let's say three reasons. The first reason is it seems like every single Twitter user that I actually care about is moving to Blue Sky instead of Mastodon. So I guess I'm going there. Uh, the second reason is because uh, post quality on Mastodon is just generally lower. Um, and what I mean by that is the people who post on Mastodon are all like... It has the same problem as like... Uh, uh, fucking Gemini does, for example, where, like, the vast majority of the users are, like, very tech-savvy people who are in the tech field and post mostly about Mastodon. So, like, people are... The, the variety of posts you're getting are just very limited. Like, most of the time, it's just people about posting about some Linux thing or some Mastodon thing and not really, you know, Twitter, it, like, as in, it's not really people just, like, a bunch of people who are interesting, it's just random tech people, and, um, it's also really hard to find fucking anyone, uh, because no one's on there, uh, so, but the third reason is the big thing, the big problem, which is the way Mastodon is set up, it's like allowing users to block instances or allowing the so the way the way that I imagine they wanted it to work was that everyone would like self host, right? Everyone, oh, you just host your own instance and that's easy. The problem is hosting your own Mastodon instance requires just way too much to expect of any normal person. Um, like, you have to have a server that's up all the time. No one does that. Like, yeah, maybe you can go ahead and set up a a headless Raspberry Pi setup or whatever, but, like, no one's doing that. Let's just be honest with each other. Let's be honest with ourselves and with everyone. Ain't no one fucking doing that shit. No one, no one is, very, very few people are going to be self-hosting their own instance. And then the double problem with that is the way... 
I mean, it's block lists. It's still block lists. It's the fact that every popular instance blocks Pawu. If you don't know, Pawu is Pixiv's own Mastodon instance. Um, and it's where, like, the vast majority of, like, Japanese artists are. I mean, almost all of them are on Pawu. It's 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 the biggest Mastodon instance. It's, it's very big in Japan. Um, and yet, every single Western popular Mastodon instance, and popular is important here because that means reliable, right? Like, if you join some rando instance with 12 people on it, they're all just friends and you're just a random guy um it's very unreliable right this is run by some guy who doesn't have any money is probably going to run out of money at some point and stop bothering to host it um you don't actually want that uh and then you have to migrate instances and it's a whole fucking pain you lose your account it's bad right Ideally, you want to be on the most reliable ones, which are going to be the biggest ones, which have a large team maintaining them and stuff like that. Uh, but all of those ones, uh, they all share block lists where they, they just block certain um, instances, uh, one of which is is Pawu. So all the Japanese artists that I would like to follow are basically blocked by default, which fucking sucks. And if you make your own instance that doesn't block these people, then you get added to the the big blacklist. And then all of the major instances block you. You see how it works? When I was a kid, um, this was reminded to me by the newest um, Red Letter Media video. You know, I feel bad about being on the internet these days, as in, like, in the... not. There's two ways of being on the internet, right? There's being on the internet, as in, like, uh, hey, what are you doing on the computer? Oh, I'm just on the internet right now. That's being on the internet. But the other way of being on the internet is is like I am for you right now. Where there's a part of me that is literally inside the internet that other people can see. I am on the internet. I am I am there. You can look me up. There's two ways of being on the internet. Both ways feel bad to me right now. Uh, but the problem with the second one is I kind of feel like I need to be the change I want to see in the world. And the change I want to see is for people to just like stop posting their random opinions about shit as if anyone cares. Um, but frankly, you know what, actually, no, I take that back, because I would much, much rather people talk about random film opinions than fucking politics, so, you know what, I'm gonna talk about movies, and no one's gonna give a shit about my random ass opinions about movies, and I don't fucking care, okay, good, good, post more about movies, as long as it's not talking about fucking politics, Okay, so movies. Um, new wrestler, it's not new anymore to me, but the but the latest Red Letter Media video is a review or review of um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, uh, which as a kid was my favorite Indiana Jones movie. Uh, if I had to rate them as a kid, I would have gone uh, Temple of Doom, Raiders, and then Last Crusade, and then Crystal Skull. Even as a kid, I knew Crystal Skull sucked. I saw it in cinemas, and it was bad. Um, but yeah, Temple of Doom was my favorite, mainly because it had Short Round in it, who I thought was... I mean, he's a kid, I'm a kid, we were the same age. So that was just a... Like, I didn't know what the fuck was going on in the movie. Um, but anyway, it's it's... There's also a new Indiana Jones movie coming out, apparently, which I'm not going to watch. Uh, but I, something they said in that review that really struck a chord with me, or I was like, oh yeah, that was the case, is that, like, Star Wars and Indiana Jones were, like, the two big franchises. Like, they were linked in my mind as a kid. Like, these are the two things. Um... I mean, they both have George Lucas involved in them, right? 
Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And um, just like they said on the review, like, hey, I was actually way more into Indiana Jones as a kid than I was compared to Star Wars. Same for me. I was also way more into Indiana Jones as a kid than I was into Star Wars. And Temple of Doom was my favorite as a kid. But I currently just want to rewatch Raiders. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rewatch Raiders for the first time in over 10 years. Well over 10 years. Many years. I'm actually very excited. Um, I haven't seen this movie since I was a kid. So this should be exciting for me. Okay, so I watched it. Uh, I watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, okay, let me give some thoughts. So, plot-wise, one of the things that shocked me about this movie, revisiting it, is how little Indy actually does. In fact, he doesn't succeed once during the entire movie. You could literally take him out of the movie and actually... Things would have gone better if he wasn't involved. Because he originally led the Nazis to that place in Nepal, the, the, the bar, where um, <clears throat> the big bad Nazi guy gets the, the, the amulet thing burned into his hand, right? They wouldn't have had any fucking idea where to go or what to do without him. Then, so first of all, they get, they get what they, they find out where to go because of him. But then they're digging in the wrong place. So he very helpfully digs in the right place to show them exactly where to go when they find him. Then, so they wouldn't have found the Ark if it wasn't for him at all. <clears throat> like, they had, they had no idea where to go. They didn't have, they didn't know who had the, the amulet, the head of the Staff of Ra. They had no idea. So he led them right to it, basically. They had no idea where to dig. Maybe they would have found it eventually, but he definitely sped it up at the very least. Um, then he escapes the pit with the snakes and shit. He escapes, he gets to the plane, and then fucks up their plan there. So he succeeds in fucking up their plan there, but it's not really a big deal because they're just like, oh, we'll put the Ark on a, on a truck. Okay. He goes off to the truck. One of the best scenes in, in that car chase slash fight scene is fucking amazing. Genius. Just all around brilliant. <clears throat> one of the best scenes in any movie. Like, the, one of the best action scenes of all time. Um, but, <clears throat> you know. And that goes pretty well for him. But in the end, it doesn't even matter... <clears throat> I don't even remember what happens at the end of that. What the fuck happens? Okay, so he he gets the truck and he drives away with the Ark. But then something happens and he gives it back to them somehow. Wait, I've forgotten what happens. Oh, no, I know. He gets on a boat. Yeah, he he almost escapes. It's all going well. But then they get it back. They get the Ark back, right? Because <clears throat> he gets on a boat. So they get it back. They put it on a U-boat. He goes after it. He clings onto the outside of this U-boat for the whole time. He's very lucky that it didn't go underwater at all. Goes all the way back to their base. So, by the way, he's achieved nothing. The Nazis still have the Ark. <laughs> right? And then... They open it up, and then instead of him doing anything, so he disguised himself as a guard, and then has them at fucking, you know, holds them at the, 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 the bad end of a rocket launcher, and then can't do it, because he can't bring himself to destroy an archaeological find. <clears throat> Slash, he doesn't want to hurt the girl, but probably the first one, right? And then... They open the Ark anyway, and then God comes and gets him. And then God deals with it. It was just God that dealt with it. At the end of the day, it's, the, it's just that this side character, who's very determined, but ultimately doesn't do anything, and he fucks up so bad that literally Yahweh has to come down and kill the Nazis for him. Because he's so bad at doing it. 
they hit that they in, in the end they're not defeated by our main hero who really achieves nothing through the whole movie and just like survives they're actually defeated by the literal wrath of god um so that's kind of crazy that that's the movie like i'd forgotten that, that was what the movie was that it's it's indie not doing anything really like just sort of wandering around being a, 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 a absolute most being a pain in their ass causing them a bit of a hassle and at worst directly leading them to the thing they want in the end he doesn't even get what he wants well at least what he wanted at the start of the movie obviously what he really wants is the the girl what's her name i don't remember who cares um but, you know, he's he obviously wanted the Ark to be in a museum. It was obviously not, it didn't happen at the end of the movie. But, <clears throat> yeah, that's crazy. Um, I don't know if I... I don't know what to even think about the, that fact. <laughs> um, this film has amazing editing. I'm always gonna notice good editing in a film the editing in this film is amazing top notch best in the biz the lighting in this film is so good so good um <clears throat> yeah i mean obviously all the directing is generally good the fight scenes some of the fight scenes they're a little uh dated they're a little um you know <clears throat> they're not super choreographed. They're kind of they're kind of WWE rather than uh, Jackie Chan. <laughs> you know, they're not like super interesting. Well, I mean, they have some good set pieces, but the actual like moment to moment choreography of the fights is kind of just two dudes punching each other or three dudes shooting each other or something like that. Like, there's to me, it's not it. The, the the gun fights, you know, they're not John Woo. <clears throat> and the uh, the martial arts fights, they're not... I've seen better. It's a little... It's a little pro wrestling tier kind of stuff. The, the, the fist fights. It's kind of pro wrestling tier. Also, the whip. The iconic whip. One of the most iconic things in the film. Honestly, barely, like, comes up. In the movie. It's relevant like right at the start of the movie. In what is essentially the prologue. And then it like comes up maybe once or twice. But it's he doesn't really use the whip that much. He uses guns and fists. Way more than he uses the whip. Like the whip is just kind of a. A thing that's there. You know it doesn't it doesn't actually come into play that much. Which is it's also interesting. That that's such an iconic part of the movie. When he, he barely even uses it. Um. Yeah, uh, fuck, there's something else I was gonna say. I don't remember what it was. It definitely. I mean, yeah, let's. If I had to say, like, the big thing that stands out to me as, like, a modern audience watching this movie back, it's. The. Frankly, the balls that this movie has. Well, it's not balls, because at the time, this wasn't unusual. To, like, actually do an exposition dump at the start of the film. Like, I like that. That's actually a really good scene. I really like that. I think uh, if this was a modern movie, that exposition dump would have sucked. Because what they would have done is they would have been like, Oh no, we can't bore our audience with an exposition dump at the beginning. So instead, they would have, like, sort of glazed over it. But then that would have meant that they'd have to, like, re-explain themselves three times throughout the movie. And it would have sucked because that's what movies do these days because they can't be bothered to just sit the audience down and, and talk about something for a second. Like you watch these modern blockbusters, they, they do this thing. They will like have a big MacGuffin or some, you know, the whatever needs to be exposited. And instead of just doing the exposition, they will like semi do it, undercut it with a bunch of jokes so you don't really know what's important and what's a joke. Um... Have it like be 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 cut off halfway through by some sort of pointless action scene or or, or something like that, and then because they've half-assed the exposition, 
they have to keep repeating shit through the movie because they haven't they haven't actually told the audience clearly what's going on. If you just do an exposition scene, it only takes like one. This movie does it in one scene. It's a great scene. Then you yeah I don't know I I don't like it when movies don't just like if you need to expose it just expose it you know don't don't fucking try and play it off like you're not doing that. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh what a what a what a crazy movie. What a crazy film. I wanna live in the alternate universe where the Dreamcast was the most successful genre of its for console of its generation. I want to live in the universe where the Sega Dreamcast was the most successful console of his generation. I don't want to live in this universe. I want to live in the Dreamcast universe. Take me over to the Dreamcast universe. I want to be playing Sonic Adventure forever. Yesterday something something kind of funny happened. I've I've come after I've slept on it. I've come to the conclusion that Twitter dying is actually fine. I don't mind. We don't need to look for a replacement. We just leave Twitter. That's the conclusion I've come to. Uh, the Macedon is not very good. Blue Sky is probably not very good. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it's just not that important to have a Twitter replacement. Honestly, Twitter doesn't add much to, like, humanity, let alone my life, you know? Like, probably just leave it. Probably just leave it be, let it die. I'll just have my Discord on my personal website, and that'll be that'll be how it is. Um, I think that's an okay situation, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, federated stuff as as hype as it was at a certain point, it just doesn't really work because of 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 the 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 concept of defederation, like involuntary defederation, kind of ruins it, um, and like oligarchy. Uh, I've uh, th- 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 spent too long on that, but yeah, t- it's really Twitter as a concept, like the micro blogging format. Whether it's Macedon, Twitter, Blue Sky, whatever the fuck, it's kind of fundamentally a bad idea. So I think we're gonna be okay without it. I'm just gonna hang out on image boards, on my personal blog, and on Discord slash Matrix, and be good with it. I th- I feel like that's kind of the deal, and YouTube, you know. I feel like we're kind of fine, right? I feel like Twitter dying is actually a positive for humanity. I don't know why I was, like, scared about this. I think Reddit dying is a bigger problem because it ruins Google search results. Um, you know, I, I yeah. Uh, Twitter dying just kills Twitter, and it's probably a fine thing to kill. So I, I don't know why I was so freaked out about this. Um... It doesn't really bother me now that I actually like sit down and think about it. I was just kind of depressed because I'm I was thinking like, um, I was just missing the old days of the internet really. But the thing is, whether or not, like, Twitter has nothing to to do with that. That's just time. Anyway, fuck. That was not what I was gonna say. I was gonna say something. F- oh yeah, I was gonna tell the story, which is. Um, so I, after being, like, going kind of schizo about how every platform on the internet is either, like, an uwu hug box, uh, uh, pastel-colored panopticon, or just full of actual, like, Nazis who just do nothing but post Nazi shit all the time, both of which are just extremely annoying places to be in, uh, like, and there's no in-between, like, every, you have to basically pick one or the other, and I was, like, really annoyed at that. And I was like, why Why is everything full of people who just want to, like, make their politics? Which side of that politics they're on, their whole personality? So when I hop on TF2, I end up in a Hightower server. Immediately, there's two guys in voice chat. I mean, this is the TF2 experience, right? You hop on a Hightower server. Immediately, there's two guys with the worst mic quality you've ever heard in voice chat. And they're not arguing, actually. They were agreeing with each other about something, I don't even remember what it was, I think it might have been about, like, the COVID vaccine, um, whatever it was, I just muted them, because it was, it was fucking loud as shit, <laughs> their mics were so loud, and I was trying to lis- uh, listen to music, so I just muted them, but then, 
uh, this is what made me fucking go schizo is because I went to TF2 to avoid the like everyone is either Nazis or transgender and, and uh, you know trans foes and nothing's in between and then I I go to TF2 and then next thing you know a transgender furry joins and then the first two guys who were like everyone the entire fucking like text chat just turns into like a shit show I mean this is just how it is right uh, the entire text chat Shit turns into the shit show where some people are trying to just post as edgy as possible. Like there's a group of people just trying to post as edgy as possible about how evil, evil the trans people are and how gro- icky and gross it is or whatever. And the other side is people like vaguely defending it, but obviously they can't be edgy, so that it just comes like it's both. I mean, it's just terrible. The best option is just to ignore it, right? You don't you don't get in an argument like that. Which to be honest. The actual trans furry that joined just ignored the voice, the, the text, the, just ignored it. Like, they they, po- they said, like, one or two things and then just kept playing the game, which is the correct opinion. So, shout out to that person. That's what you're supposed to do. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, then, as they were trying to out, these guys were, like, trying to out-edgy each other, right, to, in, a, in this sort of reactionary I mean, it was literally a reaction to someone joining the server with the trans flag in their their avatar. Um, uh, someone said, like, uh, like uh, we need a new Hitler, right? Which is a pretty standard thing you see in a TF2 chat. We need a new Hitler. Very funny, right? Stupid. And then the other, some other guy was like, uh, like, obviously that started a bit of an argument. They were like, oh, I don't know about that, Hitler, blah, blah, blah. But then one guy was like, listen... I like Hitler because he had some great military strategies. And that was fucking hilarious because then everyone turned against that guy. Even all of the right-wing people, all of the left-wing people in the chat, everyone was just like, what the fuck are you talking about? You think he lost the war for a reason. Uh, like, I, I think uh, someone was like, oh, he has great military strategies like invading Russia in the winter, a classic. And it, was, it was fucking really funny how, like, suddenly... No one cared about any of that anymore because someone just said something so stupid that all of the, like, they said, this is what I want. We want more of this. We want more of this part. It was like everyone went from all of the culture war stuff suddenly threw out the window because someone just said something so, so historically inaccurate that everyone in TF2 is ultimately a nerd and can't just sit by and let that happen. That's, that was the, that was the funny part that I wanted to say. Okay, we're two hours in. We're doing comment responses. We're doing comment responses um, on the last one. Okay, we've got... Uh, wait, what the hell was that? Copyright matches. Why is YouTube giving me copyright matches? I have to... You know what? I'm curious. I Honestly, I'm curious because I, I want to know if it... Like, I, I highly doubt it. I highly doubt anyone's... What is this? Don't... Wait, what is this? I'm confused. Simple flips, 100% of their video is a match for what? What the hell? Wait, why Why is there a simple flips video that... Wait, this is fucked. This is fucked. It's telling me that I have the copyright on a random simple flips video. Wait, why do I have the copyright on this simple flips video? What is, I, I haven't re-uploaded a video. Wait, I'm so confused. I'm so confused. What the hell? It's telling me I have a hundred percent copyright over ownership, and I can re- I can literally request video removal. I why? What is this? What the hell is this? It thinks that this simple flippers video is a copyright match to my random TF two stream. What the hell? And it thinks it's... Wow, the YouTube copyright system is broken! What the hell is this? What the fuck is this? It thinks... It thinks... (laughs) What? What the fuck? That's so strange. And the fact that it's Simple Flips as well, who's like my favorite YouTuber, that's such a weird coincidence. What the hell? That doesn't make any fucking sense. That's so weird. Okay, anyway. Uh, 
comment responses. So Sunset In says uh, three questions. What's your VNDB account called? Link, please. Uh, I don't. I don't want to make my VNDB public because uh, half of it is embarrassing porn games, uh, and I don't. I I feel uh, a little uncomfortable with my uh, YouTube followers knowing my hyper specific uh, and weird fetishes. So I'm I'm keeping my VNDB private. Um, next is any thoughts on BookTube? Uh, is that, is that just what they call, like, book review YouTube? I have no idea. I, I'm not involved. I, I, I like the YouTube channel better than food book reviews, I guess. That's a good channel. Uh, and, and what do you think of Libido Carmen's videos? I saw you leave a comment on one of them. Uh, that guy seems kind of cool, I guess. I don't really know that much about Libido Carmen. I've just watched a couple of his videos. He looks a lot like me, which is very funny. And, uh... He seems to have a whole thing about, like, uh, um, y you can't criticize otaku media unless, like, you can do better, which I feel like is kind of retarded. <laughs> um, uh, like, being, being an otaku means, like, also learning to draw and, like, learning to animate and stuff, learning to make visual art. Like, I don't agree with that. I feel like... Y y you can just be a be a, a a fan without without having to do that. That doesn't. I mean, I appreciate the Dojin Circle meme, but I feel like if you're if you're in the West, you're just already like fucked from doing that sort of thing. I guess that, maybe I'm wrong though. Uh, he does like he has a a Mai Tetsu figure in many of his videos, which is which is based. Uh, so that that's my thoughts on libido Carmen. I don't think his videos are, like, terrible or anything. I just kind of disagree with some of his opinions. Um, Danmako, Danmaku Suki noticed an obscure Digibro reference. I guess it's not that obscure. A semi-obscure Digibro reference right at the start of the video, which was pretty funny. And Vinny Contiello says... Jaco Pistorius, Adam Neely, no thank you. Every time I hear someone talking about Bach, it's always bass players. What's up with that? That's a good point. Uh, there's something about it. Like, I feel like... Uh, well, firstly, a lot of bass players learn to play the cello suites on bass because they're really... They, they translate from cello to bass really well. Um, I learned part of it and then gave up and I can't play it anymore. So I need to get back on that because it will... Like, it will change your life, <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, but the, I think it's something to do with, like, the way bass lines work, like, there's, there's a, there's a, there's some sort of, like, how do I even put it? It's like a, a trans, translation between, like, Bach's cello lines and, like, Motown bass lines. I feel like there's something similar about the way they're composed. Um, it's hard for me to put in, I, I, I don't know, it's like the simplicity of it. It's the simple beauty of it. It's like, like... It's it's almost it's almost about intentionality. I think this is actually it. The diff the similarity between like bass lines, modern bass lines, and like Bach's lines, is it's it's about like every single note being super intentional and important. Because if you're playing bass in a band, you root the harmony of of the band. You're the lowest instrument, so whatever whatever note you play at any point is the chord. That determines the chord that the entire band is playing, is whatever root note you're playing, right? You harmonize the entire band. So every single bass note, like every note in a bass line is super important. And you also don't want it to be too busy, right? You want, you want bass lines to be generally like relatively stripped back and, and in the groove, in the pocket, being more of the rhythm section rather than like very flowery and melodic. I, and a lot of that stuff is also, like, that intentionality, that sort of, like, don't make it, like, super complicated, a million notes, weird extensions and stuff like that. Keep it, like, you know, stripped back, I guess, or, like, just play the notes you you, you, you need to play. It, it's also very present in Bach. Uh, Vinny Contiello also says... 
My man is out here ragging on the Americanization of language while simultaneously committing heinous Anglo war crimes on the word pasta. What are you, how are you supposed to say pasta? Pasta! Pasta! Pasta pizza pasta pie! <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, mate. How the fuck are else are you supposed to say pasta? That's how the words... You can't fuck it up. What are you talking about? How am I, how am I committing heinous Anglo war crimes on the word pasta? Pasta. Is that better? You you want me to... Okay, let me ask you a question. You think it would sound more natural if I was t- talking a perfectly normal sentence, right? Normal, normal, right? I'm just walking around. I'm like... uh. So yeah, you know, we're, we're hanging out, we're thinking about uh, maybe going to a restaurant after this, maybe going to some pasta, to, you know, hang out over there. Like, no one's going to, that sounds way worse, <laughs> you don't want to do that. It's like people who, like, uh, go really hard on French pronunciation. They're like, um, they, go, they go to the shop or whatever, and they're like, yeah, can I get a, uh, a, a pain au chocolat, pain au chocolat, you know, something like that. Like, they, they really, uh, a, une baguette. They really, like, try and go in the French pronunciation when they're getting pastries. You don't do that, okay? The words get anglicized for a reason. Because otherwise it sounds weird and unnatural. Um, you don't... You know what I mean? Like, it, it's the same reason why Japanese loan words, they don't, they don't stop in... The, I mean, sometimes they do. Like, there's a really funny, like, Kamen Rider clip of this guy saying, like, uh, stronger and strongest in, like, a like, very American accent in the middle of Japanese sentences. Very funny. Uh, but they speak in katakana, right? <laughs> when when they, they use loan words. What's it called? Ge- geiraku? Something like that? Gairaku? Gairaku, I think, is loan word. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh... Yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how language works. That's literally how... I mean... The English language is like 90% French words that we've butchered anyway because of the fucking Normans. Uh, <clears throat> I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's butchering. I don't think it's butchering to 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 pronounce words how they would be pronounced in your language when they're when they're loan words from another language. That's not that's different. But also I can understand what you're talking about if it was something that was complete that was pronounced completely wrong. I can understand it. Like, for example, if you'd said, like, well, the Italian word is bolognese, but we just say bolognese, like, that's very different, or something like something like that. Maybe there's uh, some some worse example uh, that I just can't think of right now. Then I could understand it. You could be like, well, look, it's completely fucking different. Uh, or uh, maybe... People say, like, mozzarella instead of mozzarella, something like that. I don't know if that's just a New York thing. I have no idea. Uh, like, if it was something that... But pasta, I feel like, is just pronounced basically the same. Like, what's even the difference? I've, I've watched Italian... I don't know why I'm, like, like questioning myself. I've seen plenty of Italian chefs say the word pasta, and they just say it normally. I don't understand this, man. I'm missing something, clearly. I'm missing something. Speaking of Italian food... I want a fucking Italian sandwich, deli, like, like, panini, right now, and I want it bad. Um, but, uh, it's fucking Sunday, so the shop's not gonna be open, because of Christianity. Because of goddamn Christianity. But I can't even get one, so I just have to settle for whatever's in my fridge. God fucking damn it! Okay, so, uh, the person who just sent me that comment actually sent me a longer version of the comment on discord it's the good student shouts out um well i already responded to what's your vndb account uh let's go in more depth have you watched libido comments videos i noticed your comment on one of them he argues that if you can't create a good story you don't truly understand what makes a good story it seems like he says this to defend his choice of being a creator um yeah i just disagree (laughs) That's, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's just, it's just obviously not true. Like, in the same way, okay, let's say, I mean, the obvious example is sports, right? Like, like, if you're watching from the pulled back perspective of a sports fan, and you see some player make a mistake, 
you can still note the mistake and point it out, even if you yourself are not of any, like, athletic ability. In fact, specifically because you have the unique perspective of a fan that the author doesn't have, that actually gives you a whole different right to, to comment and critique um, something. Uh, do I think it will make you a better... Uh, um, critique or critic rather sorry do i think it would make you a better at understanding and criticizing media if you yourself have some experience creating it yes a hundred percent um i don't think it's necessary though also i'd be curious to know what libido Carmen's like stuff is that he's made because i mean i'd just be curious um <clears throat> you could disable comments on certain videos like a particular youtuber did but then people will accuse you of closing comments. I don't blame YouTube for removing dislikes, even if it was for the wrong reason. It's sufficient if the creator can see the dislikes. The only time dislikes were helpful to viewers was when watching tech tutorials. Dislikes were more useful than critical comments are, though. The reason for this is that since people can read each other's comments, they'll all repeat each other's criticisms rather than doing anything they thought of individually. Um, I mean, there was no reason to remove dislikes. I, I, I think the thing... Like, you're not wrong, but there's another step to it, which is that when websites remove the ability for you to, like, quickly express displeasure with something or dissatisfaction with something, like, through a dislike or a downvote or something like that, it uh, pushes people, like, it discourages uh, maybe the the lowest tier of of um, discontent, right? So it's like the average person, they see something they don't like, they go to dislike it, they realize there's no dislike button, and then they just move on with their life. But there was a group of those people who would have, in the past, just downvoted and moved on with their life. But now they see, oh, I can't downvote? Okay, I gotta go out of my way to, like, type out an angry comment in response to this. That would never have happened b- before if, there were, if, if they just had an easy, like, systems way to, to express the fact that they didn't like something. Because then it's like, okay, if there's not an easy way to, t- to tell people I didn't like this thing... Now I have to make absolutely sure everyone knows I didn't like this thing. So I think you're actually going to get more hate comments and stuff like this. I think this is why Twitter is such a fucked up place. is because there's no dislike. Um, and so it encourages people to get all, get all weird with it. Start finding some sort of moral failings with the people who made it. Start like e-stalking them and so on. Um, I don't think I'm going to disable comments. Uh, I don't really mind getting a few negative comments on a few videos here and there. It's not a big deal. Uh, I think there were other times when dislikes were helpful to viewers, but uh, I pretty much generally agree with that. Uh, what do you think of Dungeons and Dragons as a game? I've only played a little bit of D and D. Um, it seems okay. I don't have enough. Well, I don't know. I I I have some friends who do tabletop RPGs. Um, I've never super been involved in their 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 group where they they do it. Um, I'm j- I don't think I'm reliable enough as a person to like show up t- for a, a session on a regular basis because my sleep cycle's so fucked up. Uh, it seems kind of fun, but I've I've listened to. Uh, I don't know. I I know I'm comparing D and D to like every tabletop RPG, and it's it's not the same thing. Uh, I mean, it, it seems kind of fun. As I understand, like, <clears throat> people who actually care about tabletop RPGs generally say, like, D&D is not the best, that there are, like, better ones. And I, I, I probably trust their opinion, because I just haven't played that many. Uh, with light novels, you only need to read one volume to evaluate them, making it easier than with visual novels. For reading EPUBs on your laptop... Sumatra PDF Reader version 3.3.3 is comfortable. It comes with Vim keybinds, but you might need to use Wine on Linux. I already have a PDF Reader. I use um, Zathura, and it can do EPUBs. I, I, actually, I use... Um, when I'm reading light novels, I use... Oh, fuck, what's it called? Calibre. Calibre uh, on Linux. Perfectly fine for reading light novels. Or novels of any kind. If you get distracted while reading... You could use a semi-decent TTS to read the, the text aloud, allowing you to continue without stopping. However, finding a good TTS might be challenging, since most of them are not great. I recommend Ivona Justin, but I couldn't find a download. There are a few options available on the Internet Archive. The Edge web browser also has a good TTS, but you still need to convert the EPUB to a PDF or HTML to open with Edge. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm just going to read slowly. 
if you're reading manga with your phone, it also isn't a bad idea to get a cheap Android tablet, less zooming. That's what Dotsmite does. Uh, personally, I don't. it doesn't bother me, really. I don't mind zooming. Have you tried using ChatGPT from the OpenAI site rather than Bing? I find that it works a bit better. If you have a good PC, you can also run one of those open source AI models, which are a bit less lobotomized than ChatGPT. Um, ChatGPT just straight up wouldn't let me sign up when I tried to. Like, it, the website just broke. I, I don't really know what happened there. Probably tried to use some privacy, bad privacy feature, and my browser just blocked it without even telling me, something like that. Uh, but yeah, it, it just straight wouldn't let me sign up to ChatGPT. Um, and I, I have a decent PC that could probably run my own self-hosted AI, but uh, I've stopped caring about AI at this point. It's just, uh, I don't see how it's very, I, I don't understand how it could be very useful to me, given how, like, it just, it's not like you can use it for, I mean, the only thing that I can possibly think of using an AI for is, like, writing a video script, but I don't, um... The thing is, you can tell when video scripts are written by AI. Like, you can tell. They're not very good. It doesn't write very well. Um, I, w I want more creative control. Like, it could be good for inspiration, but I already get inspiration from the world. So what's the other things that it's useful for? Nothing. I don't really know what, 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 I, what use case I have for ChatGPT or any sort of AI. I, I, I mean... I'm sure some people have a good use case for it, but as time has gone on, I've realized that it's kind of just like a solution looking for a problem. Like, there's really... I mean, there are, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of applications for, like, machine learning models as, like, a broad category of thing. They're super powerful. Large language models specifically, um... I don't, I don't know. <laughs> for me, I don't know. For the world, like, not super useful, given that they're not good at, like, knowing when things are true, for example. Like, there was a... Uh, I mean, you, you can just take a look at this thing where everyone was... At first, oh my god, it passed the bar. We don't need lawyers anymore. Then, lawyers actually start using ChatGPT to cheat. They immediately get caught out because it cites made-up case law and then get disbarred. So, that's what happened in the real world. Um, yeah, I, it's, I'm a little skeptical. I'm more skeptical now than I was at first. I, I don't know. But thanks for your uh, comment. I don't know why YouTube won't let you post it, so you had to message it to me. But, um, YouTube is, uh, it's because everyone complained about YouTube comments being this, like, terrible. I, I don't know, man. I, I, we need to go back. We need to go back. I just recorded this because something went wrong, so I'll do it again. Um... What struck me, you know what's interesting about all of these big tech companies, um, megacorps, like, supposedly running out of money, right? Like, they're, all of these places are suddenly trying to squeeze their users for every last penny they possibly can. What's strange to me about this is that there's no, there's absolutely no shot they're running out of money. There's absolutely no shot. The, the common narrative is, oh, these places just burn investor money. They've just run out of investor money. Not true. I ha Well, it may be partially true, but there's no way that's the whole story. And here's why. Because I know for a fact that loads of websites that are only like one step down from the megacorps are sustained entirely through small ads and user donations. We're talking like stuff like 4chan, for example. Like, if 4chan, it may not be profitable, but if it makes enough money to sustain itself, with its very unobtrusive, you know, system, there's no fucking way that Twitter isn't bringing in billions every day. Let me tell you. All of this talk, it's like everyone's suddenly forgotten how these websites make money, which is by selling your data. Do you know how... Because you're worth, like, at least you were. This is my theory. I'll get into it. But there was a point when... You were worth a lot of money. If you're like a, 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 a someone living in America, an adult in the US, you know how much you're worth? About $35 a month, according to a quick Google search. Do you know how much 
insane amount of money that is spread over millions of users that is just an insanely i mean it's billions of dollars that's the th main thrust of their income it's it's billions and billions of dollars it's insane right um you know the fact that they're advertising to you they're selling these ad spots and maybe they have some gay ass subscription service that doesn't fucking matter they're not making any money off that they're making money from selling you right that th there's no way that these websites aren't profitable because all of the websites that are one step down are somehow doing fine. There are Minecraft servers out there that rake in tens of millions a year. Minecraft servers, right? There's no fucking way that a website as big as Twitter is 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 somehow losing money. It's insane. Unless they really seriously fucked up. Or unless, and this is my little theory, something's happened that user data is now worth a lot less than it used to be worth this is the thing that i've just thought about if that's the case if there's been a collapse in the data economy then it would make a lot of sense for everything to move to a subscription model and oh no we can't afford to pay our hosting costs and so on <clears throat> but honestly you can afford to pay your hosting costs like you can <laughs> This idea is nonsense. This whole... Like... I don't know where the money's fucking going. I don't know where the money's going. But the money's there. Like... They're just fucking up for no reason, these people. They're just greedy. They're just greedy. There's... I mean, there's no way. There's absolutely no way. Firstly... They claim not to make a profit. Because it doesn't say they make a profit on their tax returns. Because if you make a profit, you have to pay more tax. So they claim not to make a profit. I don't believe it. They're making shitloads of fucking money. And I know they're making that money. As I said, because we know roughly how much user data is worth. And we know how smaller sites that are only one rung down on the ladder can sustain themselves with a much less aggressive monetization strategy. So clearly... Someone somewhere is either lying or we, the public, are missing something. And I think that something is there might have been a collapse in the market for user data. I don't know why. That's my theory right now. I don't know why, but I think it's possible. I just saw the announcement trailer for the fucking Suicide Squad Isekai. I want to fucking suicide myself and go to an isekai world so I don't have to fucking be in the same universe as this shit. Uh, let me tell you why this is going to suck, and I hope I don't eat my words, because there is a there is a very real... I mean, actually, let me do some research before I start talking about my ass. Okay, so it's the director's first directorial debut. He's done other stuff, but he's never been a director before, which to me smells like we picked a noob guy so that we can, like put him in charge where he's really the puppet to our corpo needs uh, that's what it sounds like you know to me the second thing is this feels like something that's being made for western audiences um and when they try and make anime with japanese studios that are directly targeted at western audiences like be the beginning for example uh, it tends to go very badly uh, so we'll see and then thirdly it's studio wit which is like the Giga Normie studio. They did, you know, Spy Family and uh, Attack on Titan. They have done some good stuff like Oni Pan. That was good. I liked Oni Pan. Rolling Girls. Rolling Girls was pretty chill. I kind of liked Rolling Girls. I haven't seen that much other stuff by them. Uh, Osama Ranking. I didn't really like that one. Uh, yeah, anyway, Wit, not my favorite studio. Anyway, this is going to be bad, and let me explain to you why it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad for the reasons I just outlined. They're going to try and make it appeal to a normie Western audience, which is going to suck. Uh, because what they're going to do is they're going to try and make it good. They're, they're going to take this, this genre that is pulp fiction, not the movie. <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's pulpy schlock made for um, Japanese teenagers. Um, who, well, you know what isekai is. The point is they're going to take the not okay out of the fucking not okay genre. And that's not okay. You, that, so it's just going to suck. 
This is gentrification, man. This is this is this is real fucking cultural appropriation. I'm telling you. With this is me. This is a direct attack on me. I gotta go. Just because I saw this, I'm gonna have to go. Look, I even like the character designs. Okay, I think the character designs look kind of cool. Um, I gotta go watch some obscure anime. I'm gonna. You know what I'm gonna do to 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 make sure that I can still have some sort of grip on my 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 ego, as in like my my psyche. Is I'm gonna go watch uh, Sumo Momo Momo Mo. Sumo Momo Momo Mo. I'm gonna watch that today. Maybe. Actually, you know what? Probably I'm not gonna watch that because I plan to watch two movies today. I plan to watch The Menu and Triangle of Sadness. Uh, so maybe I won't watch Sumo Momo 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 Mo. Um, I wonder what's the deal with. Because um, unless I'm mistaken, I think the amount of Mo's in. Let me count this. Sumo, mo, 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 mo. Mo. Yeah, mo, mo, mo. It's sumo, mo, 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 which is the same number of mo's as there are bows in bo, 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 bo. So that's interesting. I wonder if there's something going on there. Sumo, mo, 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 and bo, 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 bo. Uh, this is literally, if you don't know what anime is and you're listening to this segment, if you're part of the 50% non-weeb audience, you think I'm just having an absolute fucking stroke right now. <laughs> in fact, neither of those shows are actually super well known in the West. I mean, Boba 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 Bo aired on Adult Swim for a while, I think. Um, so it should be more well known. But even then, it seems like every other Adult Swim anime got successful except for Boba 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 Bo, which has like a small... Um, like, die-hard cult fan base, and then no one else cares about it. Uh, which includes me. I'm not gonna... Because uh, I've never seen it. I just... I'm aware of it. It's not really my thing. I say I've never seen it. I think I watched one episode. I didn't even necessarily... I don't think I even marked it as dropped, because I just watched one episode and was, like, not super jalling with the comedy in this show. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I'm gonna watch uh, The Menu now. That's right, we're watching two vaguely anti-capitalist uh, 2022 social commentary films back to fucking back about a bunch of rich people dying. Uh, weird that both of these films came out in the same year and have, like, the same tone. I haven't I mean, I've well, watched Triangle of Sadness in a minute, but I watched The Menu. Um, I thought it was a good film. I thought it was good. I thought it was a... I don't know. I don't know how much... It feels kind of weird to give a nuanced critique 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 of the film, given what its themes are. But... Um... The, the ultimate... I don't really... Un, I don't know. I feel like... There's, there's a... There's the sore element of the film, right? As in the movie series Saw, where it's like, oh, here's the serial killer guy who's going to kill people in ways that are brutal as sort of twisted vigilantism for their crimes, their sins, right? Like, that's what happens in Saw. That's also kind of what happens in this movie. It's like, here's all these people who have all done fucked up shit, and uh, here they all get punished by dying in this, like, particular way, with this particular context. Um... But then, there's the the thing that throws a spanner in the works of it being like a simple, you know, I don't even know what to call it, comedy thriller, dark comedy thriller type of thing, is the the presence of Margot, the, the girl, who doesn't, who's just sort of, I guess, a normal person, like, her role, I guess, is to ground the film, not just as an audience surrogate, but to be like, okay, but look, like, you may, like, you're also fucked up for doing this. Um, yeah, there's, the thing I'm a little lost about, I suppose, okay, so first of all, there's the the guy that goes with Margot, now, he's a fucked up person, because he brought Margot along knowing that she was going to die without telling her. That's the fucked up thing he did. But, aside from that, all he really is, is a fucking nerd. 
Like, he's just an annoying nerd. He's nowhere near as bad as the other people. Okay, well, to be fair, he d- it kind of is revealed that he's just killing people for no good reason halfway through the movie. <laughs> but, like, uh, yeah, that was a f- evil thing for him to do. Um, but that's not most of what the movie spends its time on. Or maybe it is. He's just a... I guess th- there's a critique of, like, obsession, right? But... I don't know. He's just he's just a massive foodie. I mean, he's annoying. Don't get me wrong. He's obnoxious. But like the movie focuses on how obnoxious he is. I guess this is a definitely a type of guy that exists. I'm kind of this type of guy. I'm definitely a little bit of this type of guy, like the the obnoxious nerd. But, you know, I'm not so obnoxious that I'd bring an innocent woman to her death just for my otaku hobbies. I'm not that obnoxious. <laughs> uh, I'd hope. Uh, and I also definitely... Well, I don't know why I'm trying to get defensive about this. The point <laughs> I'm trying to make is... Look, I don't understand... There's parts of this movie that I don't understand, I think, in terms of its critique or in terms of its commentary, its social commentary. And that part is really the whole Margot part because the thing that that threw me is literally right at the end, the final shot of the movie, she takes a bite of this burger and then the music, there's a very menacing musical cue which you would which according to the language of cinema is supposed to tell me that something she's doing something sinister but at no point in the movie does it seem like she done anything sinister I'm also confused about the shortwave radio thing. I guess it makes sense if he, if the guy from the Coast Guard is just in on it and he's, he's actually a guy from the Coast Guard. Like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. Uh, hmm. I was a bit confused about the, um, so there's a part in the movie where, the, the it's by the way this is very spoilers so you should go watch it i definitely give it a strong recommendation uh there's a part in the movie where the chef guy is like look you didn't like think about this why didn't you, like you didn't really try very hard to escape you guys you know and that's true and by the end of the film they're literally just sitting there letting themselves die they've just sort of given up like, they try to escape initially, and then they sort of give up way too quickly. Uh, and, so, I don't know. He points that out. Like, look, you, you probably could have escaped if you tried harder. And that I don't really understand that. I don't really understand why they didn't try harder. I suppose my, like, what makes sense would be, like, they're all super privileged people who would just think, like, oh, well, this could never happen to me. But it very clearly is happening to them. And like, and they seem to understand this fact. Like, they're not like... None of them are sitting there like, oh, well, I'm sure rescue will arrive shortly. You know, none of them are sitting... They're all pretty much aware that they're going to die unless they do something about it. And yet no one except Margot seems to really care. Um, I mean, they care, but they don't care enough. And I, and that's clearly intentional because they they mention it in the script. I just don't understand it. I'm missing that. I'm clearly I'm I'm missing something. This is too deep for me. I'm I'm clearly missing something. Like I, I you could go like too deep into it and be like, ah yes, the, the death drive or whatever. The 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 the, the thirst for annihilation <laughs> or something like that. I, I don't think the movie's about that. Maybe. Maybe it is. Maybe it is, but Or maybe the point is that they act... I don't know. I don't really... I don't, I, that bit is lost on me. That bit's lost on me. And the the bit about the burger, which is a, a an important part of the film, it's, it's, it seems either very... Like, look, I don't know. I'm not going to complain, okay? I like the movie. I'm, I'm just, I'm just a little, um... I need to, I need time to think it over and mull it over, I think is what I'm really getting at here. But 
not going to do that because I'm going to jump right into trying. Actually, you know what? Maybe I'll get myself a snack first and then jump into Triangle of Sadness. Here's what I want you to do. Okay, we're on some Project Mayhem shit. I'm giving you tasks now. I want you to use whatever social media platform you like. It could be YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, whatever you want. And I want you to post something completely mundane. Here's what it has to be. It has to be mundane. It has to be true. And it has to be not jazzed up in any way to encourage clicks. It just has to be some random thing. So, for example, I just tweeted, been getting into eating potatoes recently. That is true. That is what I've been getting into. I bought a big bag of potatoes. I've been getting into eating them. They're very nice. I like potatoes. Do that. This is what I'm going to call this project anti-viral. Project anti-viral. The idea, we create posts with no chance of gaining any virality, traction, or ground. You just have to do one. I'm not asking more of that. But do it, see how it feels. You might you might like how it feels. You might want to do it more often. I want more shit on the internet that isn't in any way related to clout. That has no chance of catching on becoming viral, or in any sense gaining any traction. Something that is mundane. I want more unflattering mundanity on the internet, and I want it now. So, go to your social media of choice. If you don't have social media, then... um, Try, try and have a mundane conversation with someone. Uh, or, or don't. That If you don't have social media, you've already won the game. So, uh, you know, I, nothing I can do can help you because you've already won. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, I call this project antiviral. Um, you, only, you only have to do it once. I'm not asking you to do anything crazy. But imagine... Imagine how it would feel to post something on social media without having to think about, hmm, how can I phrase this so that people will care? I don't want anyone to care. No one should care. We need an internet full of shit that... Because the, the, the point of this exercise, if you haven't already gathered, is that the internet is full of a bunch of people doing shit that no one fucking cares about no one cares you don't care about my opinions about movies but yet i'm here posting it on the internet um you know i don't care about uh let me just go on twitter right now this guy complaining about youtube shorts there's the first tweet that just was in front of my just on my feed i don't care about that guy's opinions about youtube shorts why should why should i give a shit i I don't fucking know who this is i don't care i don't want to hear it this is all anyone ever does. I don't I don't care. You know what? I don't care if if Mr. Beast puts one person of every age in some sort of challenge scenario um and the last one left wins a, a million dollars or whatever. I don't care who wins. I don't care. You know, this is this is the fundamental thing. Is that the internet is full of people doing shit and saying shit and having these opinions and doing these things that that no one has any right to care about. But they're all desperate to make you care. Everyone, including me, you know, I'm, I've, I've made some catchy titles and thumbnails in my time. <clears throat> Everyone is desperate that, like, ah, yes, I must give people a reason to care about me. I am worthy of your attention. I'm trying to do something that's not that, right? We want to do something that is on the internet, that is not pretend... It, it's as worthless as any other piece of content... But this one is not trying to jazz itself up and demand to be paid attention to. <clears throat> Project antiviral. Commence. Go do it. Minions. My minions, I command you. Commence Project antiviral.
Look, I, after okay, I, I just watched Triangle of Sadness. So I'll talk about that in a second. After thinking more about the menu, I feel like I understand the stuff at least partially that I didn't understand before. Like I was thinking about it, and the reason is because I was try I was trying to, like I was looking at this film, and I was thinking about it. I was like, everything has to have a deeper meaning rather than just the obvious thing. But if you think about it. It makes way more sense if it's just what it seems to be, rather than some sort of, like, like, I don't think the movie is taking it, like, I think that's part of the whole meta of the movie, right? Because obviously there's clear parallels between film director and head chef, right? Um, in terms of pretentiousness, in terms of cults of personality, in terms of running a tight ship to create some art that in the end doesn't really matter, but has this whole cult, like, there's obvious parallels, and so I think the point of the I I like the point of the cheeseburger scene in the movie is that the girl obviously she's seen that he used to be a fry cook when he first started cooking but more than that it's about it's about making the most unpretentious food possible like not so, she even like is like not some deconstructed avant whatever bullshit burger just a fucking good ass cheeseburger uh like the the least pretentious food you can make and then he's like oh fuck yeah i can make you a cheeseburger it'll be the best fucking cheeseburger you've ever had and then he's like smiling when he's cooking partially because it's bringing him back to the days when he was a fry cook or but also because that's the real thing that he likes cooking for you know he even says like he he's lost the passion it's not fun for him but he's really lost the passion because he's in search of this mythical ideal of of perfection and this, like, menu and all of this high, fine dining stuff, when really what he fell in love with cooking for was just being able to make someone a really good meal and have them sit down and eat it and enjoy it, and that's something to feel proud of. And he's and he does it, and she does, and it's great. And I think the meta commentary of that is that's just what the movie is, right? That the, the movie is a cheeseburger in the best possible way. Like... Yeah, it's a commentary on class, but it's not super pretentious about it, right? Like, it is also supposed to be an end... Like, it's not supposed to have some sort of... It, 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 what does she call it? it? It's not supposed to be some high-minded concept shit, right? It just is what it is. It's an entertaining comedy horror thriller movie thing, and it's fun to watch. And it, what you see means what you see. And it's not sp- you're not something you're supposed to sit there, I mean, you can, but you'd be missing the point by sitting there and deconstructing it, because the whole point is to say, more cheeseburgers, please, in this world, less bread plates without bread. So I think that's, I I like, yeah, after thinking about it for a bit, that's, that's the conclusion I've come to, is that actually that's the whole essence of the movie, is what it's trying to say. It's like meta, but it's also self, what's it called, self-enclosed, what's What's the fucking word I'm looking for? Whatever. Okay, so Triangle of Sadness. I, I'm i going to get relatively heady with this one. I think this is a strange movie. It won the Palm Door, which is like the notable thing about this film. I'm going to give you my boring opinions, which I don't know why I do this. This is a media criticism and review show. This is a media criticism and review show. Okay, my boring opinions. I liked the communist captain guy a lot. And the fact that he's barely in the fucking movie is a damn shame. Because he is the best character in the movie. That shit is fucking hilarious. That The whole chemistry between him and the Russian guy who sells shit is the peak of the movie and it's not like particularly subtle you know satire political satire it is the exact opposite it is two very drunk men who both barely even know what their ideology is quoting the most like basic quotes that every single person knows from both sides of each other just shouting in a ship that is sinking and no one cares. 
Like that's and it's great. It's like I I was worried after seeing the trailer that it's like oh it's gonna be like some fucking uh, attempt to do. Well, I don't know. I wasn't necessarily worried, but I I was just wondering if they were gonna try and do some sort of debate with this, where they would try and like both sides the issue and have both characters be like really well read and really eloquent and expressing their like no, they're both they're both just like normal people. Who happened to like be in, you know? I don't know. I liked that. It was a great chemistry. It was great. It was very funny. It reminded me of real life debates between like communists and capitalists that I had met on the internet who were like friends and like debate in a funny way. It was fun. That was the best part of the movie. Um, there's a particular, there's one shot of a lady on the toilet who is simultaneously vomiting and diarrhea shitting and that is just a beautiful shot like i don't know how they even did that but it looks so realistic like <laughs> it looks exactly like someone vomiting and di like i don't know cuz they can't just make someone diarrhea shit on command and vomit on command like i don't know how they did it but Hats off to the VFX team or or whatever because the, that shit looks great. I mean, I don't know if it's like great, but it, it it looks very believable, believably gross. Um, so I'm not the first person to say this about the movie, uh, which is the part where they're on the island is not as good as the part where they're on the boat. The part where they're on the boat is the best part of the movie. That's pretty much everyone's opinion. In fact, the trailers did a really good job hiding the fact that they end up on an island, uh, which I think it's a bit strange. Because really, like, if I were to explain the plot of this movie, trailers aside, it would be, I would say, like, people on a luxury cruise end up uh, shipwrecked on an island and have to survive. So that's, like, the main conflict of the movie it's a very um classical man versus nature type of thing although that's not really it because they don't have that much trouble surviving on the island um i feel like if i had to say what i actually think is the movie like amazing like it's good but i'm kind of surprised it won that that's the palm door like I, I I liked it, but I didn't I think it was the best thing I'd ever seen, you know? Um, some stuff is, well, look, I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that's a little on the nose, a little, uh, you know, the idea being, we're going full spoilers here, once they shipwreck and end up on the island, all of the social roles are reversed from what they typically are, right? Like, rather than having a a, a sort of world dominated by the... or a society dominated by the, the, the rich patriarchs, you know, the, the people with the generally... I mean, it's... I'm, I'm saying this because this is how the movie presents it. It's very on the nose. Like... On the boat, it's all the old white rich men who have all the power. And some of the old white rich women. And then you get onto the island and suddenly the Latino poor woman has all the power. And all the other people are subservient to her because she knows how to fish and she knows how to make fire. Um, and so then you get, rather than, you know, tr- the the old Russian guy, he has like a sort of trophy wife looking person and and all of this shit instead of that it's, you get you know the main uh model male model guy becomes like the trophy fuck toy of the um the latino woman uh so it's like a very obvious role reversal And, uh, you, you know, even the, uh, the cap, the guy who's characterized as the Russian capitalist literally, like, says to each, 
from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. He literally says that in the movie He when, when he's on the island. But suddenly, when you're in the lower class, you become a communist. And suddenly, when you're in the higher class, you start wanting to accumulate wealth and ownership and power and become a capitalist. Like, that's that's the point of the movie, is that, like, hey, depending on random circumstance, suddenly your ideology changes. Like, all of this stuff, like, uh, you know, patriarchy, men being in charge, is arbitrary. Because in this scenario, where this particular woman has the, the particular tools necessary and men aren't super useful uh, or powerful, suddenly the power dynamic shifts, or, you know, and so on. Like, the idea being to, to just sort of point that out and be like, isn't that interesting? And I'm kind of sitting here thinking, I mean, yeah, I guess it's, I guess it's kind of interesting. But honestly, I, to, to, I'm doing the movie a disservice by, by dumbing it down to that level, because it's, 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 it's smarter than that. Like, it's also about, like, camaraderie and, like... All the, the, you know what actually is the best scene in the movie? Or maybe one of the best scenes is when they're on the island and all the guys have this whistle and they're blowing the whistle to tease the male model guy. Um, and then they're like, he's like fighting them over it and they're all laughing. Something about the way that scene is like acted and shot and like what happens, it just felt so real as like genuine banter that I started laughing along like 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 a group of friends like something about that just felt so real the the way it happens I don't know um so then you get to the ending which is obviously you know a bit of a a shock ending I suppose although it's it's left ambiguous which honestly annoys me I don't think they needed to leave the ending ambiguous. I think they could have just showed the bad thing happening. I mean, look, I like the actual line that ends it. Um, so if you haven't watched the movie and don't plan to, I will now spoil the ending, which is uh, it turns out that the island that they're shipwrecked on is actually a luxury resort the whole time, uh, which is I've seen. There was some fucking cartoon that did this this gag. What cartoon was that? I don't know. This is this is like a really old gag, right? <laughs> this is like a classic gag. Shipwrecked on an island, think that trap turns out, oh, it's actually a luxury resort if you just walk like a few miles away or something. Uh, so that's the twist, the, the, the sort of twist at the end. But the people who discover this are the Latino girl and the model girl. Now, the problem being, if they get rescued, of course, the Latino lady or Latina, I guess would be the correct... I, listen, I don't know much about this, okay? I, I don't remember her, any of... I'm very bad with names. As, as you can tell, I don't remember any of the characters' names. I'm bad with names in general. So I'm just saying by their most, like, obvious characteristic. I, I don't know why. The Latina lady is, a. Uh, you know, if she... If they get rescued, she goes... She's a toilet cleaner. She goes back to, like, the bottom of the social pecking order. Now, the, the thing is, in reality, right, like, right now, she's the one that has to cook and fish all the fucking time, right? She may, she may get to fuck this boy toy and have power, but she also has to do all the work because she's the only one who knows how to, or at least the majority of the work. You know, mo she's there with a bunch of rich fucks who would one million percent give her a bunch of money. Like, the rich Russian guy literally offers her money on the island. Like, she could easily get, like, three mil off of them, which is enough. I mean, I think that's probably enough to say. Like, three mil to these people is not even that much. Uh, to, to just as, you know, I feel like, I mean, it's a risk. Yeah, you're, you're hoping that they would throw money that your way. But, like, I feel like it would happen. Like, that just, I, I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but that, that feels like the sort of, like, like, what would happen. And then she wouldn't have to work, or at the very least, you know, she could be set up pretty nice if she just went back to the normal world. She wouldn't be lower class anymore, right? She may not get to keep the, 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 
the the sexy male model guy, but she could probably find another one with that much money. You know, you invest that smartly, you got a comfortable fortune, you never have to work a day in your life again. That's fine. It's not that much money, but it's enough to be like comfortably middle class for the rest of your life. At least, if not more, right? So that to me seems like the smart option, but obviously that's trusting that uh, this Russian guy will actually give you money, which is probably too much trust. So it makes sense that she would think that was too risky. So the actual option for her is that the the female model lady is like, hey, if we get off, you can come, you know, you can come work for me. Um, or she can kill the female model guy lady so that no one ever finds out they're in a luxury resort so that she gets to stay in control. Um, and that's the thing, is that if she ended up working for this lady she would be set up for life. She'd have a a nice job, she would make plenty of money, but she would once again be subservient to these rich people. Whereas on the island, she's in power. And it's really about power more than it's about money. Now, I wish they had just actually shown her killing her, or not, rather than leaving it ambiguous, because that's kind of annoying. I guess the idea being they're fucked either way, but the fact is... You're way less fucked just taking the realistic option of, like, a job in this fashion industry as a... I know it's, it sucks, but the other option is you're the king of this little tiny group on an island for how long? Someone's eventually... Already, someone from the resort came around and um, offered the lady who had a stroke, like, fake Rolexes or whatever, right? So it's like, it's not even... You couldn't keep the secret forever. Even if you killed this lady, you're gonna keep. You're not gonna keep the secret forever. Everyone else is gonna find out eventually, and it's not. It probably won't even be that long because it was. I mean, it clearly the resort is not that far away geographically from where they crashed. So it's pointless to try and keep your power on this island. You're gonna get rescued either way. So what's the point? I don't understand. It seems poorly thought through. If you kill this person, then what do you get from it? You get you get to remain in charge for... I don't know. This ambiguous... I like, the idea is both options are shit. Both options suck. But one... I mean, they also kind of both end up in the same place, which is you're back to your normal life. You can't stay on the island forever. What, is she just going to keep killing people who find out? I don't know, it doesn't make sense. And this isn't me, like, overthinking or finding plot holes. This is just how I was... Like, this is the... The movie is asking you to analyse it. It's not like... You know, the, the, I'm saying that I'm thinking about the movie. I shouldn't be punished for thinking about the movie. I don't think that's a plot hole. I think that's on purpose. Um, but then the actual ending of the movie is just the model guy, like, running through the jungle... Which was very confusing to me. I mean, it looked cool aesthetically, but I didn't really understand what it was trying to communicate. Um, which is maybe just me missing something. Uh, but I guess if he's running through the jungle, assumedly towards them, because he he's thought to himself that she's going to kill her, because it would solve her problem as well, where she can keep fucking him without it making her jealous. So he he might be doing that, running towards them, and then finding them, no matter how, you know, if even if she, she she's going to kill both of them, look, even if you have a big rock, this male model guy is like a big muscly guy. I'm sorry, little tiny Latina cleaning lady, you're not going to be able to overpower him. Especially, yeah, it's just not, I don't know. You're not going to be able to kill him too. So he's going to find out because they're right in front of the resort. So it's pointless either way. I, maybe she. the idea is she would rather basically die than continue serving these rich assholes, which is fair enough, fucking absolutely fair enough, if that's her point. Um, but just a little bit of a confusing ending, just a little bit of a weird, ambiguous ending, which I'm kind of done with. I'm kind of bored of ambiguous endings, weird, ambiguous endings. I want... You can have some ambiguity, but I want some closure, you know, in a movie. 
uh, which is just a matter of personal taste. Um, yeah, definitely a strange, bit of a strange film. A little bit odd, but fun. It was a fun movie. Let me say, I know pointing out that the situation is bad for the Latina lady, either way, is the point. I think the reason the ending is ambiguous is specifically because the point is she's fucked either way. It's kind of supposed to be a tragic tale for her. That's my. That's what I'm thinking now. That maybe it's supposed to be kind of a tragic tale for her. Maybe. That, like, she she knows that killing this person isn't actually going to solve her problems long term. But she's just so mad at the idea of having to serve them again that she's just doing it anyway. That makes more sense to me as, like, some sort of tragic thing. Yeah, that's, I'm going to go with that interpretation. <laughs> okay, so my actual take about the movie, and this will be the last thing I say about it. It's kind of a schizo take. I think the movie is a metaphor for revolution. Obviously, there's a lot of commentary about, like, the fall of the Soviet Union, and then the American communist, and then, you know, the death of all of these rich people who represent old power in a, a literal, you know, shipwreck, explosive death caused by pirates, um, you know, generally how revolutions go, right, which is just that, like, some shit goes wrong already that weakens the power structure, in this case, you know, this storm making everyone seasick and making the boat go haywire, and then a group of people who, who, like, take advantage of it, which in this case is the pirates, to end up on the island, right, that's the revolution, and then in the end, you end up with this this power structure that is completely inverted and different from what it was before. And in fact, you know, that scene where, like, for example, the scene where they kill the donkey, and which is obviously a bit of a fucked up scene, but then afterwards they're sort of celebrating in that cave, or the scene where they're bantering uh, with the, the whistle, or the scene where... Um, the the pirate guy is talking with the lady who had a stroke um you know they're having much more fun than you ever see them having on the boat like they're living much more fulfilled lives on this island even though they're still subsumed by a new power structure they're they're actually living more fulfilled lives on this island so it's this i think it's a strange commentary on revolution uh i'm not sure what it means uh but, you know, and then in the end it's discovered that the old power structure that sustained them in the past hasn't really gone away and it's still surrounding them even after the revolution. That's what I think the movie's actually getting at. That's my idea for the, the grand metaphor of the film. Remember when I was getting into TF2 first and making these podcasts and I was talking a whole bunch about Demonite and how weak Demonite is, mainly because I'm bad and complaining that the game was unbalanced? I think I have the perfect way to bal- to to give Demonite the slight buff to make it so that he's still worse than stock, but actually like a more fun as a side grade, and it's literally just to it's it's just a specific buff to the Tide Turner th- that um like the 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 main problem with the tide like the tide turn is already nerfed because it doesn't give you any damage resistances so like i don't know why they added a second nerf to the tide turner but the tide turner sucks to use because if you take any damage while charging it instantly cancels your charge or drains your charge meter instantly um that's fucking retarded <laughs> it should be not happening it shouldn't happen or it can just be lowered. The thresh, the damage threshold can be raised, rather. So that it's like, okay, if one, if there's a heavy on the other side of the map and one of his bullets connects with you, you don't instantly lose all your charge. Like, maybe, maybe it's a little bit of a, maybe it's just a little bit stronger. Like, that's, that 
slight balance tweak would just make Demo Knight so much more fun to play. I need to get back into playing Demo Knight. I don't know why I stopped. Well, I know why I stopped. I got it. I got into playing Demo Knight because of the the advanced movement options, and then started playing Sticky Jumper Demo, and got addicted to the freedom of movement offered by like. Because the worst part about playing Demo Knight is waiting for your charge to refill. Like, the, you, then you, you're just a, a stock... Like, during that period, you're just stock demo without stickies. And it's basically useless. Um, like, there's a lot of waiting around for your charge to refill. And then also the odd thing that you, you have no vertical movement options in maps that don't have, like, slopes. Um, whereas... With a sticky jumper, you don't have to wait for your charge to refill, right? You could just shoot a sticky at your feet at any time and teleport across the map, basically. So I got addicted to that. And so now when I switch back to Demo Knight, it feels limiting. But also, I'm often in a situation playing sticky jumper demo where I run out of ammo in my iron bomber and I'm like, damn, I wish I had like another viable option to do damage right now because... This guy's probably, like, super low health, but there's nothing I can do because I have no way to close the distance on him with my melee. Um, and I, sometimes I try and sticky jump towards them, but it takes so long to take the sticky jumper out and then wait until it's ready to fire a thing and then fire it at your feet and then jump. You know, it t- it's it, and you also are going to take for Yeah. So I need to try getting back into demo night and because that was a good time, man. I don't want to go outside. I have like a little bit of shopping to do, but it's it's such a small amount that I can like put it off in my mind and be like, it's not that important, but it will it will just be frustrating for me in the future when I'm like, damn, I should have done that yesterday. But I didn't when I actually run out of everything that I need. It was not everything. It's just like two or three items. And it's annoying to be like, I have to go to the show. I, I should just fucking do it. I should just fucking do it. It's crazy how expensive fast food is. And how, for some reason, Americans seem to think it's cheap. I don't, it's not just Americans. It's everyone. I, I don't understand it. There's nothing, like, cheaper about fast food than any other food except for home cooking food, which is way cheaper. Like, I'm watching the newest Ryan Trahan video, and he goes to McDonald's, as he does normally. Now, to be fair, it's a little bit unfair to say this, because he's, you know, not in a place where he can cook in this video. So, McDonald's probably is a very cheap option for him. Um, Probably not what I would have done in his situation. I would probably have... uh. This is what I would do, okay? It would be very unhealthy. I'm more willing to risk my health. Is I, I would probably have gone to the shop, bought the cheapest, biggest white bread and peanut butter I could find, and then just had that for breakfast every day. Because, like, you just get a big loaf of pre-sliced white bread and peanut butter. Just have two slices of that for breakfast every day. It'll fill you up. And it's probably, like, super cheap. But, like, okay, so he gets this breakfast, and what? It's, like, an egg egg sandwich with a croissant, and uh, I don't know. Listen, if you're spending fucking 5 euros 95 cents on breakfast and thinking that's cheap, you are an insane person, my friend. Your breakfast should not cost more than, like, one pound max. <laughs> I don't, like, the breakfast is... Normally, for me, two slices of toast and two eggs. That's it. That's that's a good breakfast. That is so... You can get a pack of, like, 12 eggs for, like, just over two pounds. So, two eggs. I'm not even going to try and do that maths. And then, again, a big loaf of bread. 90p. Like, one slice, two slices of that. It's ridiculously cheap. If your breakfast... If your breakfast costs five pounds you are an insane person that is just an insane amount of money to be wasting for no reason on cheap food this is food that is cheap like maybe if you're having a really heavy breakfast with 
I mean, look, other options. Other options include porridge. Porridge in the winter, good and very cheap.、Uh, now, bacon, common breakfast item, not super cheap. Also, not super necessary for breakfast. Tasty as a treat, but not super necessary as a breakfast item, in my opinion. I love bacon, don't get me wrong. I fucking absolutely love bacon. But for the reasons of its price and nutritional content, I generally don't have it every day for breakfast. I have it as a rare treat for breakfast. Okay. And then motherfuckers be having avocado in California. You guys are insane over there. Like, what are you guys eating? I don't even want to know what's going on in Cali. You guys are fucking nuts.、Um, but yeah, that's what I'm talking about, motherfucker. I'm sleepy, if you're wondering why I'm talking weird. I feel weird. I'm talking weird because I feel weird. I'm talking about cheap ass breakfasts. You know what I ate today? I ate a pizza, which was a bad idea, probably, because I've eaten too much pizza recently.、Um, but that was my last pizza that I had in the freezer, so I probably won't eat another one for like a good while.、Uh, re- okay, let me tell you the most boring, here we go, boring details about my life. This is, we're being super entertaining now. This is real content. This is, this is antiviral, motherfucker.、Um, Okay, so I, when I was shopping, they had a deal where you could get three pizzas for, for, for cheaper. Like, if you bought three, it was cheaper. So I bought three pizzas, frozen pizzas of the fancier kind of food. I, originally, when I was shopping, I was like, oh, it's been a long time since I've bought the slightly fancier frozen pizzas. I'm excited. I want to get one of those. And when I say slightly fancier, they are literally, I'm not exaggerating. 2000 calories, like one pizza, which is insane because they're like, they have this like giant crust filled with sauce and they're covered in pepperoni. They're honestly not my favorite kind of pizza to eat on a general basis, but、um, they're nice as a treat. So I wanted to just buy one. Which would be the first time I've had one of these 2000 calorie pizzas in like two months, three months. Because again, I don't eat them very often. But then the deal for getting three was actually pretty good. So I decided to get three, which was probably a bad idea because now I've eaten three of these very calorific pizzas in the space of like two weeks.、Um, so that was not a good idea. Maybe less than two weeks, actually. Maybe like. Oh, yeah, it's not good. I don't have very much self control. <clears throat> But I didn't eat all of the pizza this time because I was putting it in the oven and、uh, I was playing TF2. And then I got distracted playing TF2 and it got slightly burned around the edges. Like the crust area got burned. So I actually ended up leaving almost all of the crusts, which is actually the main bulk of the pizza. Like, they're really thick crusts. So, I actually have no idea how many calories I ate. I imagine most of the calories are actually coming from the fat in the cheese and the pepperoni. So, I probably still wasn't good for me. <laughs> But I did end up leaving a bunch of crust. I've eaten a lot of carbs today and nothing else. Then, my next meal. So, so I think, you know what? I can actually check. So, one of those pizzas. Oh, wait, maybe I can check my order history. Is there some way to do that? Let me see if I can find this because it was on this website that I ordered it from.、Uh, my orders, is this it? I can probably check exactly how much I paid for these pizzas. I know some people think I live like this lavish lifestyle. Like, no, motherfucker.、Uh, yeah, this will be it. Yeah, I know. I just I spend money on anime posters, and that's it. That's the only luxury I buy. Like, maybe once a month these days, I'll get takeout as like a luxury. Okay, maybe it's a little more frequent than that. that I'll, but, like, food is my main expense by a long shot. Okay, let me see. Okay, pizza. Okay, so these pizzas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a crazy deal. It was a crazy deal. So, this pizza. Was 
four pound fifty per pizza, but reduced by the deal to three pounds thirty four each. So,、um, in the end, buying three of them, I actually saved a bunch of money. I saved what five, six, seven, eight, nine. I saved about four quid,、um, roughly, which is pretty good. Pretty good going. So four pound fifty. Still, the way I was justifying this to myself is you can buy one pound frozen pizzas. They're not very good, but you can buy them. They exist. You can pretty much buy frozen pizzas all across the spectrum, from about one pound on the shittiest. Actually, you can get these tiny ones that aren't enough to like be a full meal, but they're like snack pizzas, and they're like fifty p. So you can get the fifty p snack pizzas. I bought them once. It's really not worth buying because it's so shit and so small. Then you can get the one pound frozen pizza, which is still pretty small、um, and tastes like shit, but it's one pound, so it's kind of justified. Then you can move up a little bit into the sort of two to three pound range.、Um, uh, those are just like the 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 those. This is what I consider to be the standard frozen pizza, about two pound fifty to three pound kind of area. This is what I consider to be the standard. It's like cheap but still pizza functions as pizza. And then anything above that, I consider anything above like four pounds. I'm considering to be a fancy frozen pizza because that's at that point, like if you're paying more than like three pound fifty for for a frozen pizza, this is a fancy frozen pizza. So then there are like these these that's where these ones come in. But then there are even ones that are like six pounds that I found, and those ones aren't frozen; they're just in the fridge. And while they're very clearly of higher quality,、um, I've noticed that it's really hard to cook them properly in my oven. I need to do actually more experimentation with this. Like oftentimes, in order to get the bottom to crisp up nicely, it actually ends up burning very slightly on the outside. So I think what I need to do is actually cook it at a lower temperature. Maybe、um, I don't buy these very often, so I haven't like experimented with it very much. But even that, compared to ordering a pizza for delivery, which to be honest is better, but not like that much better by like that much. That's like twelve pounds once you factor in delivery costs and shit, or even more maybe. So, you know, it's still a really good deal to be paying like five pounds for a pizza, even though, again, this is a rarity for me. I normally don't get this. It was just, it was just kind of a a thing. So anyway, that was that. And then my other meal that I had today was just mashed potatoes. Um. <clears throat> So that was three potatoes. Let me look. I can probably、uh, actually. So how much did I pay for this bag of potatoes? I paid two pounds nineteen pence for this one point six kilo bag of British white potatoes.、Uh, I don't know how much that、um, makes each potato worth, but I mean we're talking significantly less than a pound. Like I that meal, what? So three potatoes, that's probably about a quarter of the bag, maybe less. So yeah, significantly less than a pound, plus some butter. And I didn't even use milk because Adam Ragusa showed me this trick where you use the、um, the potato water that the water that you boil the potato in, you use that instead of milk. It makes it more potato flavored. But for me, it also Saves money because you don't have to buy milk. I actually recommend this technique. So, so other than the butter, the other thing I put in it was some green onions.、Uh, I put three green onions or spring onions.、Um, which cost?、Uh, okay, I paid ninety p for the whole bunch of spring onions. So. That was probably about six, maybe more, spring onions. So we're talking probably about twenty p, I would guess, worth of spring onions. So this meal probably comes out to like just over a pound. Oh, I also and then I put the, so it's it was mashed potatoes with spring onions, and then there's a bunch of seasoning, 
because fucking you got to season your mashed potatoes, right? L- let me tell you. We got salt, pepper, MSG, garlic powder, shitloads of garlic powder, and then a good handful of frozen peas, which I'm not going to work out how much a handful of frozen peas costs, but frozen peas are fucking cheap, okay? I'm pretty sure the whole pack was one pound. So, yeah. And that, while it may not be a very protein-rich meal, was a very filling meal. Like, that was a big meal. It's just that. That's all I had. I didn't have, like, a protein with it. I could have, but last time I did that was too much food. If I'm going to do a protein with it, you'd probably use one one fewer potato. Um, so, yeah, it was just mash with with peas in it and stuff. And peas have protein in them. So I'm counting it as, like, relatively nutritional. Um, even though it's mostly carbs, it's fine. Also, pro tip, keep the skins on your potatoes. I know some people are weirdly squeamish about this. If you wash them, they're getting boiled anyway, it's fine. Honestly, even if they have a bit of dirt on them, who fucking cares? Like, a, a tiny bit of dirt that's been boiled is not going to hurt anyone. If if I've ever eaten potato skins with a tiny bit of dirt on them, I've never noticed, is what I'm saying. Even though I, I do wash them, but yeah. Keep the potato skins on. They're high in fiber and full of nutrients and tasty. And they add some heterogeneity to what would otherwise be boring mash with no texture to it. And then, so yeah, that was my meal. And then I also just randomly in my fridge had like a couple of slices of ham left that were going to go off in like two days. So I just threw, I just tore up those slices of ham and threw them in. Honestly, they didn't even really taste of much because they were very thin slices of ham. But uh, yeah, that that packet of ham was big and only cost one pound because uh, it's like low quality ham that I normally just like use for sandwiches and stuff. Uh, so yeah, that but that probably cost like less than ten p. So we're talking. I mean, yeah, this meal probably cost about one pound twenty if I'm calculating everything. It might be even less than that, I'm not sure, but yeah, probably about £1.20, if I'm trying to guess, so that's how much food should be costing you, is what I'm saying, and that was a fucking good, now listen, this isn't, I know some people are going to be sitting here, ready to type their comment about uh, British cuisine, try it, okay, I'm telling you, before you come shitting on me, make this yourself, and tell me it doesn't taste good, make it yourself, and tell me that, I mean, Listen, I use a lot of butter in my mashed potatoes, okay? I'm 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 not skimping on the butter. This is a meal, mashed potato I mean removing some of the more fancier elements. Mashed potato with spring onions is a meal that has sustained people in the British Isles for centuries. And also, potatoes and butter is 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 basically nutritionally complete. Like, you, that has every possible nutrient you could possibly need in it. So, don't come talking to me. It, it hits everything. It hits the three, the three food triangle notes, right? If you haven't heard this by now, the food triangle is uh, the three points. Cheap, tasty, or healthy. For a food to be worth it, it has to hit at least two points on the food triangle. And mashed potatoes with stuff in it is all three points. It's a rare superfood. Okay, maybe killing it healthy is a bit of an overstatement. But the peas, I think, it has, I don't know, maybe calling it healthy is too much. But it's not, I wouldn't call it maybe super unhealthy. Mid, of middling healthiness. But it's super cheap and it's super fucking tasty. I'm telling you. Don't underrate frozen peas. They're a good way to add color, texture, and healthiness to meals that would otherwise be bland. I'm super frozen peas pilled these days. So yeah, I don't want to hear anyone telling me that I have like, that I'm spending too much on food. Because that is like a normal ass meal for me. The only thing that's annoying about it is that it kind of takes a long time to make. But not actually a long time. It's just that it takes, like, active effort to mash up your potatoes and stuff. Um, yeah. That's how... This is this is, what I'm, that's what I'm talking about, okay? 
people are going if you're going for fast food you're literally paying like five times more than i think food is worth for a smaller portion for a smaller portion it's insane and it doesn't even taste good that's the real thing so the only thing you're getting out of it is convenience and the thing is nothing can be more convenient than not even having to to leave your house to go get food like if you're getting fast food delivered then yeah you're paying for the convenience and i do that sometimes but if you're american and you're like i'm gonna get in my car and drive to the mcdonald's that's so convenient like no what are you talking about that's not convenient you're stupid just cook for yourself potatoes are cheap or it, just make normal food. <laughs> I don't understand any of this stuff. I don't understand the perspective that fast food is cheap. Okay? That, like, fast food is associated with poor people because it's cheap and convenient and people can't cook. I'm sorry. I've been to a shitload of poor people's houses. They always be cooking. I don't know what's going on in America, but every time I've gone to my broke-ass family friends' house, they they make some good ass fucking shit. You know? Like like you go go over to my Indian friends' house or my Pakistani friends' houses or and you know, they always got some crazy fucking home cooked food with with rice and or naan and uh, chickpeas or whatever. Like it's always dope. African friends' houses Nigerian motherfucker, I'm getting the jollof rice, it's fucking amazing, if you've never had jollof rice in your life, you gotta get some, and that shit is super easy and cheap to make, so this idea, oh, I, like, I, I don't understand it, I see a bunch of people, like, fucking sympathizers, who are like, oh, well, these poor people, they work so hard, they can't, they, they, they don't have the energy to cook when they get home, what do you mean they don't have the energy to cook, cooking, we're talking literally, put, some water and boil it that's about the amount of effort you have to do you can watch tv at the same time it's not like i don't know man i don't think i i think it's just some middle class people excusing themselves where they i don't know man it's fucking weird i don't understand this dynamic at all because it doesn't exist here or it does exist if but maybe i just haven't experienced it i don't know it's 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 never the parents is what i'm saying is is always been the 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 kids who are are doing this shit, and they're not the ones that are managing the money, so their financial habits doesn't really matter, and they're also kids, so they're stupid. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something here. I feel like I'm going on a rant about like how to spend your money properly. All I'm saying is food food is is actually crazy cheap. That's the point I'm trying to make. Food is crazy cheap. What's expensive really is meat. Like, if you start cooking with eggs and dairy and vegetables and and beans, like, like that, that shit doesn't cost any money. They basically give that shit away. You know how crazy cheap vegetables are? Like, you can buy an onion for, like, 20p. Less, even. 10p sometimes like you can buy an onion <laughs> for super cheap you know if you just get like like a few vegetables you could make like a really good vegetable soup for like less than a pound i haven't done that yet i keep planning to do it and not doing it because it's summer right now it's not really vegetable soup time maybe i should do it but like you just buy some veg you know what that's what i'm gonna do next time i go to the shops i'm gonna pay attention to the money i'm spending I'm going to try and spend, let's say, less than... I'll challenge myself. I'll go less than a pound, and I'll buy a bunch of vegetables. You know what? Let's go less than one pound. Let's go less than... Hmm. Less than two pounds. Only reason I'm doing this is because my local shop is a fucking rip-off. They're bastards. They charge... They charge twice the amount for a can of beans than it's worth. And I know this because I can go to the shop that is just down the road... And find the same can of beans for half the price. The same brand and everything. Okay, these guys are fucking lunatic rip-offs. But they're the only place to get, like, fresh vegetables nearby me. Unless I want to walk for, like, 15 minutes which each way, which I don't want to do. So, 
but just know if you're bothered to walk for 15 minutes extra you can get it even cheaper i'm gonna do two pound budget i mean look you can eat for a whole day you can eat for two days on two pounds easy not even difficult atomic shrimp he's done this a million times go watch his videos about it um but I'm going relatively fancy here with a, a vegetable soup. I don't know, man. I don't know what I'm talking about right now. I'm, I'm probably not going to do this. I'm just fucking delirious right now. And I'm just talking to random shit. Listen, I don't know what I'm talking about. I just feel like you can make you can make good food for cheap. And, and it's easy. And people, people are... Listen, I think a lot of people are making bad financial decisions. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be real with you. I think a lot of people spend too much money on shit they don't need. I don't understand it. I do it, but I save my money here so that I can afford to 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 get a plane ticket and fly to Estonia to hang out with my fucking girlfriend, which is something you don't have because you're spending all your money on McDonald's, okay? <laughs> oh, let me get one more pet peeve out of the way when it comes to people saying things are cheap and food and stuff. Don't be buying instant noodles, okay? Just don't be doing it if you can't okay listen if you can't cook if it's 2023 and you can't cook you are fucking insane like brother the internet exists like you can just go on the internet it's an i couldn't cook i remember a time when i couldn't cook you just do it like you it's actually quite hard to fuck up generally speaking unless you burn something or like undercooked chicken everything comes out edible like you start off with pasta and like eggs and then it's easy if you can't like you can go on i mean bbc good food always has reliable recipes for free right but there's obviously a million billion different places on the internet to find recipes you can go on youtube and watch cooking channels there's also a million billion of those most of them will probably be fine. Like, if you if you don't... I don't understand. I mean, I doubt that there are that many people listening, if any, who, who can't cook. But I know some people who, in, you know, who, who just can't cook. There's no excuse. It's, it's not even that much effort. Most meals are like 20 minutes to cook max that I make, you know. It's not that crazy. And most of that time is just spent waiting. Not like actively doing anything. Uh, But yeah. Instant noodles. I don't understand why you would ever buy them. Because like. Pasta is noodles. It's the same thing. And pasta is cheap as fuck. And also just as easy to make as instant noodles. Because you also just boil it. So you like pasta you can buy in massive bulk for super cheap and instant noodles actually come out to be relatively expensive compared to that um and also you're making these instant ramens you're really not getting very much nutrition out of it at all it's basically just carbs and salt and nothing else you make a pasta sauce with a tomato sauce at least you're getting something in it at least you're getting something in it right I don't understand the appeal of instant noodles. I want to be honest. I like I I say that I like them from time to time, but they're actually relatively pricey over here. I know in certain places, like obviously there are different brands that are different levels of quality, um, and I know like in Japan, instant noodles are like way better for cheap. Like the 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 instant ramen, the cup ramen you can get in Japan for cheap, is of way higher quality. Um, so if you happen to live in Japan, then I understand it. But if you don't, uh, I don't know, man. Just fucking look. If you if you're like specifically craving noodles, it's pro. It might be a good idea. Maybe pick up some Indomie. You guys know about Indomie, right? You gotta know about Indomie. But like. Yeah, I don't know. That's a bit of a thing. It's more so, it's not that there's no place for these things in your life, okay? It's the same with fast food. It's not that there's no place for these things in your life. It's just that, like, the idea that, like, oh, I'm a broke college student, so I have to eat instant noodles, it's purely a meme. 
I think it's like a marketing thing. Like it's, I don't think there's any reason for that because it's not the best option for that situation in any way. It's, it's actually a pretty bad option for that situation. Okay, that's what I'm done talking about this. This is fucking stupid. Okay, it's time for the, the pseudo-intellectual politics talk that's always a part of these videos. I feel like it's surprising. Well, it's not surprising. <clears throat> it's actually very unsurprising. Uh, but it's it's odd, nonetheless. How little the left critiques um, <clears throat> academia. And it, it's obviously because leftism is like entrenched in academia in lots of ways as in like there's a lot of focus on reading academic um <clears throat> i guess texts right like like reading the theoretical texts even to the point of over um praxis <clears throat> above praxis uh What was I going to say? I forgot. But that's... Like... It should be apparent that the the academic system is uh, the same kind of power structure that leftists and postmodern theorists and these types of people generally critique. And it's not that this criticism doesn't happen. It's just that it's it's never at the forefront if if it does happen it's often like just criticizing a certain part of it like um for example feminist academics criticizing uh like liberal feminists for example or, or stuff like this right it's almost it's it's it it doesn't enough look at this the the you know beyond sort of the surface level of like maybe funding bias and stuff like that i don't know that's a that's a an interesting factor of academia <clears throat> i'm thinking about this because i was watching a zero books video and just thinking like how fucking insane these people are but i have nothing against it it's entertaining it's interesting to learn about but like it's also just so ridiculously abstracted that it's insane and like i don't know you know, I'm not going to say whether or not this serves a purpose. I think it's a it's a debate that has to happen, is what I'm saying, right? <clears throat> like, the sort of very abstracted ivory tower uh, book writing and, and theorizing and studying. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an arg good argument to be made that that's, like, the, forms the basis or, or, or serves some super important purpose but also it it's definitely questionable you know what's actually going on there but then again you have situations like you know rojava for example uh taking a lot of inspiration from i mean every existing leftist place has generally taken strong influence from theory and you know Leftist leaders love to write self-aggrandizing books like, <clears throat> you know, Mao's book and, and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I just think it, also the corporate press, is, they've sort of handed out criticizing the media just to the right, which I think is a massive mistake. <clears throat> but hey, what can I say? That's kind of a boring thing. I was going to talk about something more interesting, but I forgot what it was. Oh, yeah, food. I, something I saw Adam Ragusea say uh, that I'm a big fan of now is this idea that, like, the in the West, we think of meals as having to, something to sort of qualify as a, a, a proper meal. It should really have three parts. It should be uh, your, your carb, your protein, and your veg. But really... In the modern world, it's probably better if meals just consist of two parts. Either uh, a vegetable and a protein, or a carb and a protein. 
you probably don't need or wait what did he say i don't remember what he said but you do you probably don't need all three in per meal it's just too much food like i i know myself i, I you know i i like eating these days i've gone really into this strat which is you get some protein some slab of meat and then just i would just make an entire head of broccoli and that's that's the meal it's just like shit loads an entire plate of broccoli with one piece of meat it sounds like kind of a sad meal but you wouldn't think that was a sad meal if it was like potatoes instead of broccoli or something you know like there's it serves as just to have the veg be the main like bulk part of the meal I feel like it's got to be really good because it's not like it's I mean it's slightly more expensive than using carbs um but not that expensive veg is still relatively cheap the protein is still going to be the most expensive part of the meal uh, and also vegetables contain carbohydrates but they also have fiber and <clears throat> a whole bunch of nutritional content which is important obviously and a lot of people don't get enough of it including me uh so yeah, I think that's a good play, personally. I think I'd recommend it. Give it a try. I'm not even saying for losing weight, although I, I imagine it's the sort of thing that could be really good for losing weight. But if you just, like, inst you don't have to bother making a carb. You just make a, a whole bunch of veg, just, like, enough veg to fill up the entire plate, and then the protein, and then just skip out on the carb. And obviously, you have to season your vegetables properly. Like, I, I, I put butter, salt, and pepper with my my broccoli because broccoli and butter it goes so well together the broccoli like you know gets all the butter and the little fluette type bits i don't know what to call them but it's, it's very tasty and it helps the salt to get absorbed i don't know it tastes good and also i justify it to myself by saying that the a lot of the nutrients are fat soluble so it makes them more bioavailable if you put it in butter i don't know how true that actually is but <laughs> that's how i justify it to myself it's tasty is the main thing uh but yeah no i'm telling you try try this out just get you know what i actually had was a, a small pie the cheapest pies they have in the shop um small pie which has carbs in it obviously because it's pastry and then just shit loads of broccoli just an entire an entire head of broccoli really good it was genuinely really good try it out it doesn't have to be pie i've done it with with everything you can imagine chicken pork beef fish you know all the all the ones and it doesn't even have to be meat it could be beans or tofu if you're sad I recommend this. I don't think it's good for every meal. Because you need carbs to feel happy. <laughs> like, if you've ever gone on a low-carb diet, you know, like, you just feel like shit all the time. Um, but you get, like, really sluggish. Um, I mean, unless you enter ketosis, in which case you have, you have options after a few weeks or a week or whatever in ketosis. You have the possibility. But... If you're not in ketosis, but just in like a low carb diet, you feel like shit. So I'm not saying every meal should be like this. But yeah, I have meals. They're just two parts. Sometimes it's just a carb and a protein. That's the least healthy one, but also the cheap, relatively cheap. Um, then sometimes I have just vegetable and protein that's the most expensive and the most nutritious one I should do that more often than I do it even though I do it relatively often I should up up the amount that I'm doing it and then sometimes I just have a protein uh, sometimes I just have a carb and a vegetable that's also really good that's also good but I try and throw in some sort of vegetable that's like has has protein in it like peas or beans or something if I'm doing that it's just that, that that's normally not the main bulk of the meal or the main focus I don't know I think it's worth trying out I think it's an interesting technique well I just put out a techno EP uh, my first techno EP in like five years um, if you don't know 
I actually started out making techno back in the day. That's right. Started out making techno back in the day. You can still find it all on x49sounds.bandcamp.com. Uh, scroll down to the bottom. You can find the, the self-titled X49 album. Some of the oldest shit that I've ever... That is some of my oldest music that's still on the internet. 2016. Uh, does it hold up? It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's a bit. It's a bit. It's a bit boring. It's a bit plain. Uh, a bit basic. But oh, it's okay. Um. I I I think it holds up better than No Thank You Volume One personally. But anyway, put out a new techno album. I never stopped listening to techno. The thing is, I just. Uh, when I was making techno back then, I was really into this uh, sort of a uh, modern-ish at the time, uh, sort of minimal dark techno that sort of, uh, there's quite a lot of it, like Sandwall District was like my favorite label, is that even a label? Sandwall District, that's a label, right? Uh, it, it's some people, it's someone. It's someone and it's good. Function, you know, f fucking function, hell yeah. Rose with two R's, based. Um, I mean, go listen to, uh, just go on YouTube and look up Sandwell District. You can watch their boiler room set or something. Uh, it's fucking sick, it's good shit. But these days, I'm more into... So I, I was listening to this kind of techno... Which I got introduced to from Lane Chan, really. Um, back in the day, I was on Lane Chan. There was a thread which was like, "What do you think cyberpunk music um, would sound like?" And a bunch of people had a bunch of different ideas. But one person was like, "I feel like minimal dark techno type stuff is cyberpunk music," and posted some links. Uh, so that's how I first got into techno. Uh, and yeah, I was making techno for a while. Before that, I had been like kind of into tech house, but not like that much. Uh, but anyway, so that was the kind of music I was into at the time. Sorry, I can't remember more examples of bands. It's been a long time since I've listened to this stuff. I'm sure if I scroll down in my, my, my YouTube playlist, I'll find some more examples. Uh, but then as I got more into techno, I started diving, you know, going back in time, exploring the, the, the OG scene. I got way more into a little more of an old school, older school sound. Um, some of the more Detroit stuff, you know, obviously that stuff's amazing, but my favorite era is like kind of the 1992 to 1994 six ish kind of era with like a little bit of acid a little bit of 303s like when people started really putting 303s in their shit that's when i'm like underground resistance man underground resistance so fucking good like that's my favorite era of techno so i kind of ended up making more of that which is different from what i was doing with x49 i guess um every time i don't know why i didn't post any of it because i keep making it i've made so <laughs> made a bunch uh of like more older school sounding techno. It never sounds quite right. Because obviously. Uh, that was all made on real hardware back in the day. And you, you just can never get it to sound quite right. In a door. Like normally I'm not a stickler for that, a stickler for that kind of stuff. Normally I'm like. If it's close enough it's close enough. If it sounds like it was made in the door. There's no reason to pretend it wasn't. But for that particular sound. Since sound design is so important for techno, it's like the the main thing almost uh, when you're stripping stuff back. It's like if it if it doesn't sound like it's coming from a real nine oh nine, you know, it doesn't. It just don't fit. It just don't work. And I've I've gotten like what I feel like is relatively close to a sound that I think emulates the vibe I'm going for, like a little crunchier, a little more saturated. Um, these days I'm getting, but it's taken me a long time to like figure out how to get that sound right. You know, various plugins to emulate some analog gear or old drum machines, old synths and stuff. Uh, I'm actually thinking of just actually buying 
a 303 clone. Because the thing about the 303 is you can, you can, like, it's not a complicated sound to make. You can create your own 303 sounding synth in pretty much any monophonic, you know, subtractive synth VST that you can find anywhere. In fact, Logic actually comes with one. It comes with the, 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 what is it called? The, the, fuck, I forgot what it's called. The EM1 or something. Hold on. Let me, let me double check what it's called. I, I just click it. I know what it's called. ES, ESM. That's what it's called. The ESM. And it's, it's supposed to be a 303 emulator or, or emulation. It sounds pretty close to a 303. Like, that's what I've been using. Um, it's, yeah, it's not far off. It, it can pass if you're using the right, like, saturation or distortion plugins over it. It can sound pretty good, but that's not, I mean, I don't think it has the filters quite right. Like, the filters of the 303 are pretty specific. Uh, I, I don't think they're quite right in the, the EF, e, ESM in Logic, uh, but even if they were closer to the real thing, I think part of what makes the 303 work is the the fact that it's fucking shit. Uh, oh, this is probably nonsense to everyone, because you guys don't know about music. <laughs> like, specific shit like this. Okay, let me explain what I'm, fuck I'm talking about. Okay, so techno. You guys know about techno? Here's how techno started. There was a bunch of guys in Detroit back in the day, and they were like, what if we made music that was like bleep bloop? And so they made music that was like bleep bloop, and it was it was all cool. And the problem was they were all poor and black and gay, and so they couldn't afford shit. Um, and so they went with the what was at the time like cheap shit that they could find, right? Which was generally the 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 drum machines that didn't really end up sounding like real drums, and the synths that didn't really end up sounding like real instruments. Because at the time, uh, you know, the 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 modular stuff was way too expensive to be in their price range, and most of the like mid to low priced stuff that was marketed at, like, touring musicians as, like, uh, you know, a, an extra bandmate, essentially. Like, a lot of drum machines were marketed as, like, hey, you can, you know, go out and gig with just this drum machine and you don't need a drummer, and that way you get to keep all of the money from your gig, you know, if you're a guitarist or a singer or something, you know. So, like, that's how a lot of it was marketed. So a lot of it was trying to sound like, much, or more like real drums, like, like think of the, the Lindrum or... What's that fucking one? The Rhythm Composer or something? I don't remember what it's called. Um, but then uh, there was the... I mean, the main ones are like the TR-808 and the three... The, the 808 and the, the 909 are like the most famous. I think the 78 or whatever that one's called. Or well, that one does sound a little more like real drums. Um, so the, these are all the names of like old ass drum machines you you you've heard of 808s because they're still you know the 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 sound of the 808 kick drum has been modified into the modern you know what we call 808s um but so those were all made by Roland and then Roland also made this uh monophonic which means it can only do one voice at the same time so like if you if you it can't play more than one note at the same time, it's not that would be polyphonic. It's monophonic, so it can only do one note at once. It's very basic. It's cheap plastic shit, um, and it was supposed to sound like a bass guitar, uh, but it sounds nothing like a fucking bass guitar, and was a massive commercial flop. It was it was a terrible terrible product. They were like, you can buy our drum machine to to have a drummer, and then buy this, you know. So you can have this bass guitar, except it sounds absolutely no I don't know what they were thinking. No one knows what they were thinking because it's it doesn't it's not even close. Like it's so bad for the function it's trying to serve. It's so bad, but it was super cheap because of this, right? It, because it was a complete commercial flop. It ended up in all these secondhand shops and pawn shops and whatever uh, in Detroit and you know in just around the world really where people were just selling it for cheap because no one wanted it, and that's what these early techno producers ended up uh, buying, and it became a very iconic sound. You've heard it before. Let me, let me, uh... It's, it's the acid, the acid sound. If I, uh... Let me see if I can find, like, a, a demonstration. 
hit it with this. This might be it. Might be good. It's kind of it. It's that kind of like blah 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 wow 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 wow. It kind of sounds like that. Wow 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 I think that was a pretty good impression. Actually, that was a pretty good impression. Wow wow wow. It sounds like that. Yeah. So again, this remember this is supposed to be a bass guitar. <laughs> like, what were they fucking thinking? But anyway, yeah, that's the the three hundred three. Uh, now, of course, all of these synths and drum machines that used to be the cheap, shitty ones that were whatever people could get their hands on are now super rare vintage drum machines that are worth literally tens of thousands of pounds sometimes, at least in the thousands, right? So, for originals, so there are lots of companies that clone them, that make like, you know, this has been a thing that's happened forever, cloning since. Uh, so you can buy modern clones that are way cheaper of these uh, stuff, which is why I'm thinking of buying a 303 clone. Uh, just because it'd be cool to have, because I fucking love the 303 sound. It's one of the best sounds ever. Like, the, the distorted, overdriven 303 sound is just such a, a classic sound. I mean, you know, it's amazing. It's in every song that's good. It's just sick. Um, okay, so what I was actually going to say before I wanted to try to explain what... Uh, so that's the first... When I say that the, that the 303 is, is a fucking dog shit, it's not just because it sounds nothing like a bass guitar. It's also uh, really hard to program, like to, to program in what notes you're playing. It famously has an incredibly unintuitive interface and workflow. Uh, like... There are, for example, okay, so the the way you program in the pitch versus the timing are two completely separate things. Like, you go through and you program the pitch of each note. You have 16 notes in a sequence that you're allowed. So you go through, you make all the pitches without any timing. You just choose the notes. And then you go back, and then you pick timings for each note. Except at no point is there any, like, interface... That like has any feedback so you just have to like know what you're doing you just have to remember what you're doing i mean you can you can step through and listen to it as you're going um but yeah there's it's a it's it's very unintuitive and uh you can undo only one mistake at a time so if you fuck up while you're programming something in you can only go back one step uh and that's only in the pitch if you fuck up the timing you just there's no undo you just have to clear it and start again um so it's terrible uh, like it's famously awkward to use and unlike the the 303 or the 808 right like the 303 is amazing one reason the 303 is sorry right? the the 909 one reason the 909 is so amazing is because you can edit the sequence in real time that's how you get stuff like if, if you've never seen this go go on youtube right now and look up jeff mills exhibitionist it's it's amazing it's uh so you can do these sorts of crazy live performances uh, using it like a real instrument. And it's it's very, very versatile for this sort of thing. It allows for improvisation and all this crazy shit, right? Uh, not possible on a 303. There's no... You cannot edit the sequence while it's playing. If you want to edit it, you have to pause and, you know, change it and then play again. So useless for any sort of live improvisation or anything. Uh, so yeah, it sucks in many ways. Uh, but it sounds fucking awesome. And what I was actually going to say is the fact that this sequencing is so unintuitive is probably what led to the style, or it's, it's undoubtedly what led to the style of bass line that is produced by the 303. Because of how awkward and weird it is to program in anything, uh, the easiest thing, the most natural thing to program in the 303 is just a bunch of 16th notes. And often in sort of a random pattern, because it's kind of hard to know what you're programming while you're doing it. Which is why every 303 sound you've ever heard is... Right? It's just 16th notes, because that's the easiest thing. That's the most natural thing to program in. If you want to do anything other than that, it requires, like, kind of going out of your way a little bit. Not, like, super crazy. You can do it, but it's just... 
the 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 flurry of sixteenth notes with each note being different is the easiest thing to do when you have a three or three. And so that's one of the reasons why I actually want to buy a clone is specifically for the unintuitive and terrible interface because it lets you it 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 pushes you towards creating. I mean, you can just emulate it with your brain in a, a piano roll on a, on a door, but on a computer. But you know, if you want to recreate the experience of the limitations, because because creativity comes from limitations. You know what I'm saying here? I think that's a good reason. Now, 303 clones are about 100 quid, a little bit more. I would also have to buy some extra equipment. Well, I wouldn't have to, but it would be useful. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I need to, I think I should experiment a little more with the sound. I don't know. I'm thinking about it. Spending money on music gear is the most justifiable expense I can make besides, like, food. Since it is ostensibly my job. Um... So, like, I normally don't feel bad about buying music gear, which is why I'm, like, very tempted to do this. Uh, also, for a, I mean, for a synth, for, like, a hardware synth, that's relatively cheap. Like, that's actually pretty cheap. A lot of hardware synths are way more expensive than that. Um, so, you know, it's not that crazy. It's, it's really not that crazy, and it would be such a cool thing to own. I could have just busted out and be like, what, 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 you know what I'm saying? Bust it out randomly. Oh yeah, I just randomly remembered the thing about Triangle of Sadness. Another thing is the movie starts with the opening. The opening credits of the movie is some bastardization of arguably my favorite song. It's some remix of, um, actually, is it, is Ghost Rider, right? Ghost Rider by Suicide. One of my favorite songs of all time. Easy, like, top five songs of all time. And it's some sort of thing that's, look, I've got nothing against it. I said, I said it was a bastardization. This is too harsh. The song is fine. I just wasn't expecting it. Because I hear the sample from Ghost Rider, and like, bam, bam, bam. Better, 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 better. Let me get it up. Hold on. Um. I just fucking love it. I could listen to this this guy go da 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 for ten years. It gets me so hype every time I hear it. Sorry, that was probably really loud for you guys, but I fucking love this song. It's my my favorite song ever. I love it. And I hear this and I'm like, oh my god, that for this song, this is a the best movie ever. And then different drums come in, and some lady starts like singing over it. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Wasn't expecting that. So that's the thing that I just wanted to point out. Is it? I I got bait and switched. I'm fine with it existing. I'm completely okay with someone sampling this song. It's a great song. You, you feel free to sample it. I have no qualms with that. I just wasn't expecting it. I got what the problem was. I got hyped because I was like, "Yo, it's Ghost Rider," and then I was like, "Oh, it's actually some sort of remix or sample of Ghost Rider," which is a shame, but fine that that exists. You know, I was I keep thinking about the death of the internet, and I've I've started to feel like I've seen I've seen a vibe switch, I've seen a vibe shift, I've seen a shift in the vibe, and I don't know if I'm willing to be this optimistic, but the shift in the vibe that I've seen online is more and more people just sort of saying, okay, we'll just go back to what we used to do, like Netflix is raising prices and banning you from sharing accounts. Okay, we'll just go back to pirating shit. Uh, Twitter and all of these platforms are killing themselves. Looks like we're going back to forums. Uh, or Tumblr. Uh, like, Tumblr, for example, is is currently having a bit of a ball. A bit of a party. A bit of a disco. Because they've been, like... 
like Tumblr has been very gradually and steadily getting worse as a website, like as a, as a design since its inception. But that's all it is, right? It's just been gradually failing forever. And so right now, Tumblr is actually a relatively good place. <laughs> like it's always been considered like, or not always, but like, I don't use Tumblr by the way. So I'm, I'm just going off of, of secondhand reports here. Like, it's a running joke on Tumblr how much the site sucks. I mean, this is not a lone situation. It's the same in a lot of places. But, like, Tumblr specifically has a lot of very clear evidence that the site sucks. Because, like, hilariously so, it keeps losing money. Like, it keeps being sold for, to other companies for less and less money. Um, and they keep doing, like, stupid shit, like banning porn and stuff like that, I mean, that was a long time ago now, but I remember when that happened, right, um, and so, like, there's a very clear, slow, gradual, it's not even that slow, but for the internet, slow, downward progression, but somehow, I guess they're just not concerned with paying, turning a profit, whoever owns Tumblr, is it Yahoo, I don't know, because they ha they don't seem to have, like, put a bunch of monetization bullshit into it, I don't know. But I think these second tier websites, like Tumblr, 4chan, these sorts of places, maybe even, I don't know if I, does anyone still use something awful? Does anyone still use something awful? Any something awful members in the, in the, 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 the fan base, the audience? I haven't thought about that website in like 10 years. That was a, that was a classic place. Maybe I should maybe maybe I should go there. I don't know. Oh, they're probably all it's just the sort of place that's probably all like fucking storm frags these days. Let me check. Cinema discussion. Here, I'll go here. Um, sure. I'll go in here. Yeah, this is fun. Okay. Doesn't look like it's too obnoxious. Doesn't look like it's too obnoxious actually. Huh. Wasn't expecting that. I expected this place to be ass. I mean, maybe this is a bad threat. Maybe I should be in a... God, I haven't fucking been on something awful in literally 10 years, probably longer. Debate and discussion. Okay, now this is where we're going to get some anger. Now we'll see. Ukraine conflict. Okay, let's see what's going on in here. Uh, it's not bad. It's, it's way not too bad. It's actually amazingly chill. What the fuck? Since when has something awful been like this? What the hell? <laughs> this is crazy. Strange. Okay, well, Park, I might end up, <laughs> I, I, I might become a something awful new fag. I don't know. Uh, probably not, though. But, uh, yeah, we need to go back. Like, I've seen people talking about how we need to go back to forums. Like, I saw a post that was like, we, we were raised from forums and, and we shall return to forums. I think that's a good idea. But people are so mind raped by like the uh, the idea of of I mean obviously this is never going to be a widespread thing because normies have zero patience and they like remember the average person's goal on the internet is to go viral like that's what they really want they 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 don't want to put in any effort to go viral like they don't well some of them do but like a lot of them see it as sort of a second job 
where they 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 win by getting lots of likes or whatever, right? Which is a very very strange way of seeing the internet to me, but that's how most people see like every social interaction on the internet um, as this sort of weird game. And obviously that can't happen on forums, so I think they won't like it because it doesn't give them like a dopamine drip feed. It's just for actual discussion. Uh, yeah, so, but I like forums. It's been a long time since I've used a forum regularly, though. Uh, I've I've always been more of an anonymous image board person because I like the anonymity. I I don't really like the 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 account structure. I mean, I've used forums not like it's not like I'm it's completely alien to me. I've been a part of a few communities, but not super actively, and not for a super long time. Um, yeah, I like the uh, I like that you don't have to make an account to post on an image board. That's nice to me. Uh, so maybe we we have to go back. All of the the smaller image boards have sort of died, uh, but not all of them. Actually, that's a massive exaggeration. Uh, but they are, like, slowly slowing down, which is fine. Some of them have, like, pretty good, uh, pretty good, um, like, some sort of, sp- like, Sushi Chan. Sushi Chan seems relatively active, you know, like, it has some small user base, and it just continuously has that user base, you know? Like, no one's, no one's leaving. People, people who use Sushi Chan always going to be using sushi chan probably uh and that's good i like that got to keep it got to keep it real up on the internet but obviously these places are very slow so if you actually want to like fill up any time which is something i want to do as a as a, like a neat um you need to have like many of them like yeah, each one might be slow but you you have like five or six different ones you check and you can just spend all day f5ing them in rotation uh i ran out of fucking everything i didn't i don't know i didn't actually run out of everything um i fucking uh what was it what, what happened to me what happened to me who am i again What's this, what's, what's this, okay, okay, sorry, very disorganized, I just woke up not too long ago, and I woke up crazy dehydrated, like super dehydrated and disorientated, and um, I'm like, like the scene in Spongebob where they, they all dry out, that's, that's me, um, and I, I went to check what my food options were, I have like, I'm actually, I don't know man, for some reason, I was like, it's better to, hold on, I need to blow my nose, yeah, for some reason, I, I want, uh, I, ha- I have a little bit of, uh, well, that doesn't matter, but I, I wanted to make, I want, I want tortilla, I want a, I want a breakfast burrito type of thing, um, I don't have any tortillas, so I'm gonna try and, like, make tortillas, which the dough is currently autolyzing as we speak, um, I've never made tortillas before, it will probably be absolutely nothing like a tortilla, what I imagine this will actually be is just a breakfast flatbread, which is also fine, uh, I like, I've made flatbreads many times, I've just never made one as thin as a tortilla, Uh, I'll try, you know what, maybe I won't even try, maybe I'll just make it, it will just be a flatbread wrapped with eggs, and, you know, hot sauce and stuff, and that's chill, and that's okay by me, but on reflection, I need to use these fucking potatoes. I could have just, I should have just used these potatoes. Or I could have made like a potato flatbread. How does that work? I know that's possible. There's potato bread as a thing. Let me go look up potato bread, see how this things work. The thing about Patreon is back in the day, it was a, uh, when, when Patreon was first a thing, it made a lot more sense because but back then not everything had become a monthly subscription service yet so if you were like you probably only had one maybe like netflix or something 
I mean, I don't, I don't have any. I want to put it out there. I have zero monthly subscription services. I, I don't think I ever have had a monthly subscription service to anything. I, I don't have any monthly subscription services, and neither should you. But the Normans of the world have these. Not just the Normans, but the average people, I guess. I don't know what to call them. People who do stuff with their life instead of just sit inside and make bleep bloop music and shit. Right? Those people. The, the ones that are like real people. Unlike me, I'm fake people. But the real people, they now have like 50,000 subscription services every month. So like adding the the value proposition of like, hey, yeah, I'll toss a couple bucks to my my artist guy once a month. That's not a big deal. Is now like, okay, this artist guy's Patreon has to compete with Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, every fucking subscription service, Cat Treat subscription service, Awesome Socks Club, Awesome Coffee Club. But I'm getting socks, I'm getting coffee, 12 loot boxes, 14 streaming services, you've, uh, Huel, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, fucking HelloFresh. My entire life is just subscription services. It's like money doesn't exist anymore. Because you go to work to earn the money, which you never see, goes directly into your bank account. And then it goes directly out of your bank account for all your bills and subscriptions. And at the end, you never spend money on anything. They may as well just transfer the money directly from the from the employer to the tech company. <laughs> you don't even need to exist in the middle. They should just be taking the money directly from the employer and putting it directly in just like, hey, don't pay me, pay, pay my bills. We're doing more comment responses, hooray. Today's comment, well, you know what, let's just go to my analytics page and or my on YouTube studio so I can read some comments. Uh, no, that's just for this video. Give me the all comments that I've ever had in my life. Okay, perfect. Um, oh, I need to sneeze. <coughs> there you go, sneezed. Um, we got, uh, okay, so Censored Terminal Autism 473 says, the comment on the Half-Life video wasn't my first one. Let me double check so I can remember what comment you're talking about, because I do remember, I talked about some of the comments on this video, um, uh, all I want is for games to look the way that they were intended when they came out, probably on a CRT too. Yeah, that was your comment, I believe. Oh, you said, I like Half-Life 1, it's a shame they never made another good Half-Life after that. One that doesn't bore me to death, maybe I should play it again. Not sure if it runs on my thing at the lowest settings. Blah, 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 I already read this out before. Uh, oh, it looks like some people are... Uh... Sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that was your comment. It was about uh, Half-Life 1 being better than Half-Life 2, which is the correct opinion, so shouts out to you. Uh, but yeah, the comment on the Half-Life video wasn't my first one. The, that would be the one in the video about who ruined the internet that got deleted, because I was once briefly shadow banned. And that I rewrote in my website that I should really work on more, that is linked in my channels, whatever that thing is called. <clears throat> Though I found you through the video about anime recommendations for new types, oh, I remember that one, uh, that I found through Digi's neurotyping thing. I watched him back when he was still alive. Then I watched a bunch of other stuff and listened to the podcast, starting from the giant one you bought the Mac in. Haven't commented much because a lot of the time I don't even know if I can. Next paragraph. Really disagree with the frame... Insert word I can't say here. Raise the standards for online video. I don't know what word that would be. Uh, <laughs> sure, I'll just imagine them. I'm just gonna uh, imagine uh, that you are saying the N word. <laughs> With, <laughs> I'm just gonna imagine that you're saying hard E R. Uh, N word and that I really disagree with the frame. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. This is a stupid joke. Uh, they lowered it as much as they. 
It could possibly be lowered. Everything that they make is absolute trash, and if I had horrible taste and wanted that, I'd watch TV, because it's the exact same thing, instead of digging through search results for something that's actually good. Uh, even my videos are much better than theirs, and most of them aren't even on this website because it's bad to the point of being unusable. So in case you don't remember from the last thing, because this was right at the end of my previous podcast, I was talking about how um, modern YouTube production qualities have raised the standards for YouTube videos, that all of the, the, the big YouTubers who get sponsorship deals and have teams of editors and can afford, and writers and can afford all of this stuff uh, because they have, like, you know, managers and talent agencies working with them and brands working with them and so on, has raised the idea of, like, what the quality of a YouTube video should be. And I agree with you to some extent, Terminal. Since for Terminal, I was going to call you Terminal Autism. I agree with you to some extent, Terminal Autism, which is that uh, the majority of content on this website is schlock and garbage. Yes, I mean, that's kind of undeniable. Uh, It's just the case for most of the internet. In fact, it's kind of the case for most media. The majority of stuff is is schlock and garbage. Uh, I don't think uh, you should say, like, if you just wanted to watch garbage, you'd watch TV. I don't know much about modern TV, but no one's ever made a YouTube video that is as good as any episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Okay, that's not true. There are some pretty piss-poor episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. No one's ever made a YouTube video that is as good as a good episode of Star Trek TNG. Some of them are close. I think maybe uh, the the Boku no Natsu Yasumi video... The um, Steve Rogers Boku no Natsu Yasumi video is pretty close to being as good as a good episode of TNG. Uh, so maybe it does exist. Not all, not everything is garbage on this website, but uh, a lot of it is. You do have to do a lot of digging. That's the problem with the internet as a whole. This is this has actually been the fundamental problem since the internet began. Is the signal to noise ratio on the internet is just even because the barrier to entry is so low, even lower than, like, t- cheapo TV shows, anyone can make something, which means, I mean, this has literally caused all the problems online on the, with, with the way that the internet is designed. It's so, there's so much more garbage than there is good stuff that every website has to try and come up with some way to sort the garbage from the good stuff. Sometimes that's through just being obscure or being having some sort of means testing to join, uh, sometimes that's through an upvote download system where it's community managed, but these days the most, I mean, obviously you don't need, you guys don't need me to explain this to you. The most common solution to this has been algorithmic recommendation features. And, uh, the problem with that is that, uh, human, when, when you gamify, uh, something, so, so creating an algorithm like that is basically gamifying the internet. You're, you're turning it into a game of, can you beat the search engine? Can you figure out how the algorithm works and beat it at its own game? And when you do that, human beings were really fucking good. You know, I'm not saying I am, but as a whole, like, the, the people, rather than a person, people are really good at optimizing the fun out of video games. <laughs> like, people, when you give someone a set system... Even if they don't know the exact mechanics, you can be damn sure they're going to find what what they are and optimize the shit out of them. And what that actually means is they just produce more trash because algorithms, they're no longer producing content that people want to watch. They're producing content that the algorithm wants to recommend. And a lot of big YouTubers deny this. They like uh, people who are influenced by Mr. Beast, especially because Mr. Beast says this a lot. He, he, He thinks that making something that the algorithm likes is exactly the same as making something that people like because uh, the algorithm just shows whatever keeps people on the site for the longest. And so if, if people are watching your video to the end uh, really consistently, uh, that means that they must like it, surely, which means that it must be the best video ever. Like, I have no doubt Mr. Beast thinks his videos are, like, the best videos on the platform. Which, is, I mean, it's obviously not true if you're older than 12 years old. What he's actually done is create a market of 12 year olds <laughs> who are satisfied with just having like keys dangled in their faces and reality tv fans like it's not actually good stuff right like it's not 
it's 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 garbage right? i think anyone who like has critical thought understands that it's garbage uh it's not going to make you feel an emotion or like have an idea or ch- be challenged in any way or, or or think about the world in a new light or anything like that it's not like good art but it is really good at getting a lot of people mainly children and stupid adults to watch it all the way through to the end which uh, as far as these people think that is that equals people are enjoying it it's good content but it It's not. It's just good for the algorithm. So I agree with you that most of it is schlock and garbage. Um, But what I'm talking about in the video is when I say raise the standards, I don't mean the the standards of like actual, the, the content of what is being said. I mean the production quality standards, like things are... You know, I remember when Let's Plays were first a thing, they were 15 minute videos, 10 minute videos, and they were completely unedited, just two guys or one guy just playing Minecraft and talking to himself, just unedited. And then you could record like 50 of them in a day, right? You just you just play the game for like four hours and then cut that up into 10 minute chunks and upload them and no editing, no nothing. Maybe a title card with some cheesy dubstep music, if you were lucky. Uh, and that was considered, like, the peak of gaming content for, for years. Whereas nowadays, if you were to upload an uned, I mean, some people can get away with it. Uh, but only people with a lot of clout or who are exceptionally entertaining and funny, like Northern Lion. And even Northern Lion, you know, he doesn't get that many views on his videos, actually. Uh, like, very, very few people can get away with, it, like, unedited gameplay getting millions and millions of views on YouTube anymore. It just doesn't happen because the standards of, like, uh, production quality have just been raised a lot. And so that type of video seems dated to a lot of people now when they go back. It seems boring. Like, it's it's got a lot of dead air. It's got a lot of downtime. It's not uh, just the entertaining parts, right? That's the sort of thing I mean. It's not necessarily that one of those videos is... I mean, I know that when I go back and I watch, like, the old Shadow of Israfel episodes and stuff like that, it is kind of boring, honestly, going going back. I kind of do prefer the more edited slightly. I mean, people go too far these days with the, the flashy editing. Somewhere in the middle where it's, you know, edited down to, to be the best parts, but not, like, super crazy flashy editing, dangling keys, flashing lights and stuff like that, you know. It's like a simple edited down version of a gameplay is probably where I land somewhere in the middle um <clears throat> but uh yeah what i'm what i mean is the the production quality not i i.e like how much effort is expected to go into a video how much how much time and effort you, and money you're supposed to spend making a youtube video it's seen as a product now rather than just something people would do for fun uh also you can get liberal from the liberal website for linux I don't know why I'm saying this. My notes just told me to do it. They also tell me to mention that tiling window... Well, hold on, I'll address your, that point first. I've 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 been trained from using Linux to, uh, to, to, to install programs through package managers. I'm not going to untrain myself to install programs through random websites, which is just a worse system. Um, I installed Liveaboot. And it, uh, sorry, Liberwolf. <laughs> I actually installed Liberwolf on a different computer recently, and uh, that time I just installed the Liberwolf binary from from the AUR instead of combining it from scratch, and it was a much faster thing. <laughs> it was it took a lot less time. I'll tell you that much. Okay, the uh, tiling window managers most people use are bad, and it's very unfortunate. Dynamic tilers are only good if you don't open a billion windows like I do. I'm I'm one of those people. I do not. I generally open. I pretty much almost always have one window per workspace. Uh, that's it. Like or one window per monitor if I'm on my desktop. I almost. I very very rarely have more than one window open at a time on on any particular workspace. Uh, the only times when I have more than one, it's normally like temporary, and it's normally two. Like I. I can't even imagine having three windows open on one workspace for a long period of time. It would drive me fucking nuts. So, yeah, in that situation, 
BSPWM on ThinkPad with like seven workspaces of which I normally just have my web browser on my first workspace and then like some sort of messaging app like uh, Matrix on my second workspace. And then I normally have like my file browser on my third workspace or sometimes when I'm, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much how I organize stuff not most of the time. Uh, so yeah, I'm not a million windows all the time type of guy. The best window managers are the ones that are more like a terminal multiplexer or like Emacs. So Rat Poison, Stump WM, if you're into Lisp. SD, S Dorfez, I've never heard of that. And Notion. All of them have fixed frame layouts that you create and windows belong to the frame that they're spawned into. So it operates a lot like tabs. I mean, yeah, I, if I wanted that, I would just use, like, workspaces, though, which is what I do. So I don't feel like I really need need that. Um, the first two suffer from itchy... The first two suffer of some issues that I guess could be blamed on their age, like a lack of independent workspaces for each monitor. The first three suffer from a lack of adherence to window management standards, so bars don't work like they should. Notion itself doesn't have those problems, and it's also more intuitive because it actually has a graphical interface with mouse support. My only problem with it is that it's difficult to configure because it's written in C and extended with Lua. Meanwhile, Stump WM is written in Common Lisp, and that's a much better language. It's compiled while also giving you total access to the internals in real time in the REPL. So there's no need to ever patch it because the language itself results in programs that can be modified at runtime, so config class can totally replace patching. That's cool. I don't think I'm going to change from the stuff I'm using already, though, because I have everything set up how I like it. Uh, but that is cool. Uh, okay, well, that's my that's my um, that's my comment comment responses. There's been an ongoing controversy in the UK for years and years at this point. I mean, just years. Um, and that is uh, this HS2. HS2. Um, it stands for High Speed 2. It's a high speed railway that's going to go connect major cities London to Birmingham to Manchester and, and Leeds. Uh, now, you'd imagine. Everyone would fucking love this, right? Because it's great. It's high-speed rail. Unfortunately, it is extremely controversial for a number of reasons. It's a massive project. It is It is just a huge project. It. Uh, if you go on their website... Uh, hold on, let me, let me go on their website. It says it's the, uh, the largest infrastructure project in Europe. It's it's a it is a big thing. They're building a bunch of stations. It's it's crazy, um, billions and billions of pounds. Now that's partially why it's controversial. It's just that it's taking forever, and is very expensive. Uh, but the other reason it's controversial is, and you wouldn't you know this is how how much of a different level you are on in Europe than America, is the environmental impacts. Now, as far as I'm concerned, nothing has convinced me... Okay, it's complicated. It's more complicated than just CO2 emissions. Because obviously, creating a bunch of concrete and rail and trains and stuff does produce a lot of emissions. But you would assume, you know, if more people take this and don't take cars, it's, it's better. The problem is that the route or routes cut through a bunch of natural areas, foresty nature areas. That's really the thing that a lot of people are upset about. Uh, but I, I think is mainly an excuse because it also like kind of goes through some, some towns that no one fucking get, cares about. And like some people are going to be bothered by that. Frankly, you know, call me selfish. I, I just simply don't care about these people. Um, yeah, there's a, <clears throat> the fucking, this is like a, 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 a big reason why I'm not in favor. This is like the biggest thing I don't like about the Green Party is that they, they fucking hate 
it's it's so annoying. All of these fucking, all of these goddamn green hippie types, like Extinction Rebellion, the Green Party, all of these people, they hate HS2. I don't understand why. Like, they they just. It's because it's because of this one fucking place called Chiltern Hills, which is just some like forest. That's like cool. Like yeah, it's a cool forest. It looks cool. Um, I guess, but like I feel like trains are also cool. <laughs> you know, um, so these guys have like pushed real fucking hard to like try and do their best. Look, like I'm sure that there's some dodgy shit going on behind the scenes with HS2. But they are trying their best to like plant loads of trees to make up for this shit. Like they are planting an absurd amount of new trees and basically conjuring up new forests out of thin air to make up for the damage. How much does that actually work? You know, if you're going through an existing ecosystem that's been there for like hundreds and hundreds of years, um I don't know. But you know, it's a it's a high speed rail network. Like if you don't understand the the okay, so right now this is like a, to me this is a national embarrassment. To go from London to Glasgow by train, which should be the most basic direct rail connection in the in the universe, in the world. Like, you would expect that London to Glasgow should have the fastest, like, the easiest cheap bullet train you can get in the world. Except, in reality, it takes, like, almost six hours to get f- on the train from London to Glasgow, which is fucking ridiculous. Now, HS2 doesn't even go up to Glasgow, but, uh... Ideally, it would reduce the times from London to Glasgow down to, like, four and a bit hours, four and a half hours. Um, which, to me, is a pretty massive improvement. Like, if you're reducing the times, like, what they aim, that they, they, they think they can get, like, Manchester to London, I think, in, a, in like, an hour and 11 minutes by the end of, of their, like, final, finalised everything's done because uh, it's going to open in like a not finalized state and they're going to continue working on it after it opens which is pretty normal because they want to earn some money back um, like once it opens it's not going to be that much of an improvement but after they keep developing it they aim to get it down from I think it takes about two and a half hours right now to just over an hour um, which is pretty fucking insane because that like an hour that that'll be enough that people can like very easily commute from london to uh manchester or vice versa like that's pretty crazy i mean a lot of people already commute into london um but you're reducing people's commutes by a whole hour that's pretty cool that's pretty great you know Definitely gonna get fewer people in cars, ideally. I don't understand how any of these green green people can say that this is bad. I think the green pog they their argument is like, oh, this money would be better spent on local infrastructure projects. But I just simply don't agree. I mean, maybe I don't. Okay, you know what? Uh, maybe I'm giving my London a perspective here because we have we have good good possible transport infrastructure. Like, would I rather? that they spend okay how much how much does the has it cost let's see how much how much does it cost to make this thing let me see uh does it say anywhere how much has hs2 cost so far uh or hs2 total costs i guess between 72 billion and 98 billion pounds. But inflation's gone up, so it'll probably be over 100 billion now. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so it's a lot of fucking money. I would rather that money went to making, ex- like, if I had my way, that money would have just been diverted into, you know, making 
subsidizing transport costs that the, like every other european country the the uk government would actually subsidize train fares and stuff because uh, we have ridiculously expensive fares so if you want to make that criticism i think that's fine that's probably a better use of the money but i also do see our, our like shockingly bad high speed rail network as like a national embarrassment I mean, I see both. I see the high prices and the bad um, high-speed network to be embarrassing. Like, you can get around locally. I mean, in London, you can get around locally very, very well. In other parts of the country, it's not too bad. I mean, it depends. I've been to, you know, Birmingham and, and stuff like that. And it's not too bad. The buses are more infrequent, but it works the rail system works like you can stay it's not too bad it's not great it's not too bad could definitely be better probably would be a better use of funding actually to help to to give money but who cares about them they're fucking unwashed masses outside of london these fucking peasants who fucking gives a shit i don't know it's it's a it's a weird it is a weird complicated system where um surprisingly you know the 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 environmentalist green people are the ones that want to stop the rail infrastructure which is not something that people normally think about but that is a thing personally i think that having a train go through an area of natural beauty makes that place look better like there is nothing more pretty than being in like some green place, some fucking forest or or fields with a train going across in the distance, that shit looks great. And then it's also great to be on that train. Being on a train going through like really pretty areas, that's fucking a great experience. At the end of the day, I can't fo- I can't think that's a problem. But you know. It's a complicated thing, and I'm not saying I'm not. I don't particularly want to come down hard on one one side or the other, because it's it's very complicated. Like, I guess the ultimate question is really: Is it worth the money? Like, will it actually? Given that it's not like these places don't have like high speed rail anyway, right? Like they do have it. It's just not that good. It just kind of sucks. Like it's just it would. It's, it's it's just bad. And it is actually bad. Like, I've been on rail to these places, and it's mainly the rolling stock that's just fucking... I don't know what they're doing to the suspension on these trains, but it, like, sways back and forward, and it's, it's really not nice to be on. Like, just upgrade the rolling stock on these, on these lines, and it's good enough. I mean, I don't know if it's good enough. I don't know. It's a complicated thing. You, you never know. I'll probably still vote for the Greens in the next election. Just because, uh, other than, I mean, HS2 doesn't really matter to me. I, I don't really plan on leaving London to go to, fuck, why, why in the, please tell me, why in the goddamn fuck would I ever want to go to Leeds? I've been to Leeds. It, I, <laughs> I've, I've been there. It's, it's not great. There's nothing to do. It sucks. I've been to Leeds. I don't want to go back. I've going to Leeds once is enough Leeds for anyone for their entire lifetime. I want to go to Manchester. I don't want to go to Birmingham. I've been to all these places. They're miserable. <laughs> They're fucking miserable places. <laughs> you, trust me, you do not want to go to fucking Birmingham. You go to Birmingham, everyone speaks in unintelligible accents. It's impo- it's impossible to get anything to do anything. <laughs> People think London has, like, bad fucking violence and crime. You see Birmingham, man. It's just fucking wild up there. It's a mess. Why would I ever want to go there? I don't even leave my fucking room. It's not even just the fact that these places suck. I don't even go out. I don't even go in London. I'm just fucking here in my fucking bedroom. (laughs) Why do I care if there's fucking high-speed rail? Maybe I don't. Maybe I don't care. In the end. Maybe I do agree with the Greens. Maybe that money would be better spent on local infrastructure projects. You know? 
it's it's quite possible. To be honest, I just don't know. It's just that I just thought I'd mention it because it's a it's a strange and interesting situation that you don't see very often. I'd be interested to hear one of these like transport YouTubers talk about this because I would wonder what like you know these people like like not just bikes and whatever like I'd want to hear what's his opinion on on these like high speed rail projects being opposed by lefty types although it was also opposed by a bunch of like right wing populists so I don't know what that means uh <clears throat> I don't know. I I don't I don't think I don't I don't think it can be that bad of an idea. I feel like more high speed rail is always better than less. That's just my opinion. Big fan of high speed rail networks as a person, just as a concept. They're just so cool. They're just very cool. I don't really. It's I find it very hard to complain about that. You know, because it's just a very cool thing to exist. They're trains, which is already fucking sick, but they're also high speed. Like, that, you know how insane that is? These trains, they're massive. And yet, they're going so fast. How are they doing that? It's, it's fucking crazy. They get in these giant things, and they're just like... Vroom! It's so fucking fast. They, and then you're standing on the platform when they go past, and, it, and you, you just hear it off in the distance. It's like... And then it comes past, and it's like... Vroom! And it's fucking sick. It's crazy. It's like you're really living when you see that. When you see a train speed past and it makes that sound of the, when all the carriages go past, like, <laughs> that's fucking, then you're alive when you see that. You're, you, you never get to be close to something that big moving that fast. That's so cool. So honestly, if some like species of squirrel living in this forest has to die so that more of that can exist, I can't say I, like, I'm super opposed to it. <laughs> like, you know, the forest is not even that old. Like, there, it, it's from, like, the 1600s. It's like, yeah, that's pretty old, but also, like, there's not that old. Like, there's no reason. Look, you just plant some more trees, which they're doing, right nearby. Animals can move over there. Sure, it'll take a while for the trees to, to, to grow up and the ecosystem to develop, but it'll be fine. They're doing the best they can possibly do. Frankly, I support HS2, I've decided. Because trains, trains are cool, and if the, the sacrifices need to be made. <laughs> you know how I went on that rant about how cheap food is and how expensive foods are and stuff like that earlier? I want to go back and just append this. I, I definitely underestimated the cost of certain things in that rant. Like, uh, <laughs> I could not, after just going to the shop and actually counting up how much items cost, I could not make a very nice <laughs> vegetable soup for less than a pound. At least not from my local shop. Maybe if I went to a particularly cheap place, I could get enough. But I think it would be quite hard. Um, maybe two pounds I could probably manage. Less than one pound, I don't think so. Two pounds, maybe. It would even that would be kind of it would be a pretty bland soup. It would be mostly cabbage and onion, which is fine. Uh, but you know, the other thing is I said I I overest I okay so eggs I said like eggs were ridiculously cheap that you could get twelve for two pounds. What I was actually thinking about then was a specific sale in a specific shop that had 10 eggs for £2, um, not 12 But that is not the standard cost for eggs. Eggs are normally more expensive than that. Those are the mistakes I made. Nonetheless, the reason I'm thinking about this is because I all day I've been thinking to myself, I want to get Taco Bell. When Taco Bell opens, I'm going to order Taco Bell, and I'm fucking excited. Well, it got to the time when Taco Bell opened, so I went to my delivery thing to go order some. And then while I was buying it, or deciding what to get, I was thinking, like, starting to get nervous and anxious. Because I was like, it's been a long time since I've ordered delivery, relatively. It's been like a month after I 
after I found the, the section on my banking app that lets me see my expenses and realized just how ridiculously expensive like I was sp spending, even though I was only getting delivery, like maybe once a week, it still just adds up. It adds up so fast. And after seeing that on my outgoings, I've it made me really not want to get delivery very often because it's just a, it's just a useless expense for no reason. But I was like, okay, it's been a a, a good while since I've gotten takeout. Let me go get some Taco Bell. But then while I'm ordering. In the back of my mind, I'm st calculating, calculating all the costs. I'm adding them up. I'm like, I better make sure I get something I like. I'm looking through the menu, and I'm taking like, you know, goes from one minute, five minutes, fifteen minutes. Eventually, I realize I spent twenty minutes on this website trying to pick out what I'm gonna order from this Taco Bell menu because I'm so anxious about spending all this money and buying the wrong thing. Like, I'm like, if I'm getting this, it has to be the best fucking thing on the menu. And I'm so I'm going through, and I'm like, okay, I got this before, and it was pretty nice. But, like, do I want to stick with something that I thought was pretty good? Or do I want to try and this, which could be amazing, but I've never tried it before, so I don't know. And it's like, I'm, I'm second-guessing myself. I'm like, how much do I want to order? Do I want to get, like, enough for two meals today or just one meal? Is it cheaper if I get to, in, enough food for two meals or should I just stick with one? But like, I'm like doing all of these stuff and I realize I'm just so anxious about spending this money. It's not even much money. <laughs> it was like 12 pounds probably. Uh, that in the end, I'm like, you, you know what? I could go to the shop and just buy some tortillas and a couple other ingredients. And I would be able to make something that is okay, you know, decent. Maybe not as quite as good as Taco Bell, but close enough. And it would cost me three times less. And so, at, at least at that point, if it was like, because oh I've obviously I've made lots of Mexican food these days, and it's not as good as Taco Bell, but it's very close. It's like 90% of the way there. Um, I don't know, they just fry their shit in more fat probably than I do, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, they put more MSG in it, I don't know. But, uh, so you, it's 90% it's there, and it I'm... The thing is that I don't care that it's slightly worse because I know that I'm saving money. And so I just, I'm, the anxiety is gone. The guilt and the anxiety are gone, which makes the whole experience better. So really, that's what I'm thinking about. That's what it's all about. So I went to, yeah, I mean, I've got, that's what I did. I know this isn't, this isn't crazy. This isn't, maybe it's not even worth talking about. It's just a development for me because I'm, I am... Try. I mean, I already live pretty cheaply because I'm like a neat and borderline hikikomori, so I don't really go outside or spend money frivolously on a lot of things. I mean, my main expenses are just bills, taxes, and uh, food. Um, but, you know, if I can get that... The thing is, every every penny I can save is extra time I can survive as a neat. So it's important. It is. I need to, and I at first living alone after my mom died, I wasn't that good at managing my money. I wasn't terrible at it. It's not like I went out and spent loads and loads of money, but I did spend pretty frivolously, from from my standards. And so I've been lowering and lowering and trying to get more and more responsible with my spending, over time, and uh, now we're getting there. When I went outside the other day, I know, a terrible mistake, but when I did that, I, uh, I saw a guy on the bus, I, I don't want to, I feel like, okay, I don't want to participate in cringe culture, because it's, it's evil, I just want to point out a guy that I saw on the bus, and how well this particular person fit into stereotypes, and how that's notable, I will then follow that up by noting myself and remember I'm not calling this guy cringe he is probably happier than all of us combined okay this guy probably lives a very fulfilling life he was with a group of friends on the bus he was with uh, another guy and and a girl um so you know this guy's got a he's he's doing well and I wish him nothing but the best in life, okay? I just want to preface all of this. I, I didn't feel any cringe. I don't want anyone else to cringe at this. I I just think it's funny how how 
stereotype. Okay, so this guy gets on, and he is the epitome of Reddit. Like, all of the memes and images of how, like, a stereotypical Redditor looks, like, it was crazy seeing this type of guy in the wild. Because I thought they went extinct. I thought they went extinct, like, four or five years ago. So, he had, first of all, overweight, which, nothing wrong with that. I'm also a bit overweight. He's He was more overweight than me, but fine, you know. Uh, so, overweight. Then, he looked like a soy jack. Like, exactly, he looked like a soy jack. So, he was, like, balding, uh, which, again, I'm balding too, so respect to all my brothers. Balding, short beard, patchy, the the glasses, you know, it, exact soy jack face. Okay, the, the, the exact, so he just had the exact soy jack face, like... Like, no exaggeration. It was exactly... The the resemblance was uncanny. Then, he had a t-shirt on with the logo for Captain America Civil War. And then he was wearing cargo pants. Baggy cargo pants. And to top it all off, he had a wallet chain. This guy... It, I mean, the only way it could have been better was if he was literally wearing a fedora. Like, I've never seen anyone... Or or if he had, like... I mean, the Marvel t-shirt is pretty bad. It's arguably worse. If he had the, the, the Zelda Triforce t-shirt, it might have been more stereotypical. But, I mean, the Marvel t-shirt is pretty, pretty bad. So, yeah. I just... I just... I just spotted the epitome of reddit i i almost felt like going up to him and asking him do you use reddit because that would have just been really funny i was thinking i wonder what would happen if i asked him when does the narwhal bacon but the thing is i think that reference is like too old now like too ancient like that's a reference like 10 years ago (laughs) i don't think anyone even i mean it was cringy for that but like I I say it was cringe. I don't know if it was that cringe. The internet was a different place. Humor was different. Okay. Um. Yeah. If you don't know, yeah, many Zoomers in my audience probably don't know. So there was a it was an old old ancient meme that uh, redditors uh, could identify each other in the wild in a subtle way by asking the, you ask the question when does the narwhal bacon and you're supposed to reply at midnight uh, to confirm that you're a member of the secret club known as Redditors. <laughs> uh, but I thought that was, you know, I just imagined doing this because there's no way I'm going to actually talk to another human being. Also, I'm sure this guy is a perfectly nice guy with a happy life. So there I was, judging him. And meanwhile, I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there, crusty unwashed, right, stinky, wearing a nuclear war now t-shirt with, uh, like, stains on it, like, mustard stains on it, (laughs) and fucking sweatpants, because I didn't even bother to change, and then, like, big boots, because it was the first shoes that I had, big brown leather steel cap boots that are, that are not even done up properly, because it takes too long, you know, I, and I'm also, you know, balding and scruffy beard. I could pass for a soy jack if I wanted to. I'm not wearing the glasses, but if I if I got some glasses and put them on, I could, I could make a pretty solid soy jack. I feel like, so you know, it's a bit pot calling the kettle black there. You know, I feel like it's a. I I this is this is all I'm saying. Right? I wanted to get this segment out of the way, to try and point this thing out, but without participating in cringe culture, because I hate cringe culture, um, and I think in doing so, I've removed all of the humor from the bit, and instead I've just gone, I went on the bus and there was a guy, and, and he was wearing clothes, he was wearing clothes, so I feel like I've kind of, uh, ruined this, this, this bit now, 
you know, I actually recommend that, that you, you guys try and do this. Instead of, like, okay, so Raspberry Pis and single board computers in general are, like, ridiculously overpriced these days. They're no longer worth it. When I got my Raspberry Pi, it cost me, like, 20-something quid. I don't even remember. It was very cheap. I bought it in a shop on a whim just with cash that I had in my wallet because it, it was that cheap. There is zero reason to buy a Raspberry Pi in 2023. I genuinely recommend, even if you don't necessarily need it, <laughs> go on like eBay and look look up laptop and just sort by, you can sort by RAM size and just pick like two or three gigs, right? Like super low end. And you can find hundreds of these laptops that are like, I mean, they're all under a hundred quid. Many of them are being sold for under 50 quid that I'm seeing here. Like these things are super, super cheap. Some of them I'm sure don't work. I mean, look through them yourself, but you can find these super cheap second-hand low-spec laptops. And that's basically what a Raspberry Pi is, but better. Uh, because it has a keyboard and a monitor. And I, better I.O. probably. Uh, you know, it has it has all of these things that a Raspberry Pi doesn't have. Uh, so you're actually getting a whole usable computer rather than just a, a thing. Right? And I'm, I bet if you just look up like computer let me just look up computer uh, with with uh let me see two gigs of ram see what it gives me that is that is not what i'm looking for okay yeah i'm like seeing like these towers this one's seven pounds intel atom pc never heard of it comes with Windows 10, bro, there's no shot you're running Windows 10 on this thing, it's not gonna happen, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you can find, the point is, you go on eBay, you sort by, like, low RAM, you can find these super cheap low-spec computers very easily, uh, I'm sure if you look around, you can find, like, really good, ridiculously good deals, uh, and I recommend getting one and just messing around with it, because they're fun, they're cool, Computing, like, these days where we we never really compute within limitations. We, the only time that you probably ever notice that your computer has limitations is running, like, modern video games at high settings. Which is something you shouldn't be doing anyway, because those games all suck. Uh, the thing is, they already figured out video games. Uh, it's, called, it's called fucking Quake, motherfucker. They already figured that shit out. Why are they still making them? I have no idea. I, I don't understand it at all. I don't know why they're still making them. They already figured games out. They already figured out how to do it. But then they stopped for some reason. It was weird. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway. I'm just having fun right now. Fucking messing around on my low spec ass thing. And it's cool. I'm I'm tired. Uh, open BSD, comfy, on an old laptop, I mean, the thing is, I don't, I can't tell how overkill I'm going with this stuff, you know, um, by which I mean, like, I'm, I'm using everything lowest possible spec, because when I use, like, I mean, the main thing I'm gonna do on a laptop is browsing the web, let's be honest with each other here, uh, yeah. I actually made a video about this. I'm considering whether or not to post it, though. I, I think I might try making it again, making it a bit snappier. I'm not sure if I'm happy with how the video came out, because it's just like a one-take Jake uh, phone recording. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I'm, I've got a GUI. I've been, I'm using a CWM for the first time, because it just comes with, with OpenBSD. Uh, and, uh, so far, I'm liking it. I'm liking it a lot, actually. It's quite nice. It's a really nice, um, middle ground between, uh, sort of keyboard-focused tiling window manager versus a floating window manager. 
because this is like a keyboard focused floating window manager or stacking window manager uh it has you know instead of workspaces it has groups but that basically functions like workspaces i don't even have a bar like i don't even have like an, a status bar at the bottom i'm just i'm just raw dogging it uh I partially because I haven't bothered to set it up, but also because I don't really like all I need a status bar to do. Normally, what I have on my status bar is like which workspace I'm on, uh, the time and date, and then like a CPU usage graph or some some CPU usage information. But uh, time, I have X clock. If I want to check the time, I could just I could just open X clock. Um, uh, the workspace, I don't need, I can just know, I can just use my brain. I don't think I've ever actually been, like, confused as to which workspace I'm in. Like, I just, you just know which one you're in. You just know, you just, like, you don't, it's not even like you just have to remember it. There's not even any remembering. You just already know it. Um, and then, uh... I don't, <laughs> see, on the X60, you don't need a CPU usage monitor, because you can just listen to how loud the fan is. <laughs> Unironically, literally, the, the most efficient CPU monitor in, in, on an X60 is just using your ears to listen to how loud the fan is. You don't need to know, because that will tell you. Uh, so I don't really need a bar. Um, but yeah, super comfy. Um, using Dillo as my main web browser, which is always an experience in the modern, the modern web, because it's, it's very, I mean, I, I, unlike Alpine, Cute Browser actually works, um, so that's nice, I have Cute Browser installed, but it is just painfully slow, I mean, it is painfully fucking slow. Uh, so I have ended up going with Dillo, again, just like I was on Alpine. I mean, it's the same computer, nothing's changed about it, it's gonna be slow no matter what. Did I even tell you why I installed this? Alpine just broke, as in, like, the internet broke. Like, it would, even with, with Ethernet plugged in, it wouldn't, it wouldn't connect to the internet. Oh, I just realized why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is probably not even that hard to fix. Oh, well, I actually, I prefer OpenBSD because it actually works. It's comfier somehow. Something about it just feels, I mean, I would never have, inst I, I, I'll tell you what it is about it that feels comfier. It's actually CWM that feels comfier. And I would never have used CWM on Alpine or if I hadn't installed this. Uh, CWM's super comfy. So, uh, yeah, I'm actually okay with this. As much as the I disagree with the cuck license of, of BSDs, um, they're good software. Um, yeah, I'm I'm keeping it very unfancy, keeping it extremely unfancy. I'm still using Xterm with the the default theme. I haven't even changed that. I don't want to. I'm keeping it white with black text, uh, for that for that retro feel. Yeah, I've got I've got keybinds and stuff for for, for CWM, but nothing crazy. Uh, I did make it actually a slight mistake, which is I installed D menu, without realizing that you don't actually need it. CWM comes with its own program launcher, um, so I'm I need to see how well that works. Well, I've I've used it quite a lot, but um, the problem with the program launcher is it doesn't have like tab completion or anything, so you have to always type out. Oh, it also doesn't launch certain programs. So it's it's it hasn't really worked out super well for me <laughs> using that program launcher. So I'm I'm gonna just use D menu for 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 now. Uh. Uh. What else? Something else I was gonna say. Uh, I don't remember. Been been experimenting with like BBSs and and text boards, because I'm you know I've I've come to the conclusion that the the Twitter dying thing is just not gonna happen. Like my theory is that. Like, firstly, Twitter dying doesn't really matter to me, and I don't really know why I was freaking out about it. Um, YouTube da banning ad blockers is a much more significant development for me. Uh, 
Twitter, I, I barely even use Twitter. Like I, I probably spend like, like I, I, I'll tell you how I feel about this. The thing everyone's freaking out about this, like rate limiting. I've been using Twitter every day since that was implemented and I've never hit my limit. I've never gotten rate limited. So clearly I'm not looking at like, I don't know, the, all of these fucking Twitter addicts are complaining about nothing. Like get off the fucking site. What are you doing? What looking at like 6,000 posts a day? That's insane. Look at fewer posts. Just <laughs> go touch grass. Uh, yeah, who cares? I don't know. In, in, kind of insane. Kind of insane. Um, so yeah, I don't know why, but I think it, it's obviously notable that Twitter is dying in, in terms of like as a historic event. Um, but it doesn't actually affect me. Uh, but I, w I would like to, you know, there was a, a time when I was, or not that long ago, I was, I was, I sort of go through phases with this, this stuff, this sort of low fidelity, low spec computing, small internet, web zero stuff. Well, I'll get really into it for a while, and then I get bored and go back to not being interested. And then I get really into it again, and then get, like, it kind of goes in waves like that. Uh, and right now I'm in one of these phases where I'm very interested in it. Um, yeah, oh, there's a bunch of people in the Denpa web ring. I don't know if any of you are listening to this, but uh, some of you don't have RSS on your websites. Uh, please do that. Please add RSS to your, your, your personal websites. It's very useful. It's very simple to use. Um, you, you can set it up in 15 minutes. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, using Dillo, it really just highlights how much of the modern web is, like, not the, the content, right? Like, how much of it is 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 fucking bullshit that adds nothing to the experience uh, especially i've been using the frog find um search engine which is just a it's basically a, a duck duck go scraper that uh i don't know if it's a scraper or if it's actually using the api i don't know but it's a it uses duck duck go but it, it like uh takes only the text, it's like text only, but like a simple HTML, um, and then when you actually click a web page, it will then render that web page in simple HTML, using like, if you ever used Firefox, you know, Firefox has this like reader mode, the Mozilla reader, I think it's called, um, so, and that like strips out all of the fancy stuff from the page, it uses that to, but then it takes that, like, just the the, the t main text body and then simplifies that even more, removing, like, all the CSS. So it's just plain HTML. Um, and, it, I mean, it makes the web actually kind of good. The only problem is how many websites it breaks, which is, like, not their fault. It's these fucking modern, bloated-ass bullshit websites that are the problem. Like, this, it's doing the absolute best it can to to be as usable as possible. It's, it's, it's not, yeah, it's actually an amazing, an amazing thing. Uh, yeah, it's like back in the days of the internet. It's like I'm on Netscape Navigator. Um, and that's nice. But yeah, I've also been, I'm trying to look into some BBSs to, to hang out in. I mean, I'm saying I'm looking into them. I already know a bunch. Uh, but I'm looking for some slightly more hardcore ones, you know, because I'm on, well, I don't know. Those are kind of boring to talk about. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking like that's kind of the peak, right? Like who needs images? <laughs> who needs them? Who needs images? Like, like, yeah, I, I'm ha I have all sorts of ideas in my brain. Uh, yeah, also looking, I mean, I need to go see if Gemini's gotten good yet, as in the protocol's fine, but as in like the people on Gemini, I wonder if they've gotten like interesting yet. <laughs> None of them are very interesting people. I, 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 I'm... I need to check and see if any of them have become interesting yet. Uh, that's my technology update. 
it's great. I'm having a great time. <sighs> Man, I had a fucked up breakfast because I had I I ran out of ingredients, so I had to improvise. It tasted like shit. Uh, fuck, I need to go shopping today, probably, which is annoying. Um, very boring, very boring mundane uh, segment. We'll, we'll stop it there. You ever wondered what imitation crab is? Because I just did. I was like, what the hell is that stuff? It turns out, so you don't have to Google it. It turns out it's basically just fish sausage. It's just ground up cheap white fish, normally pollock and similar stuff. It's basically just an emulsion, like like exactly like a normal sausage. I I watched a How It's Made video. They even used the same gear as I've seen sauce like industrial sausage manufacturers use. Uh, they put ice cube like there's a there's a Brad Leone It's Alive episode where he goes to a sausage factory, and it, like it's the same machines. It's basically just a fish sausage. Um, with some, like, you know, extra flavorings and preservatives in it, and then they just paint it. They just use, like, a, a, a fucking food coloring to make it look pink, but really it's, like, gray. Um, so that's what imitation crab is. It's great. I love that stuff. That stuff's great. I should get some. It's cheap as fuck. I found out that Emp Lemon has a second channel where he talk, sort of does like ranty vlogs in his car, much like this channel actually. Um, and it, I'm ashamed to tell you, or I'm not ashamed. I am. Uh, what is what's the word? I'm. I'm sorry to have to be the one to inform you of this, but he actually has some bad opinions, unfortunately. Uh, one of which is he's 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 he doesn't like ad block. He he made a big rant against Lewis Rosman's pro ad block video i didn't watch the whole thing because i've already heard every i mean he makes some really bad arguments in that video but uh i i just want to like look I, I don't imagine anyone in my fan base is not using ad block to watch youtube i recommend going further i recommend invidious uh but like let's just get one thing very clear because this is just something I, I, I want to remind you of because there are many, many people who have a lot of money riding on the fact that you don't remember this obvious fact, which is that when you view a web page, it is rendering on your computer. You're not like tapping into some mystical energy to transport yourself over to the server. Your computer is downloading information from someone else and then displaying it on your computer. Everything that you're seeing might be retrieved from a server somewhere, but it is happening on your machine. And therefore, you have every right and all authority over what the fuck happens to it, because it's on your machine. So if you, anyone who tries to change this is actively hostile. They are trying to literally steal your computer. Because they they are taking a part of it. They're saying, "Oh no! Even though this is happening on your computer, we own it. We get to decide how it displays, what it does, etc." D- I mean, it's it's this is a, a violation of your property rights. Uh, it's a violation of your 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 digital sovereignty, your personal sovereignty. It's it's fucked. Don't let them do it. Don't let anyone kid you into believing that that it's someone else's stuff when you're rendering a web page. It's not someone else's stuff. It's your stuff. It's on your computer. You should have ultimate control over it. You do have ultimate control over it. It's not even a should. It's literally rendering on your computer. You can't not have... You can literally go into... You can go to any website, just just fucking left-click and, and click, you know, inspect element and change anything you want to because it's happening on your computer. So if anyone... This is just something really important to remember this, because I feel like somehow there's, there's like, all this money riding on this idea that it's other people's stuff. It's not. It's your stuff. You get control over it. I need a feature in my anime list that tells me not just if I dropped a show or finished a show, 
or whatever. Sorry, excuse me. Just gotta plug that in. Okay. Is that working? Yeah, that's working. Not just if I dropped or finished or put on hold or planned to watch the show or whatever. I needed to tell me when I did that. Because if I dropped the show six years ago, you know, my <laughs> I have no idea what I was fucking thinking. I used to write a little note next to every show I dropped. Maybe I should go back and do that. I've dropped hundreds of shows, though. Let me see if I can fucking do that. I, I don't know if I can... How many shows... Oh my god, I've dropped 300 shows. I don't think I could go back and watch every single show that I've dropped. Why did I drop Koregawa Tashi no Goshi Jinsama? Wait, what the fuck is happening? Why did I drop this and give it a 4? It was a fine... There was, oh, I remember why, vaguely. What I remember is that the, the, the main girl is just constant... Like, doesn't do anything other than shout the entire show. Other than that, I thought it was good. I remember thinking... I, I Why did I drop this on an episode 11 out of 12? What the fuck is wrong with me? Like, I wonder this about myself. Why do I do these things? I could have just watched one more episode of this show and finished it, and it would have been fine. And I remember watching the show and thinking, like, it's a very basic premise... It's a very basic, like, plot for a show, but it's made, I remember looking it up, like, it, it was made by a bunch of, like, very competent people. So it, like, looks good, it's generally, like, well-written, even though it's a very basic show. And I remember kind of liking it, so I'm like, why did I drop it? I thought I finished it. I'm pretty sure it's because I had a headache, <laughs> and I didn't want to listen to this girl shouting, because she just doesn't do anything other than shout. Like, honestly, it makes, it's like... It's it's the worst thing about the show. It's so annoying. Like, other than that, it's uh it's well it's well made and well put together. So I don't. Yeah, I don't I don't fucking know, man. That's the sort of shit that I'll drop stuff for. It's just because like oh I had a headache and I didn't want to watch the last episode where someone was just shouting. I could have just not dropped it. I could have just like watched it later or something. I don't know. I don't know, man. Like what? Why did I drop all of these things? Let me see. What what have I dropped here? I mean, that makes sense. I, 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 this will make sense to me. I want to give that another try. Um, okay, I vaguely remember why I dropped a lot of these. Most of them, most of them I dropped because I just sort of, like, the, the general situation is that, like, I'm watching a show, it could go either way, and then I'm just like, yeah, not really in the mood to give this show, like, the benefit of the doubt for another six episodes, you know? Because most anime, just like most everything, is kind of mid, right? It's kind of okay. Um, and so in all, it's like, if something's not immediately grabbing me, but is also not terrible, I have to, while I'm watching it, give it credit in order to keep watching it. I have to be like, do you guys understand what I'm saying? Like, does this make sense to anyone? Like, let's say, uh... Let me pick a random thing that I dropped at some point that I think fits this. Uh... Maybe... Let me see. Uh, Rosario to Vampire. No, that's, that's, that one actually is bad. <laughs> Sorry for all the Rosario to Vampire fans. I, I know some of you must still exist. Some of you may have, like, somehow continued to exist from, from the year 2008 until now. Um, let's say, hmm, I won't, you know, what? I'm going to sort by, by episodes watched. So I want to, I want to, like, find one that I got, like, semi- into and then dropped. Uh, Zero no Tsukaima. That's a perfect one. Like Zero no Tsukaima is not a good show, um, but I also I don't think it's like the worst thing I've ever seen. Right. So you get nine episodes into it and then you just run out of like ability to give it the benefit of the doubt and give it credit. Like you have to actively ignore the fact that it's mid to keep watching it. And at a certain point, you just run out of energy to do that, because you're like, you, d does this make sense? It's like you get, you're watching Zero no Tsukaima, and it's like, it's not really very funny, 
um, the main girl is like mid. It doesn't look amazing. The storyline is basically non-existent. But it's not like offensive in any way. Like there's nothing that like the jokes may not be very funny, but they're also not like super, you know, cringe to the point where it's painful to watch. The animation might not be amazing, but it's also not terrible. It's just average. The character designs are pretty good. The art design in general is pretty good. The voice acting is pretty good. Um, some of the characters have unique gimmicks or personalities. Uh, the setting is like semi interesting. So like, there's some good stuff. There's some bad stuff. It's mid. It it you know it's 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 middling of middling quality. Uh, and so you're watching it and you're like, there are plenty of shows that are of a similar quality that I have finished. And there are plenty of shows that are of a similar quality that I've dropped. And that's that's the sort of situation where you end up watching, like, nine episodes of a show and then giving up. Uh, Anne Happy, another good example of this. Like, Anne Happy, not, not my favourite show. Pretty boring, to be honest. Um, but also, like, nothing egregious and kind of an interesting premise. Uh, but it's like, you, you get halfway through the show... Or more, and you just run out of goodwill. Like, you're watching the show purely on... Because I'm like, it's a Moe show, it's a slice of life, it's a cute girls doing cute things. It's a, it's about, like, I like the premise, even though I don't like any of the characters. The art design in general, including the characters, is pretty bland. Uh, the comedy falls flat most of the time. In fact, almost all of the time. Uh, so it's like... And, and, yeah, it's just generally kind of boring. But, you know, it's got this goodwill from being in a genre I like. From a studio that I have a weird interest in. Which is Silverlink. Because I'm, like, weirdly... I'm, like, weirdly passionate about Silverlink. Because they just... They never make anything good. <laughs> But they also rarely make anything terrible. They're one of these studios that, like, I feel like no one cares about. Um, and they've been around, like, for for a while. Does this make any sense? It's like, I, I, I find Silverlink as a studio to have an aspect of Moe about them. Where it's like, I kind of want them to succeed. They're kind of like underdogs. They make a lot of, like, really niche uh, shows of, like, meddling to low quality. Like, like, 2-car, for example, or, uh, I don't know, fucking, what else have they made? Uh, what is this? Tayutama, you know? I should finish Tayutama. I didn't hate Tayutama. I thought it was kind of fine. I should probably finish that show. But then they've made a couple of shows that have popped off, like, they did the Wataten adaptation, which was pretty good. Um... They did Yuri Kumarashi. They did Chivalry of a Failed Night. <laughs> Chivalry of a Failed Night. That's a pretty good show. I like that show. Um, you know, I kind of... But they've also... Oh, they also did Mitsuboshi Colors, which is great. I, I fucking love Mitsuboshi Colors. And um, uh, the one that sounds like Bofa, Bofuri. So, you know, they've made some good shows. They've also made some bad shows. Like... Uh, let me see, what bad shows have they made? Oni Eye? Look, I'm a massive Syscon, but I could not get through all of Oni Eye. It's pretty bad. Uh, what else? Uh, Anne Happy, obviously, I already mentioned. I mean, Tuko is not a good show. <laughs> Tuko is not a good show. Uh, fucking Death March to the Parallel World Rhapsody. Everyone hates that. Sonohara san, uh, Sonohara Sono Kandarin san, the Kandarin san. That's a kind of weird show to call anime. Um, or I guess it's like on a show to anime. I, I've watched like a bit of that. It, it, it was, yeah, it was pretty bad. <laughs> uh, they also, they made a show called Circlet Princess, which no one seems to have watched. That's pretty funny. So, you know, I kind of have this Moe to Studio Silverlink where I, I kind of, uh, that, I mean, I call them the 6 out of 10 studio. Like, everything they make is like a 5 to a 6 out of 10. Um, and I kind of like that. I kind of like that about them because they're, they're fulfilling a niche. 
So I was like, it's got some goodwill going in. It's it's about, you know, the premise is interesting to me. I like the premise. Uh, the fa- And the fact that it's in a genre I like, but a studio I like. So that's enough to carry me through eight episodes. <laughs> but, and the show, again, it's not offensively bad. But you know what I'm, did, like, am I making sense here? What I'm saying, like, it's kind of a... I think I drop way more shows than most people. Because I'm influ like, since I got into anime, basically via Digibo, I consider it to be normal to just drop shows out of nowhere. Um, I feel like most people either just sit through everything, or just only watch stuff that they're interested in. But I'm interested in bad, middling, pulpy shows. But often not interested enough to finish them. <laughs> in my Discord server, which you can find a link to in the description, I added an alpha test for the forum feature that Discord has. Uh, to test it out, see if it would be good. Personally, I think it is good. I like this forum setup. Not because of Discord. But because I think having all the people in my Discord in a forum is sick. Like, I like it. I'm posting there. No one else seems to care about it, but I like it. No one else seems to... Well, a few people are posting. But all I'm saying is, if I can, if I can get this into a, a thing, if I can push the forum section harder, what if we just migrate over to an actual forum... And then we can leave this shitty world behind, and we can have the based no thank you forum instead of a, you know, a Discord. I mean, the Discord probably won't disappear or anything, but forums are cool. I have nothing against going to the dentist. Like, I'm not one of those people that gets scared going to the dentist. I know uh, it, it makes sense. It's a weird experience. I don't. I, I'm. I have zero fear of dentists. However. I do have a dislike of them as people, <laughs> because they don't seem to know how to do their jobs very well. Like, for example, one time, uh, there was this one dentist I went to, and was just like, oh my god, you've got shit stuck in your teeth, you need to cl-, like, really insulting tone, right, telling me to clean, and then went in there with a pick, like, like a, a dentist pick, and just started, like, literally going at my gums. On the inside side of my teeth, I, 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 I've still got like a little weird, like, I don't know what it is, like a scar there or something. Because she just started like picking at my gums. Like it wasn't even food, there was nothing there. I could see and it just started bleeding. Like she clearly just fucked up and like misidentified like part of my gums as like food. And then was like too, like trying to save face by not admitting it, and just doing permanent damage to my mouth, and, like, while it was a pretty minor thing, you know, it's, it's still, uh, pretty fucking annoying, um, and then, there's other aspects to it, so, um, for example, uh, I have, like, receding gums, sort of, like, like, kind of minor, but I can just tell, like, I can just feel it, right, And so I go to the dentist, they never pick up on it. This has been happening for years now, they never pick up on it. So then I mention, I'm like, hey, are my gums okay? First time I did this, she was like, "Uh, yeah, I guess they look alright. And then she she took another look and she was like, yeah, maybe don't brush so hard. Uh, You're brushing too hard. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll brush less hard. I go back, you know, the next time I go to a checkup. Again, she doesn't mention it. I say like, "Hey, I I think my gums are like receding, in some of my some parts," and she's like, "Ah, yes, uh, it's because you're you're not brushing with uh, the gums well enough. You need to brush the gums harder." But the last time I went there, she was like, "Don't brush. The, you're brushing them too hard. Now I'm not brushing them hard enough. Doesn't make any goddamn sense." And then she prescribes me this stuff, which is called Corsadil, and I've looked this up. Of course, it's this mouthwash. It's supposed to be, like, a special mouthwash. But it, like, I don't know why dentists love giving you this shit. It tastes awful. 
but I've looked it up, like I've done research. There is absolutely zero evidence that these that particular type of mouth, medicated mouthwash, I forget what the chemical in it is called, that that is any more effective or really has any different properties to just regular plain old mouthwash. There is zero evidence to suggest it. It, it doesn't exist. They all do this, they all love prescribing this stuff, it doesn't do anything. It literally doesn't do anything and it leaves a horrible taste in your mouth for hours. For like, well maybe not hours, but like an hour after you, you use it. It leaves this horrible disgusting taste in your mouth, even though there's zero evidence that it's actually uh, good for anything. They just don't do anything is what I'm saying. These fucking dentists. One time, so I have, a, I knocked my tooth out when I was a, a kid, play, uh, um, bowling. I fell over bowling. I know, it's a weird fucking way to lose a tooth. I fell, I fell over bowling and smashed my face against the bowling ball and knocked my front tooth out. Uh, <clears throat> and so I have a fake one. Um, and, you know, it started to get loose once, and so the doctors were like, or the dentists, they were like, oh, it looks like it's getting kind of loose, we'll have to, like, replace it, or whatever. And I thought they'd have some clever way to, like, remove it, but no, they, they just got a, literally a chisel, a hammer and a chisel, and just started fucking hammering at my teeth. And it, like, permanently fucked up the tooth next to it. Like, I can't really describe in what way it's fucked up, but I can just feel it. Like, ever since then, something about its position in my mouth has been, like, weird and fucked up. Um, and then they gave me a, they gave me one, they were like, ah, but the, uh, current evidence suggests that actually you're supposed to do just a half bridge. So what I have is a bridge, which means on the back of the tooth, it's glued to the two teeth next to it with a little bit of metal. Um, so the first one I got was a double bridge, right, so it's glued to both teeth. Then they were like, ah, but the new research suggests it has to be only glued to one tooth better that way so then they glued it to only one tooth and that one lasted like only three years before it like fell out <laughs> i don't even remember how it fell out i i i think um fuck i actually don't remember what happened but i, I yeah it fell out and that's why if you go back in this channel you can find like a period of time where i just was missing a front tooth for ages because i couldn't be bothered to get a new one because it cost a bunch of money um so yeah, and it, it fell out after like three years, which is ridiculous, it's supposed to last like ten, five to ten years. Um, and then the next time I went in, they were like, oh yeah, why did they do only a single bridge, they're supposed to do it on both sides. And now I have this one that's on both sides, and that, it's not, it's not even, it's been like, what, three years I think at least by now, maybe longer, I don't even remember when I got it, maybe four, um, and it's not even slightly loose. So I don't know what fucking idiotic advice they had to, to glue it only to one side. So these fucking dentists, like, they still haven't dealt with my gums. I can feel them being fucked up. Like, I can feel that they, they like, hurt sometimes and shit. And I brush my teeth fairly well. You know, I'm not the best. Sometimes I miss, miss a time. But, like, I'd say I'm pretty average in terms of, like, taking... I mean, I don't really floss enough, but who does? You know, it's not too bad. Uh, these fucking dentists, they just, they, they love, like, putting, anytime something goes wrong, they blame their patient. Like, I've never going to a normal doctor or normal nurses, like, can you imagine if you, like, broke your leg and your doctor just sat you down and berated you for, for breaking your leg? Like, can you, can you imagine? It's insane the way dentists work. Like, can you actually, okay, so you have some problem with any other part of your body. You, like, you break your leg, for example, right? And the doctor sits you down and is like, well, you really shouldn't go skateboarding. You knew, we, we as doctors advise you not to do this, you know? We, like, hold on a minute, what are you, my fucking mom? Like, what, are you, you're not, what is going on? You're not my parents? Why are you fucking, like, that wouldn't happen. But if you go to the dentist and they find something wrong with your teeth, they will sit you down and be like, how dare you not floss? How dare you not do this, like, th the fucking 45 minute long old care routine twice a day then then no one in the history of the world has ever actually done and has no evidence of actually being good how dare you this is your fault making me do the job i'm being paid for you're making me do the fucking job i'm being paid for how could you it's ridiculous these fucking guys they're insane 
Uh, hey, let me prescribe you this mouthwash, which doesn't do anything and is m medically proven to not do anything. Um, and, and mouthwashes in general are like a controversial subject. It's weird the disconnect between what you read in papers, because, I, you know, I, I'm a nerd. I, like, read papers. I go on Google Scholar. I'm not claiming to be an expert, but I'm capable of going... I, I am, like... Minimum requirements to be a human in the world, I feel like, is being able to, like, use Google Scholar to look things up. And I've looked these things up over time. And, like, there's actually, like, a lot of active discussion in the, like, dentist community, <laughs> academia, of, like, whether mouthwash is even worth it. Because, like, the benefits from mouthwash aren't that great, and they have been shown to, like, increase risk of oral cancers multiple times. And like dry out your mouth in ways that are like bad for your mouth. I don't really, I don't really understand it. But like, this isn't like some niche thing. Like, there's an active debate going on. I mean, maybe I, I, but I, I haven't looked this up in a few years, so maybe the, the research has come down on one side by now. But yeah, last time I checked, you know, it wasn't like, like even something as simple as using mouthwash is relatively controversial. Uh, like they have no fucking clue what they're doing. It's a it's a shitty and th the worst part is, almost all of it is just purely cosmetic surgery or like cosmetic stuff. Like it's all just these. I think it's like very Foucault. <laughs> like this whole situation is very Foucault, right? Like you have this 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 biopower medical establishment professional who's like an authoritarian figure, a disciplinary figure who's going to discipline you for not taking care of your body to their standards and literally sit you down and punish you while you have to pay for it. Uh, you know, just to also be incompetent. It's very Foucault, I feel like. Uh, yeah, I need to go to the dentist again, is what I'm saying. I took, I'm i thinking about this because I, I just remember when I need to book a dental checkup. Ah, <sighs> man. Fucking dentist, man. These bastards. Yesterday, I played a bit of Team Fortress 2, as I usually do. I didn't do super well. Um, what percentage of that was me versus team balance? You know, it's always a contentious issue in a team game. I'm, I'm saying, you know, it felt like at the time... I was just having a frustrating time, and I wasn't even doing that bad. Like, I wasn't bottom scoring or anything. I was just, like, the bottom half of the scoreboard for, like, four games in a row. And losing consistently. For stuff that, like... I'm, yes, part of it was frustration in my team. Like, why aren't you pushing? You know? Like, this is something that I never understand. Is... My problem has always been, in every video game, that I'm too aggressive. In CSGO, I was too aggressive... In TF2, I'm also too aggressive. Like, I don't have the fucking patience to sit there and wait. I am going to push no matter what. <laughs> Even when it's a terrible idea, I'm going to push. I'm trying to get better at that. But, you know, I, I, like, I like to push. I like to get aggressive. I'm a very aggressive game player. Very aggressive player. So it's very, like, that's my problem in video games. Like, when I was first learning TF2, the first thing I had to learn was okay, don't charge directly into a group of enemies, you're going to die. Um, because I would, that's my instinct for some reason. And so it's very strange to me to see that apparently the entire rest of the TF2 uh, you know, user base hates the idea of pushing into danger and would rather just sit there and let the cart roll back for no reason, you know, or, or just let them take the point. <laughs> Like, it's very strange to me. I don't understand it. Like, the amount of people who are comfortable just just not pushing. Why? Why aren't you pushing? Your life isn't that valuable unless you're a medic. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Okay, if you're a medic or an engineer or a spy, fine. But every other class, literally, what are you doing if you're not pushing? Like, I seriously, you're just standing there. You can't be of any help. I don't understand. So sometimes you get teams that are just like, you're on last. All it would take is just for everyone to just decide to push. It doesn't even need to be like, yeah, obviously, ideally, we would have comms. We'd have a medic who would be saying like, okay, I have Uber charge and, uh, you know, I'm 80% I'm Uber charge. And then we push together. 
or something. That would be great if we lived in that fantasy world. We do not live in that fantasy world. We live in the real world where what should happen is people should just generally be pushing. And then when you get an Uber, it will work out. Because eventually, the way, the way respawns work is people respawn in waves. So if everyone just throws themselves at the objective willy-nilly, eventually they'll all start respawning at the same time, and it turns into a coordinated push. And the reason I know that this can happen is because every single game like gets to overtime, and somehow everyone decides, oh, we could have pushed the entire time. We just chose not to. And sometimes those pushes work, the pub push as it's known, and sometimes they don't. But what's strange is, you could, I know, I've been with you the whole time, you could have been doing this at any moment, and I've been the only one that's playing aggressive. Why? So that's definitely a problem. But that's not really the main reason I got frustrated yesterday. The main reason I got frustrated yesterday is because I was playing demo, and I wasn't really hitting my pipes, I wasn't really getting many kills, I was getting shut down by really annoying engineers on the other team, like there were just many of them, there were three engineers wrangling, it was very, oh, snipers, actually. There, was th there wasn't three engineers. There was two engineers, both of them were wrangling, which was annoying. But what was really annoying is there was three snipers, and they were just, they were just, they were just pissing me off, man. And we were on Harvest, and they had literally three engineers and three snipers on Harvest. It's like, how anti-fun can you fucking be? Holy shit. I, I got so mad that I was just like, okay, I'm putting the sticky jumper. I'm going to, I died to this sniper. I actually remember the person's fucking name, but I'm not going to say it because that's too far. But this sniper, like, killed me one time too many times. And I was like, okay, it's over for you. And I literally just bullied them until they left. I just I equipped the sticky jumper and uh, the, the, the caber. And then I just f targeted that person for, like, three games in a row until they disconnected. I don't know if I made them disconnect. I don't know what. I don't know if they just happened to leave. But... Uh, yeah, that was uh, <clears throat> probably mean of me, but fuck snipers. You deserve it for playing sniper. Um, oh, I remember why I killed them, actually. It's because I was outside of... I was just, like, uh, for some reason I was doing the, the handshake taunt. Not the handshake taunt. The, the rock, paper, scissors taunt with, a, with a, uh, a, a soldier on the other team. And then this motherfucker just comes out, out of spawn and just jurates me and then, and then kills me. And so that's when I was like, okay, you've gone too far. I'm targeting you for as long as I fucking can. Uh, so that happened. Also, the other thing that happened yesterday is uh, after playing demo, uh, I then got like three games in a row that uh, no one wanted to play medic. So I was the de facto medic. And now look, I, I'm apparently a pretty good medic because I top scored all three games. As Okay, that's not true. I came in the top five all three games in terms of score. I know medic scores can be a little strange, so not the most reliable metric. But I feel like I was fucking doing very well as medic. But the reason wasn't because I was actually doing well as medic. The reason was because, I'm going to be honest, my team was fucking garbanzo. They got better towards the end, but like... How, like, there should, they should have just been players getting more points. It wasn't because I was doing very well. It was because there was no one else doing anything. And so, yeah, I was, I was like, fucking going crazy as medic. And we were still losing because I'm just one medic. What can I do? It was like we were losing really bad. I didn't want to be playing medic. I wanted to be playing demo. But no one would go medic when I switched off. And I was like, well, I either I go demo and we lose, or I go medic and we have at least, like, some chance of winning. So I ended up playing medic. I, it, it was just a bad time. I don't know why I'm ranting about this for so long. That, this is stupid. Excuse, pardon me for ranting for so long. But anyway, it was, it was a very bad, no good uh, TF2 day. And then, so I stopped playing. I was like, I realized I was getting mad. I, I had a moment of self-awareness. I realized that I was mad, and I was like, you know what? I'm just, I'm mad. There's no point in keeping playing, because if I keep playing, it's just going to make me more mad, so I'll stop. I'll stop and go take a break and go calm down. That's a normal thing to do. Why am I mad at a video game? Let's take a break from the video game. So I stop playing for the day. And then I go to sleep, and I fucking dream about TF2. I dream about losing in TF2. I fucking have a dream. I'm in a map that doesn't exist. 
I'm a flying soldier for some reason. I fucking rocket jump into this place. There's a heavy and an engineer waiting for me. And I'm like, okay, if only I can, if I can just get past these guys, I'm good. All I have to do is rocket jump into this room and then, and then rocket jump straight out of the exit and they'll never have time to shoot me. So I try and do that. The fucking NG chases me down and kills me. And then I'm, I get mad. I'm like, God fucking damn it. I could have killed that guy, but I missed my rockets. I don't even play soldier. So it's very realistic. I would have missed my rockets in that situation because I don't play soldier. But, uh, so yeah, then I woke up and I had a burning desire. I was like, today, you know what? I, I'm done. I need to get better at Team Fortress 2. I, if my team is losing, I want to just be the guy that can join and just roll. Right? To fucking bring my team back from the brink. And if it's going to be any class, it's going to be Demo Man. So I need to learn stock and, and actually get good. So I went on TR walkway for, a, I mean, I just, I've just spent all day practicing. I, I, I spent like three hours or maybe like two hours on TR walkway just practicing a, the, sti- the like, like sticky combos where I was like, put a sticky down, launch them into the air and then hit them with a pipe air shot. Uh, like just practicing that over and over and over again for like two hours. And then I was like, okay, let me think, what can I do to practice again? And I remembered that MGE exists. So I played my first game of MGE today. If you don't know what MGE is, if you're not a Team Fortress 2 player, you should you should watch my video called Every Competitive Game Mode in TF2 Explained. Every Competitive Format, I think I actually said, but whatever. You should go watch that video. It's a good video. I put, put a lot of effort into it. Anyway. Um... So MG is a 1v1 game mode that's mainly used for practicing. And I was like, I'm going to go grind some MV- MGE. So I've been playing MGE for like, I don't even know how long. Too fucking long I've been playing MGE. And man, I got to say that shit is intense. But what I've learned is I'm nowhere near as bad as I thought I was. Like I hit my, p- I may not be great with the stickies, but I hit my pipes more often than I'm my opponents do oftentimes like I didn't overall I mean I'm not saying I never died but every time it was a demo man v demo man situation I feel like I was killing them much more than I was dying I I wasn't actually even checking the score I probably should have been but like I I felt like I was killing I I definitely was I I I definitely I mean I hit my pipes I'm a pipe hitter I hit my pipes what can I say If I'm playing Demo Man v Demo Man, I'm hitting pipes. If I'm playing Demo Man vs. Soldier, I'm hitting pipes. Except when that soldier is using the fucking battalion's backup and the black box. Like some sort of bitch. Except even then, I did pretty well against him. I think I did it... Oh yeah, that's not actually what happened. What happened was... um, I've been playing Demo for ages, so the other guy decided to switch switch to class, so I switched class. I I played a bit of a... I don't even know what I played. Oh yeah, I played I played a bit of a spy where we were doing like stabs only, trying to backstab each other. That was kind of silly, kind of fun. And then soldier, but but melee only soldier, like you're only like market gardener only. That was a bit silly. Um <clears throat> and then uh played a bit of scout, scout 1v1s. Um, but, and that's where I got intense, man, scout mains are insane, like, scout MGE is just too, like, it's too intense gaming, there's too many, you're doing too many actions per, per minute, like, I'm not a very good scout player, so it takes a lot of focus for me to just, like, not die, um, and man, that shit was fucking intense, that shit was intense. And then I then he switched back to soldier or someone I was facing. I don't know if it was even the same guy. Someone else joined maybe who was a soldier or he switched. I, I wasn't even paying attention. I was just pure scout gaming. And then it was the scout v soldier. And man, that is an intense matchup. I'm not, I lost to that. I, like I definitely died more times than I killed him. Um, but like I tried my best. 
and then I switched. That's when he started using the battalion's backup and the black box, and that was just fucking annoying. So I, if you don't play TF2, by the way, uh, those are both items that increase your health in certain ways. So um, that loadout is sometimes called the Invincible Soldier. Like it just makes your effective health really, really high. And it's really annoying to play against. Um, so then I ended up switching back to demo. And I rolled him and I smoked him because I hit my fucking pipes. Now look, I'm not, I don't, I have, here's my problem is I have no real idea how good I am at demo man. I just have no idea because the only time I've ever, like comparing myself to competitive players is maybe not fair for a couple of reasons. Playing demo man in sixes versus playing demo man in casual is a totally different experience. Like it's, I mean, any class. Sixes versus casual, it's, it's, a, it's a different game. I mean, I've said this before, it's a completely different game. Like, yeah, your aim and shit is transferable, but it's so different, it's barely comparable. The second thing is, who am I watching play Demo Man, who's a pro? It's, it's fucking Habib, right, who's like probably the best demo in the world. So if I'm comparing myself to Habib, I'm, lo- the, I'm losing every time, that guy's insane. Right? Like, that guy's fucking insane at this video game. So obviously I'm not Habib. But then, I don't know who else to, like, I don't have a good frame of reference, is what I'm getting at here, to know how good I am. I don't know who to watch, how to find out what, like, above average but not the best in the world, casual demo man gameplay looks like like how do i find that where do i go to look at that i don't know that's what i need so i can fucking see how good i am because i have no idea i mean i spec you know other players on my team but i'm dead and they don't seem to do anything too crazy to be honest i almost never see demos popping off on like uncle topia or anything i like normally if someone's popping off it's like it's like a spy main or a sniper main because these fucking annoying bastards or like pocketed heavy, pocketed flog, pyro, uh, NG's stacking last on some particular map, stuff like this, right? Like I actually very rarely see demos popping off, getting crazy kills. It doesn't only it doesn't happen, I just don't see it that often. Like, I, I, I don't remember that many times when I've been playing and I've been like, this fucking demo keeps killing me. Are you serious? It doesn't, like, snipers, yes. Spies, yes. NGs, yes. Uh, you know, pyros even, even without the flog, it happens. Heavies, it happens. NGs, it happens. Like, every other, every, not every other class. Scouts, pretty rare. But, like, I thought I was really bad because in my head I was like, for ages in my head I was like, Scout has like two health. How am I losing a matchup when I'm like deathmatching a Scout in a game? Until I ended up watching like actual Sixes gameplay and realizing, oh, Scout is like supposed to be hard to hit. (laughs) That should have been obvious. But like, yeah, you basically are like, it's really fucking hard matchup. Uh, Which is why I need to practice it more. Sadly, I couldn't convince anyone to go scout versus my demo today. But I'll probably do that, like, tomorrow or something. But I don't even know if it's my, like, raw deathmatching skill that's actually the problem. Like, I feel like it's more... Maybe, maybe it's because I play too aggressively or something. I don't I don't know why I feel like I'm not as good as I want to be at the game. I also feel like I used to be better, which can't possibly be true. Um, so I, I don't know, I need to grind. I just need to grind this game like crazy. And then the problem is, I don't even have, really have anywhere to flex it. Because the only place that plays Sixes pubs is casual TF2's Discord. But I'm not going to be able to do well in any game where I have 140 ping. It's just not happening. And even if I could, you know, I have zero idea how to play Sixes effectively like i just don't fucking know um so yeah sorry rambling about 
fucking TF2 can't be fun to listen to. Um, <clears throat> I also feel like here's just my final little my final message: save the world. I think the Iron Bomber. Sorry, I think the Loose Cannon is like this fucking like hidden crazy good weapon. I have I've had this theory for a while in my head that like if someone decided to like spend 5000 hours playing with the loose cannon only, they would fucking destroy because it can do more damage than stock or the iron bomber or the lock and load, but no one's using the lock and load. Like those all do 100 on hit, a double donk with the the loose cannon does like 130. So it can dish out more, and that's like not an insignificant amount more damage. That it can one shot light classes, um, which is pretty insane. Uh, it, and then it also has the knockback, which makes it really useful for denying Ubers and even just pushing back like like a heavy push or something, like a heavy medic combo. I'm gonna eat a donut now. Yeah, so you got the, the double dunk, which does crazy damage enough to one shot at Scout. It does, uh, and then you get the knockback, which is very useful. It's basically like having an air blast. Like, you can deny Uber, you can uh, push people off the edge of a cliff, uh, you, you can push people into corners. You could, I mean, if someone's getting up close and personal, you can fuck them up, you know. It's it's pretty powerful as a knockback. And then uh as well as that, you've got the the jump you can do with it, the the like misfire jump, whatever it's called. Uh which is just another movement option which is useful always. Um you can do, you could definitely do some very crazy stuff with that. Um cuz it kind of it works like the the um, Beggar's Bazooka, you know, I mean, they're basic, they're very equivalent weapons, they're very similar weapons, um, <clears throat> but the reason people don't use it is because it's too hard, I mean, you have to be really good at predicting movement, it's just, it's just really fucking hard to use, the projectile is harder to aim than stock, because it has a stronger arc, it doesn't, I don't think it fires as fast, maybe it does, I might be wrong, but it has a stronger arc, I feel like it does, maybe I'm wrong, that's just how it feels, um, and then of course you have to time your shot, like, if you don't know anything about TF2, let me explain what the loose cannon is, how do I even explain this, it's basically like, you know, you know in some games you can like, uh, cook grenades by like holding, you hold down like mouse one, to pull out a grenade and then you like hold it up and you can like cook it before you throw it. It's basically like that. So like every other grenade launcher, it launches a grenade that either explodes when it impacts a person or a building, or if it hits the ground or the wall, it just sits there and then explodes after a certain amount of time. But the loose cannon, you have to like time it, you cook it basically. So the, the projectile alone doesn't do that much damage and the explosion alone doesn't do that much damage. But if you time it so that um, you like you cook it for the perfect amount of time so that when you release, the projectile hits someone and then explodes, it, it's called a, a big thing pops up that says double donk and it does like insane damage. So it's just very hard to use. And the second thing is, uh, it's way less effective against buildings than stock, but that shouldn't be a problem because you still have your stickies to use for buildings. Um, so yeah, I feel like it's like got this hidden potential. Oh, and the final problem with it is uh, range. It's it has a much shorter range. Like you, you can't really fire it that far. Um, so you have to. I mean, you're basically very useless up super close or far away. Like you really have to control your spacing if you're using the loose cannon. It's just very hard to use. Like it's hitting people with pipes is already relatively or quite difficult. It's probably the hardest 
weapon to use, or like, pipes are probably the hardest projectile to hit in the game. Like, rockets don't have, have an arc, so, uh, but they, I think rockets travel slower, I'm not sure. I mean, it's not easy, right? You, you have to predict movement plus account for the arc. Um, so it's already difficult. And then when you add the extra challenge of not only do you have to add to account for that, but you also have to try and guess exactly when <laughs> your your weapon will hit them. And like, not just guess that, but time it relatively precisely. Like you have, you have a decent window to hit a double donk, but like the fuse ticks down really fast. So like, it's it's quite difficult to estimate the distance between you and the person in order to time it perfectly. So it's just really hard to use is the big problem. Like, uh, but I feel like if someone really went out there and like tried to master it, I don't know if this is gonna be me, but if someone out there wanted to put in a couple thousand hours to master this weapon, I mean, I feel like you could go fucking crazy with it. I feel like you could you could do do crazy damage and scout mains hate it because it instant kills them. So, uh, yeah, that's always good. Okay, so I went looking for some good uh, casual demo man gameplay and I found uh, Voro Bay. Yeah, I think I'm bad at demo man. <laughs> this guy's fucking insane. How does he hit these pipes? He's hitting air shots like it's nothing. And I don't even understand. How does he know? How does he know where these players are going to go? It's insane. This guy's reads. How does he do it? There'll be a soldier 10 miles up in the air. He'll shoot to his left. I'm like, oh, you missed it. Then the soldier just strafes in the air, air strafe, bugging directly into the pipe. I don't understand how he knows. How does he know? I've seen people hit the clips like that before and I've never understood it. How, like, I guess you can vaguely read, but I don't, I don't even know, man. It's insane. It's insane. This guy's insane. He hits pipes. I feel I hit pipes. This guy hits fucking pipes. Holy shit. He don't miss. He does not miss everything. Just bip bop. Dead. I need to get better. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, he has like a thousand hours on Demo Man alone. He showed it in the video, actually. How much was it? Let me see. Uh, uh, hold on. One second. Um... Okay, well, whatever, I can't find it, but, yeah, he has, like, I, uh, it, over a thousand hours on demo, man. A thousand and eighty-two hours on demo. Okay, should I see how much I have? How do I find that out? How do I find out how much the hours I have on uh, tier two player stats? I mean, I could just queue into a game and it would tell me, but... Yeah, maybe I should see that. Okay, so I have 257 hours of demo experience, so pretty different, pretty different situation, uh, pretty, yeah, pretty different situation there. My least played class is Spy, unsurprisingly. Um... Yeah, my fucking pyro's fucked up my shit, because for some reason it says I have a million damage on... T oh, it has, I don't know how it says that. I, I don't know what that is, but... Yeah. 257.6 hours. So I need, like, four times... I just need to four times more hours than I have right now, and then I'll get good, hopefully. Maybe? Do you think so? It turns out the projectile speed for the loose cannon is actually faster than stock, not slower like I thought. I don't know, it feels slower for some reason, or like at least the same. I, it doesn't feel faster. Like the, the lock and load projectile feels faster. The loose cannon doesn't really feel faster to me. It feels kind of more clunky to aim, which is weird. But that also might explain why like 
that's kind of annoying. <laughs> like, if it had the same speed as stock, or as the the iron... Wait, does the, is the iron bomber faster? I need to look up... I don't know that much about... I just know how they feel. No, it's the same speed as stock, but I feel like the, the arc is different on the iron bomber versus stock. Um, I mean, it must be true. I feel like I have to aim lower. Like, when you fire... When you use stock, it fires, like, upwards more. Am I, am I missing... I don't know. That's just how... That's how it feels to me. <clears throat> um, it's really fucking hard to aim. I, I respect people who... I, I was getting owned by someone the other day who was using the stock grenade launcher. And, like, I respect that. That shit's hard to fucking aim. Uh... But not as I don't know. I feel like the 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 loose cannon is is people who are good with the loose cannon are insane, and I want that to be me. I want to be good with the loose cannon, because it's it's a it's as the reason I don't use it is because I it's really hard <laughs> and I suck already. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. It also doesn't pair well with um, the sticky jumper. Which is my favorite secondary. Like, I don't know... Okay, everyone... Okay, it's it's kind of a weird situation with the sticky jumper, right? Because most people seem to think that the... The the, the one, the, the soldier one... I don't even know what it's called. The, the rocket jumper? Is that what it's called? I don't know. Like, the, that is, like, basically a meme weapon. It's only useful for playing soldier, which is, like, a meme play style. Where the sticky jumper is, like semi-viable. That seems to be what I've seen, but also, no one uses the sticky jumper. Com- like, I, I I very rarely come across, like, the only time I see people using it other than me is, like, on rollout, on a, on a payload map, like, the first point, the first checkpoint. Very few people will use it beyond that, because, I mean, it makes sense, it's useful for getting behind the team, the enemy on first, um, but yeah, very few. Like I, I, I fucking love using the the sticky jumper on five CP because you like, I mean, you just are back in the in the game instantly after you die. Basically, like you can roll out so fast to get back into the 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 fight, <clears throat> and it's really good for back capping. It's obviously really good for flanking, but like the reason I like it so much is because it makes using the grenade launcher like the, the, the iron bomber, it makes using your pipes easier because you are in control of the spacing. It gives you, like, so much control of your positioning. It puts you, like, completely in control over where the fight takes place because it's so quick and easy to adjust where you are. You can choose your spacing perfectly, which means you always have the upper hand in an aim battle or maybe not always have the upper hand but you get at least you get to decide where it takes place and where you are which is super powerful in my opinion like that's one of the reasons i find it harder to to play with the actual stickies is because of the you know you you're not <clears throat> it's it's not like you can be you, you know you're taking a fight and you're like slightly further away than you really want to be that happens pretty often and so you got to want to close the distance but you know that's your, your demo man you walk slow but with the sticky jumper you can just fucking put a sticky down and then teleport directly behind the enemy and then like this is a strat i use all the time is sticky jump like if i'm in a 1v1 type of situation i'll just put a sticky down launch directly at the enemy and then like hit them while I'm touching them and then use the like the surf the damage from my own blast to to reset the distance and get away so that way I can get a, a quick hit on and yeah I take self damage but then I just and then while I'm in the air flying away I'll often shoot more you know and then more grenades <laughs> and then do extra damage to them sometimes like I mean that's a it's a good combo if you can like because normally it takes two grenades to kill someone. So you go in, you use it like a caber. Like, you, you go in, you f- bounce off of them with one explosion, and then while you're in the air, making you kind of unpredictable and harder to hit, because they're being launched backwards too, you're being launched backwards in a weird way, and they weren't expecting you to just teleport directly into them. 
you hit them, you just spam and hope that one of your grenades hits. And if you can do it, they basically get deleted. Like, it's a powerful ass combo. It's it's a kind of a meme combo, uh, but it works. Like, surprise. I mean, you can't really do it against scouts or medics because they move too fast. But, like, soldiers, you can fucking delete them. Demos, you can delete them. Snipers, I do this to snipers a lot, actually, because. I'll just sticky jump directly to the back line where all the snipers are and just do literally exactly that. In fact, sniper's probably the most common thing I do it to. Because they're not paying attention to their surroundings anyway. And also, I don't feel bad bullying snipers because they're snipers and they deserve to be bullied. Uh, so, but stickies, you know, obviously if you're using real stickies, you can't do that because you take too much self damage. You you just create a, uh, so that's a that's a combo I miss. But it's not just that kind of meme combo. It's also like just the fact that you get to completely control your positioning. Like if if someone's getting up in your face and you don't like it, you can just dip across the map <laughs> in a second. Like you're in a bad situation, you just put one. I mean, ideally, you know you have a stick. If you're if you go to a place like let's say you. I don't know, you, 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 you sticky jump in, you place a sticky down on the ground just in preparation. And then to like, kind of like how you're, uh, if you're playing like battle NG, you play around your mini sentry, like do the same thing with your sticky that's sitting on the ground. You just sort of play around it as your instant escape route. And then if, if people are coming, you know, if you get surrounded, you can just fucking jump out of there instantly and get back to a health pack or a medic or something. So it's really good for playing very aggressively, which is obviously something I like to do. Even though you have less damage output, significantly less damage output. Um, it, so it surprisingly makes it better to play offensively. Which is, the, it's, it's, I, the reason I like that is because I got so frustrated playing Demo Knight or Hybrid Knight that like you would charge in to play aggressive and then someone would like jump and bounce off of your shield bash so you wouldn't be able to get the finish off of them and then you're stuck in the middle of like you know you with no way to get out of there and you're just waiting for your charge to refill and i mean you only have four grenades so even if there's like assuming you miss a shot or two you're fucked like if there's i mean just you're compl even if you're perfect if there's more than two enemies you're dead like if there's if there's three people there, you don't physically have enough ammo to kill them all. Uh, and I mean, if there's if there's if one of them's a heavy, you don't have enough ammo to kill them all, even if there's just two of them, because it takes like three to kill a heavy. And although it is very satisfying to just delete heavy, like it's if you if you drop in front of a heavy and just boom 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 and they're just gone it's it's a very satisfying feeling um but they're often overhealed anyway what was i talking about yeah so that because i kept getting in that situation where i was just frustrated i ended up that's like the main reason why i switched to the sticky jumper is because the the fact that the shield bash launches enemies away from you if they jump and this that even your melee swings launch enemies like it makes it makes the the sword like basically unusable unless you're attacking like oblivious enemies in a corner or like get them stuck in a corner and they're not someone with movement options like not a class with like a scout or something um obviously you can't do anything against pyros because they'll just air blast you uh so you're very limited and then even then, it, let's say it takes two swings to finish someone off. You know, if they just bounce off of your shield bash or your first swing, you're fucked. Like, you have no way to close the distance because you've used up your charge. And, you know, it's it's very annoying. Uh, so, ideally, it's best as a tool for just finishing. Like, you hit them with one grenade and then you go in and finish with your sword. Uh, that's That's like the 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 classic combo the way way more viable but it's also way more limited because um well obviously you don't want to be just charging in anywhere 
Um, but it, it is pretty good. It is a pretty good combo. Why am I talking about this? I, I, I'm trying to get good at stock or like learn, learn to use stickies properly. Kind of. I don't really know what I'm trying to do. I, I, I just feel like I need to learn to use stickies properly because like, I feel like I, I should be good enough to do well in games, you know? And that's supposed to be, stock is supposed to be the best loadout for demo. Like, if I want to dominate, if I want to get, like, a godlike kill streak, which I've never gotten in my life, I would, that's my goal. I want to try and, I mean, maybe it's kind of a meme goal, because the best way to do that is just to play super safe so you don't die. Um, and sticky traps. But, I don't know, that would be cool. That would be cool. I just want to, I just want one game that I'm good at. I've never been good at a video game before, and I feel like Team Fortress 2 is offering me an opportunity to actually be good. And right now I'm I'm definitely in grinding mode. Like I definitely I definitely feel like when I say I'm in grinding mode, what I mean is I'm I'm motivated to get better at this game. And a lot of it comes down to like like my aim with stickies oh sorry, with grenades is not that bad. My my actual pipe aim is, is it's not excellent, but it's it's not the main thing that leads to me dying most of the time. It's mainly just mindset that leads to me dying. And or ammo management, uh, which I guess is also a part of that mindset. So, like, that's the stuff I need to be working on, and I think the best way to do that is to play mindfully. Like, every time you die, analyze, okay, what did I do that time that got me killed? What could I have done better? And I think I've been making too many excuses to myself for dying. Like, I'm like, oh, our medic sucks, or like, oh, uh, there's no way I could have known he was there type of situation. But in reality, if the medic sucks, then that's something I have to deal with. I should play around health packs. If, uh, you know, if, I, if I, I'm if i in a situation where I'm like, oh, there's no way I could have known that he would be around that corner, well, maybe I shouldn't be charging it around random corners that I don't know what's there. You know, like there's there's actually a lot of situations where I feel like I'm dying through no fault of my own, that in reality, they kind of are my fault, or at least like I, I, I am, I have some. Although it might not be ideal, I still have the capacity to deal with whatever situation I'm put in if I'm just playing a bit more realistically. So yeah, that's what I need to do. Is I need to, I need to, to practice like that by every time I die, just like actively thinking to myself how can I not die like that again yesterday I went to an art gallery uh, it was pretty fun but well I don't know I had a good time to be honest and I just wanted to say you know I really don't understand all these people that shit on quote unquote modern art cause I've never I mean, I've never understood this it's always way... Like, this gallery has both modern and historical art. Or to put it, I guess maybe you you want to say, like... Both realism and abstract art. Or both, both representative and non... I don't know what you want to call it. Conceptual art and... I don't know what the representative... Representative art. You could, I don't know. I don't know what to call it, but... They have both, is what I'm saying. And it's way more interesting, the conceptual shit. It's always way more interesting. Like, you go to the, the regular paintings that are just paintings of stuff, and you're like, okay, that's a guy. I know what guys look like. They painted a guy. Okay, that's pretty cool. Sometimes they're really good, don't get me wrong. Like, sometimes I'm like, damn, that's a really interesting composition in this painting of a guy. Or like, that. that's a nice landscape, that looks pretty, you know? But it's, you know, you go to the conceptual part of the gallery with all the weird shit, and you're like, what the fuck is this? You turn the corner, you have no fucking idea what you're about to see. And it's, it, sometimes it's the most wild, wacky, insane shit you've ever seen. And and other times, it, you know, sometimes it's terrible, sometimes it's amazing. You, but, but it's never boring. Like, you go there, like... Okay, so I, you turn a corner, and then there's a guy 
made of like mechanical parts and like prosthetic limbs and his limbs are being like pulled by a pulley and it's the the most noidy freaky deaky shit you've ever seen in your life it's also somehow hilarious because he has like like a, a a stupid fake mustache and like googly eyes on. It's very. It's kind of a hilarious morbid thing. That was a great. Pe- I was not expected to see that. It was very funny, very strange. I was expected that, but you know. And then you go around the corner. Paintings, wild and wacky paintings of nothing. That the the that's some of them very very uh effective. You know there was some. Uh, I didn't read the sign to see what they were about, but there was these paintings that were, like, very impressionistic, like, like, not, not realistic, but you could still tell what they were paintings of, and it seemed to be, like, a bunch of people, sort of, white shapes, sort of hunkering down, scared, in some sort of tunnel or building. I imagine it's maybe, like, the, the Blitz in World War Two or something, hiding in the tube tunnels or something like that. I didn't read the plaque, but that's what it felt like to me. And, like, that... I mean, that was genuinely a harrowing image. Like, the way that they're presented. I mean, I was like... It it made me feel... It made me feel emotions. But then you see other shit. I go into the other room. One of the art pieces is just, like, a rope coiled up on the floor. With, like, some blue felt things. I, I don't know what it was, yeah, I was that, that was terrible. I don't know what the fuck it was supposed to be. It was it was stupid. I I read I read the sign. It didn't help me understand what it was like gesturing at what the concept was at all. It just sort of explained, yep, there's a rope and and felt things and colors, but it, it doesn't seem to express any sort of concept or have any I mean, it didn't look like it wasn't like they were arranged in some creative or aesthetically appealing way they were just sort of there on the floor just sort of nonchalantly that that one sucked didn't like that (laughs) That i was like that's pretty fucking boring that that nothing very interesting going on there but then in the same room there was a painting there was just a canvas and it was just blue it was just pure blue the whole canvas with with a uh like a very smooth lacquered finish to the point where it was like kind of reflective like you could you it was so smooth and shiny that you could see your own reflection in it and then you read the plaque and it's like okay this artist he made this in response to this one particular art critic at the time who was like you have to judge art like when you go into a gallery you have to judge each piece like on its own merits like the audience your position as like an audience member or the environment that it's in shouldn't factor into your reviewing of the piece. And so he, this artist made this to be like, try and review this without mentioning that you can see yourself in it, basically. <laughs> and I was like, that's a cool story. If you just saw that painting without the story, it wouldn't be interesting. But of course, the whole point is to say that context is just important as text. And I was like, you know what? I like that. That's a, that's a, that's, that's memorable. Um, and some of them, I mean, I'm pointing out the interesting, like, maybe, uh, I don't know, whatever, but, the, like, some of them just looked cool. Like, there's some that I, I can't re- really explain to you that were sort of just expressionistic, very abstract paintings, but they just looked, like, the use of colour and form just was, like, nice. I just, just pleasant to look at. Um, and then there was a Damien Hurst. I've never seen a Damien Hurst in person before, and i got to say, in my mind, I've always shot on him. I've always thought he's kind of a whack, overrated as fuck artist, but seeing it in person, I gotta say, even though I didn't, like the thing that I that that was interesting to me is you go to this art gallery, there's all kinds of crazy sculptures and paintings and objects and so on. Like you're you're gonna see all types of stuff, but somehow seeing a, a real animal, you know, preserved encased in glass, it's gonna stand out to you. It's very much unique. It's not boring. I mean, you can say what you will about him and how much his work is valued at and whatever, but I'm going to remember... It stood out. I mean, it's very memorable to see that in a gallery. So I guess maybe I've been over-hating on Damien Hirst. Uh, There was some, like, films and stuff. There's a lot of, of, like... There was a lot of commentary about racism. There was a lot of art that was about uh, racism. Um, 
some of it was good some of it was a bit heavy handed <laughs> but uh some of it uh, quite most of it I would say was was good um yeah there was a it was a, a surprising focus on like political art like i don't i don't know if that was like on purpose or it's just like that's but there was a lot of political art and i i liked most of it uh one thing i actually one of, i think my favorite one was um and i don't even agree with the message of this necessarily well maybe i do i don't know but there was one that was like this collage it was a big wall collage like it was a really big collage and it was basically like pictures of uh the lake district which is a, a like sort of place in in the in england which is like lots of mountains and hills and natural beauty type of areas uh like pictures of the artist going on a hike basically through this area and all of these like the vistas and 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 photographs of the environment in that place and then interspersed with it there were like uh signs that said like keep out no trespassing and stuff like that but then which on its own would be like fairly milk toast but then there was also like collaged on top of all of these photos and, and interspersed and stuff there were like cutouts of sections from what i guess were like travel guides or reviews talking about like how great the lake district is but then there were other bits like of text collaged out that were talking about like nuclear radiation and stuff like this because apparently there was a a big nuclear accident in that area uh, at some point like the biggest one in England uh some sort of fire um and uh I thought it was a pretty interesting juxtaposition I liked that piece um yeah that's my review of art gallery. <laughs> I like art galleries. They're fun to wander around in. They got all sorts of weird, weird and wonderful things. What I'm saying is, you see how I remember all of this? I also spent a bunch of time in the, the realistic portraits and landscapes section. And I don't fucking remember shit. All of it was just pictures of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that definitely looks like the thing it's supposed to look like. Yep, that's definitely a guy. That's definitely a place. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really... Nothing stands out where there's, like, a story that I can tell about it. So, yeah. I don't understand why anyone would... Like, I'm not saying you have to, like, like the same pieces I liked. It, I mean, obviously, you haven't seen it. so You haven't been in the gallery, so you can't really judge based on just what I've told you. But if the stuff I just explained sounds lame to you, that's fine. But at least you can have... It's way... We can have a discussion about it. You know, that's kind of interesting in its own. I don't understand. Like, I of course there's the element of modern art being kind of a money laundering slash tax avoidance scheme for the ultra rich. But that's not really about the work itself. It's more about the 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 price that that it's valued at, rather than the actual artwork. Um, you know, because if you think about it, there's no reason why. You can't do the exact same things with real or sorry representational art or whatever you want to call it. There's like those are also worth millions of dollars, right? There's the the same thing applies to that as well. I'm I'm not saying it was all good. There was some bad stuff. There were some paintings I didn't like that where I thought the colors didn't look nice or the composition was weird, and there was some. Uh, you know, conceptual shit, some sculptures that I thought were kind of bad, uh, that didn't really, like, they, they, the, you read the sign and it explains some deep story, but then you look at the actual piece and you're like, this just seems like some post hoc shit, like, this doesn't, <laughs> I don't see how they got that out of this, uh, or secondly, like, like, yeah, I see what they're getting at, but I don't think this this doesn't really have any emotional impact on me. It just kind of feels like a... a okay, so, for, I don't know if I should bother going for example. So there's one that was, like, some small sculpture where it was, like, a a, a, a bust, like an, a Greco-Roman bust that was, like, had nails tied to it and was then being, like, attacked by two plastic figurines like action figures and then I read the the description and it said it was something to do with like Thatcher's handling of the AIDS crisis and I was like this this ain't it it just 
the, this doesn't describe anything like that. This, I, I, I don't see it personally. I don't see it. I, I feel like this, this did not make me. There were, there was a lot. There was other artworks about AIDS that I thought were pretty good in the gallery. That one was not it for me. I, it just looked kind of stupid, to be honest. It looked, I mean, it, it, to me, it felt trivializing, because it's like these, the plastic toys are supposed to represent Margaret Thatcher's government. Like that's just kind of quaint, you know, and funny. It's not really communicating the magnitude of the issue to me. That's how I felt. So I, I you know, I'm not. Hit. The reason I'm giving these examples is just because I want to say I didn't like every piece in this gallery. Like there was a there was a, a reasonable amount of stuff that I thought was not very good. There was also some stuff that I liked, but that's way more interesting because you sit there and you think about it, and even if you don't like something, it makes you think about it. Whereas if you see a picture of some real shit, it's mostly just boring. That's just how I feel, and I I apologize to no one. I'm going to give what is apparently a hot take. So Zizek wrote this article, and it's, it's called, uh, it's, the headline is, The Left Needs to Embrace Law and Order. Now, I'm 90% sure that almost everyone who is complaining about this just read the headline and didn't read the actual thing, because that's how it always goes. Um, but I read the actual, the actual article, and honestly... As much as it presents a very pessimistic viewpoint, I think I agree with Zizek that, like, now's not the time. Now's not the time. <laughs> we, you know, we have uh, more pressing concerns. Uh, I don't know, man. My, what the fuck, my brain? I'm tired. I slept weird. And I'm making food? Why am I making food? Am I even hung? Am I hungry? I don't think I'm hungry. Why am, why am I making food? What am I going to do with this food? I don't think I'm even hungry. I can't tell anymore. I'm just, I'm just, I don't even know. I should probably like go to sleep, not eat. I feel like I'm making food because I didn't eat that much today. But I, maybe I did eat plenty I don't know I don't know what's going on man so I just watched um we, we talked about libido Carmen earlier was it this video or the previous video I don't remember uh, but we talked about this guy uh, he's an interesting guy um, I I I didn't really understand what his deal was until just now because I watched this video called it the new otaku era um I have some thoughts. I have some thoughts. Uh, so, to sum up the video real quick, is he? It, it's sort of like his manifesto, uh, which is uh, if you if you don't know who the fuck this guy is, he's he's an anime or otaku YouTuber, um, and he, w w he. I think part of his main shtick is like you basically have no place criticizing art if you don't know how to make it because like you can't possibly understand what goes into the process and if you're really an otaku then you should be learning to draw basically and creating your own otaku works and also learning japanese and um you know i have mixed opinions on this because obviously i think it's completely possible to criticize art if you don't know the exacts of the process but I also think that being able to you know, create art you know like let's say you're criticizing visual like a drawing you don't need to be able to draw to to be able to think about like what looks good or what doesn't look good to you and to be able to express it in fact you can be really really good at drawing but really really bad at expressing your ideas in words in fact like that makes a lot of sense right because maybe you got drawn to visual art because you're not super good at expressing your thoughts in words or your feelings in words 
but the ideal is to be good at both. Of course, if possible, you should be good at everything, uh, <laughs> right? But after watching this video, I understand, like, this always kind of confused me because I was like, why is he so obsessed with this idea? But after watching this, the new Otaku Era video, I feel like I understand it better. So his 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 rather noble goal is to create a circle of artists in the West who study otaku culture, Japanese, and the mechanics of creating otaku media, mainly drawing, to the point where they are indistinguishable or they can they can create works that are indistinguishable from their Japanese counterparts in order to produce more resilience in the otaku sphere. Meaning, if something goes down in Japan uh, that fucks with the way anime is made or visual novels are made or whatever, there is a distributed worldwide network of independent creative fans who can continue to produce otaku works. Um, like, let's say the anime industry crashes, or something like that, which it might do. <laughs> I don't know. It seems pretty fucked up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's not actually what he's getting at, though. See, what I said was, like, a reasonable thing. And this is where I get him. This is where I disagree with him a bit because what he's actually scared of is is like Black Lives Matter going to Japan, and that somehow this will make anime worse. I don't really understand that. Um, yeah, it doesn't. I don't. He did. He he wrote a comment explaining it, and it I didn't really make much sense to me. Um, yeah, I, I I was a little confused by that part. He just sort of stops the video to go on a rant about uh, about uh, Black Lives Matter. And then he also keeps saying this word, uh, um, Yahwehan, the Yahwehan virus. He keeps saying this thing called the Yahwehan virus, which I, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I mean, I suppose what he means by that is Judeo-Christian values. Um, which maybe is some, maybe is some nod at, like, Nietzschean slave morality. I'm not really sure. He he doesn't really, go, like, explain it. Um, or, like, like, I, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> he, he, he sort of talks about this stuff as if it's self-evident without really giving any reasoning as to, like, in what way these two things are connected. Like, it's sort of presented as if, well, obviously, if Black Lives Matter exists, it's going to make otaku, like, those two things, they can't both exist at the same time, you know? Like, they are, it's a zero-sum game. Which seems a little strange, since we literally live in a world right now where both exist. <laughs> and seem to be barely intersecting. Like, there's a tiny bit of intersection there, and that bit of intersection doesn't really affect anything. So I'm I'm a little... I mean, he he, he talks a lot about... He, he, he says the words Western degeneracy a lot. Um... You can get the picture of this this guy's politics, I feel like, from watching this video. Um, I'm a little confused about that, right? Because I would imagine otaku media fits into pretty much every definition of degeneracy you can imagine. Like, part of the reason why I think otaku is powerful is because it's it's a it's all about damenningen. It's all about you know groups of damenningen just fucking who don't give a shit or if they do you do you know what i mean like it's a dame ningen hobby you could you could replace the word otaku with dame ningen and be the same meaning and it, dame ningen is basically just degenerate in japanese like you, the the words i mean obviously it's not a literal translation but effectively 
You know what I mean? Like, if you think of... L- listen to the way the, the, the language... Listen to the linguistics of otaku language. You've got phrases like dama ningen, and then when you... What, what's it called when you, when you otakuify something? What's that process? It's ita, right? Ita. When you have an otaku-covered, uh, media-covered car, itasha. When you have an otaku room, itabea, you know? Like, ita means painful. It's like the, the sound, it's like ouch. It, it's the, the Japanese onomatopoeia for ouch. Right? It, it, it's supposed to be cringe or painful, right? That's the, the emotion they're getting at. It's not pure and holy. It's the opposite of that. It is... I can't think of any other word other than degenerate. Like, I think that's the whole point. Um, so th- we definitely have a strong disagreement on that. Um, I mean, look, I, don't, I don't see any... I respect his mission, okay? I I just want to put this out there. Like, he's he's more dedicated to the cause than I am. And I, I think what he's doing is good, and I respect it. And I, if I if he, like, puts out a game or something, I'll buy it. Um, like, I, I support it, and I respect it. But I think some of his reasoning is a little flawed. I don't, I don't really understand the dichotomy that he presents between so-called Western degenerate uh, Yahwehian virus versus the otaku identity. Maybe I just need to watch more of his videos. Maybe he talks about this in other places, but I haven't seen it. Uh, like a lot of the stuff that he's probably criticizing like okay let's so let's be let's be like very open about this guy's clearly a right wing 4chan type of guy which is fair you know fine that's not that's not a problem that is a completely okay thing to be in my opinion many of my friends are right wing 4chan type of guys I'm a 4chan type of guy who doesn't happen to be right wing Um, but I understand it I get it the current, like, okay, that video was made in 2020, so we've had a few years since then, and the right-wing 4chan type of guys have pivoted from BLM bad to uh, transgender bad now. Like, that's the that's the, the new current thing. Um, like, they, and because of that, they've leapt on the whole, just LGBT is evil, Satan, everything bad, and the worst things ever, right? Which, firstly, is 100% a Yahwehian idea. If anything is a fucking Yahwehian idea, it's that. And secondly, uh, the anime has always been at the forefront of... Um, to use, Maybe if I, I was going to say, you know, if you want to phrase it uh, leftistly, you could say at the forefront of challenging conventional gender and sexuality taboos. I mean, you go back and you watch Card Cap de Sakura, everyone's gay, for example. I mean, all the clamp stuff is like that. Uh, Yuri and BL have been massive parts of otaku it since, like, the 90s, even going back further than that. I mean, look, there's a, there's a strong argument to be made that Lolicon is a part of this, you know, taboo sexuality. Um... If uh, we were to use his language, you might say degenerate. Degenerate sexuality has always been a part of anime. So, I don't know what he's going to say about that. I don't think he seems to talk about it. He doesn't, which is good. He should, he should, he seems to be more focused on learning to draw and learning Japanese, which is the most important parts. So, you know, that's, that's a much better thing to make a video about than rambling about degeneracy. Uh, yeah, I was, like, in summation, just to go back, I, I just, I didn't fucking sleep very well last night, so if I'm kind of rambling, I'm tired, and I sort of just woke up, uh, 
but yeah, to go back over my points, I think it's good what he's doing. I respect the mission, and I wish him luck. I myself not dedicated enough to the cause. I can't. I I can't spend twenty thousand hours learning to draw. I'm too. I'm too busy spending thousands of hours doing other stuff I enjoy. Um, I'm also not gonna. I I don't think I'm gonna learn Japanese anytime soon. Uh, mainly because it's quite boring, and I don't really want to. Uh, I I might, if I if I plan to go to Japan, on a on a holiday trip or something, I'll definitely brush up on my Japanese, but I don't think I have any plans to become fluent. It's just not something that's very entertaining or, or interesting to me. Uh, language learning, just not something that I'm particularly passionate about. Um. Yeah, and drawing. I have very little interest in getting good at drawing. But you know, respect to to those out there that do. I I I like making music. If he ever needs, if I don't know if he's listening, I doubt it. But if hey, if libido Carmen, if you ever need anyone to make music for your your Edoge or whatever, hit me up. I've been making music for like. Since I was like six years old, so maybe that counts as enough time to hit your threshold of sixty thousand hours. I don't think so. I think it's less than that. But you know, I could probably make some Denver song. I could probably make some 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 K on BGM type beats or whatever. Uh, yeah. Oh, actually, wait, I wanted to say this thing. This was the whole point of the re- reason I started recording this segment is because I wanted to talk about this, about geopolitics, which is that I think his problem is actually solving itself, which is, or maybe it's not, that it's complicated, but we're currently living through the age of deglobalization. Um, like, we had we had globalization, which was this powerful force that everyone thought was just going to last forever, fukuyama end of history type of situation. Um, but it's collapsing as, uh, I mean, mainly due to China and Russia, uh, and the U.S. is sort of, it's, it's not even, I mean, you can argue that globalization equals U.S. hegemony, but it's more about just the interconnectedness of markets that, like, uh, states like China and Russia, it doesn't matter if they're, like, ideologically or politically opposed to the U.S., because, uh, not trading with them is not profitable, and therefore, like, it's worth having open trade relations with everyone, having this globalized supply chains, uh, just because it makes everyone money, and that's more important than, like, petty political squabbles for governments. But at this point, uh, after COVID, after, uh, you know, wars and various environmental problems, those supply chains are way less powerful than they used to be, uh, and... Uh, Trump started a trade war with China which really fucked these things uh, which, you know, whether or not you think that's a good idea or a bad idea like, or rather than good or idea or bad idea more like, did he just s- speed up what was inevitably going to happen anyway? It's a complicated question, I'm not qualified to answer um, and Biden is continuing the trade war showing no signs of slowing down and escalating these sorts of things so, trade war with China has been real and escalating for a long time. Globalized supply, I mean, the US is reindustrializing faster than any country in the history of Earth, probably. Uh, it's, re- it's literally reindustrializing. It's, it, the US is building more factories and uh, like supply line, supply side uh, infrastructure right now than it did at the, during World War II, and at the start of World War II. Like, that's how fast they're fucking building shit. Uh, to reindustrialize the U.S., which is great. I, I this is a great thing. So shouts out to Donald Trump and Joe Biden for that. Uh, it's good for the economy. It's good for jobs. It's good for people. Um, and it makes these supply chains more localized, which makes them more resilient to like, you know, stuff like if something like COVID or some natural disaster or political, geopolitical squabble happens. It makes them much more resilient to that if these supply chains are more localized. It can make things more expensive, but uh, it, 
and building up all this infrastructure does increase inflation, but it's basically like a short term negative for a long term gain. Uh, but this deglobalization um, does have other problems. It, it increases global geopolitical instability, and especially in the, the West, where now that these countries aren't economically tied to each other as strongly, it doesn't really matter as much if they go to war. Uh, so we'll probably see these sorts of wars more often. There's also the fact that like a lot of these states are failing. I mean, the Russian state is failing in front of our eyes. Um, I, I bet he'd... I bet, uh, this guy doesn't believe in this. I bet he thinks this is all like propaganda that the Russian state. I mean, the, the for, to like let's just look at the facts. They're running out of money. Uh, they're burning through money and equipment very fast. They have massive inflation. They have a massive demographics crisis. Uh, so they're currently sending all of their young men off to war. They have no higher education in the whole country basically like they're fucked on higher education uh so like they don't have any young qualified professionals like in the fields of engineering or stem or anything like this who would be the sorts of people that you would want to build an economy to recover after a war uh not really possible for them because they don't have that level of educated people in their country that are young or the educated people are old and they're just going to die soon or that retire soon um, and then all of the young people they do have, the young men who would typically be the backbone of an economy, they're currently sending off to war. Uh, so they're kind of fucked. I mean, this just happens when you do a big war. Uh, but it happens especially when you're Russia. This is probably why they invaded Ukraine, by the way. It's because it's sort of their last hope. They know their economy is going to fail soon. Um, and so they, need, they, they tried to do like a big territory grab to try and shore them up from attacks in the next like 50 hundred years, uh, like, like land attacks from the West. Um, so yeah, Russia kind of fucked. China, um, has the worst demographics crisis in the world. Uh, they basically have like no young people, uh, <laughs> like all of the, they had this one child policy that was like this massive antinatalist policy, um, because they thought they had too many people. It turns out that their population was going to plateau anyway. And so what they actually did was just create a massive demographics gap. All those people have now, like, from that generation have now grown up. And, uh, yeah, there are just simply not enough um, young people to drive the economy. They have the fastest aging population in the history of Earth. Um, as well as that, Xi Jinping has been purging his party... Uh, so hard that he basically is just a one-man government at this point. Like, he's he's so paranoid and, and been purging all the people he disagrees with uh, or who might disagree with him uh, to the point where he just is... I mean, Putin has done a similar thing, but uh, Xi's done it to a larger extent. Like, it just means he's too busy. Like, he just can't do diplomacy with everyone in the world as one person and run a country at the same time. It's just not going to happen. So uh, for those two reasons, China's kind of fucked, uh, which probably means they'll end up doing a similar thing to Russia, which is like lashing out to try and reclaim territory they see as theirs in their death throes, which means like some sort of conflict between the US and China over Taiwan. I that's pretty scary, but uh, Japan will definitely be very heavily involved in that because we're talking about Japan now. We're not just talking about geopolitics in general. Uh, and Japan will side with the U.S. because Japan and the U.S. have a strong military alliance. It's very important geopolitically because of China. Um, so I don't know how that will affect otaku media, <laughs> but that's going to happen. Uh I mean, my question to you, Libido Carmen, is would you rather that Japan... Like, Japan is an island nation without... Uh, they, like, they're fucked if they don't ally with a superpower. This is what you do if you're a small country. Like, a, any, any country that isn't a, a superpower is you ally with a superpower. Otherwise, you're dead. You have to do something. 
you you can't sustain yourself militarily without the backing of a bigger military. Like if you don't ally with a superpower, a superpower will come in and colonize you. This is what the U.S. did in like the Middle East, for example, and it's also basically what the U.S. did in Japan after World War Two, um, and China does it all the time as well, and India does it all the time as well, and Russia does it all the time as well. Um, like you, you basically have to ally with a some sort of military superpower in order to have any. It's like a racket, like a protection racket, right? Um, and also, if you don't, they'll just cut you off from global supply chains, and you're fucked. That sort of thing might be happening less as these states fail and as de- deglobalization continues to take effect. Um, but we'll see what happens. It's way too early to call anything. So the point being, oh, and the U.S. is also like semi failing. Right, like I don't think the U.S. is actually going to fail anytime soon because they have the dollar, which is still the world's reserve currency, which is just a ridiculously OP cheap power in the isekai game of politics. Uh, like th- th- there is there is no alternative to the dollar that is like viable. BRICS isn't working. The yuan isn't a viable alternative. The yen isn't a viable alternative. The pound, the euro, none of these are viable alternatives. Uh, the 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 dollar is the only thing that the world could possibly use as a reserve currency, and that's pretty set in stone. Um, so the U.S. probably won't run out of money and have like total economic failure, like Russia might, and I don't think that'll happen in China, but it could. Uh, more likely, I don't really know what would happen in China, but yeah, that probably won't happen in the U.S. It almost certainly won't happen, uh, but. Uh, obviously tensions, political tensions have been rising for a long time and at this point you have stuff, you basically have like a lot of uh, people on the right sowing like massive distrust in in the democratic systems of the US like saying that the elections are all fraudulent and like trying to enshrine this in laws and the the differences between the various states and their political positions, like compare like Florida and Texas to like Canada and Vermont or something, right? Like they're basically they may as well be different planets, uh, and these sorts of te- I mean it's always been like that to an extent, but these sorts of tensions, I mean, it's not good, it's not good, and everyone knows in the back of their head that it's going to boil over at some point. Uh, we just don't know how or when, um, but. When that does happen, uh, the U.S. is going to be too busy dealing with domestic issues to to super bother uh, going out and fucking with otaku media. You understand my point here? All of these superpowers are, like, not actually in any position to extend their tendrils of power for too long. Like, these empires are going to have to deal with their domestic issues before too long, right? Like they, they, they simply don't have the ability, the capacity to exert that much influence on culture anymore because the, all of this pressure has meant that, that economically these countries are being less and less tied together. And what that means is your fear, libido Carmen, of uh, degenerate Western Yahwehan influence on the Japanese sphere, which is already extremely minimal, extremely minimal, um, it's probably not going to increase anytime soon, probably, but even if it does, let's say, even if it does, honestly, it doesn't matter to me that much. I still have, there was still literally, there was, there was too much otaku media for one person to ever get through. If they stopped making anime tomorrow, that might be a good thing. If they stopped making any otaku media tomorrow, it might be a good thing. I could actually go back and finish my backlog. I know you haven't, because none of us have. Like, I've, there's, there's simply too much. Like, you run out of stuff from one decade, you just go back. Like, there's like... There's just so much. There's just so much stuff to read and and watch and listen to that you'll probably never run out. So even if it does go to shit, you can just watch old stuff. 
Like, it's not even a big deal. You don't really need uh, to be, like, super concerned with conserving the culture as it exists now. Uh, at least that's my opinion. But I understand, you know, I, again, I think it's a noble goal. I just think it's a... And I agree that it should happen. But I also think it's impossible. <laughs> because, uh, like, you're not Japanese. Like, here, you're right wing. You should understand this. Like, I don't know if you've looked in a mirror recently, but, but you're you're clearly white. Uh, like, there there is... There is a clear racial component to this. It's not just cultural. Like, even if you can... Ma- like, take a look at Yu Kamina, for example. The creator of No Game No Life. He's Brazilian-Japanese. Um, and... You, while you may not know that, watching or reading No Game No Life, it sort of makes sense once you understand it. Do you know what I mean? I don't know how to explain this in... With that, I don't want to go into a full fucking analysis of this shit, but there's an element of, to me, an an outsider perspective in No Game No Life. The way it takes tropes in, I mean, I think this is what you want, right? It's something that that passes, but is also kind of unique. Passes for for Japanese, but is also, or first party, we could say, but is also, uh, offers this unique outsider perspective. And the thing is, the only one thing has ever done it, and it's No Game No Life. Like, I can't think of any other media that, like, maybe Katawa Shoujo, but even that is questionable. Um, you know, there's a, yeah, well, it's, it's, there's a, there's a fundamental gap that you can't overcome. Like as much as you can get good at drawing and you can get good at speaking Japanese, you can never get good at being Japanese. Uh, it just, it just won't happen. And there's no point in denying that. Like, I agree that it's annoying when you see Western creators who make stuff that is, like, vaguely, they call it, like, anime-inspired, and it's just, like, fucking trash that, like, you know, has some, someone caught a whiff of some good otaku shit from the next room and was like, ah, yes, anime-inspired. Like, yeah, I agree with you, that shit is annoying. Um, and I would like to see more Western creators make stuff that is more in line with, like, the stuff I like, which is the, the slice-of-life stuff, the cute girls doing cute things, uh, Nichi Joke kind of stuff, because that's very rare in the West, and that's my favorite part of otaku media. Like, if people could actually do that, I, w- I mean, obviously, I would fucking consume. I would consume. I would, I would yeah, I, I've tried... To, I mean, I'm I'm just not very good at writing stories. I've never been very good at writing stories. I'm it's just not my art, you know. I'm a I'm a music guy. Uh, narratives don't really make intuitive sense to me in that way. Uh, yeah. What the fuck was I talking about? Damn, we really went all over the place here. My point being. That like, geopolitics means that 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 Western politics is going to have less and less of an impact. In, actually, the question is right that when the the, the Sino Taiwanese war happens, like what happens then? Because because like U S Japan relations are at least militarily, extremely important, but how much does that mean? Uh. I mean, it's a it's a mutually beneficial situation in a lot of cases. It's not always, you know, there are obviously a lot of people in Japan who don't like the fact that the U.S. has so much uh, authority over their 
military strategy and geopolitical strategy. Uh, but like they don't have a choice. Like they they're complaining about it, uh, but they would. It's also one hundred percent the best situation they could possibly be in because their only other alternative would be China, and they. they I mean, look, these guys hate the Chinese. <laughs> like, I you know. Uh, Like you do not want a world. Like you think otaku media would be would be less censored if uh, the fucking CCCP. Wait, is that the right thing? That's that's Russia, CCP, not the CCCP. That's that's the Soviet Russia. CCP had had control over it. Fucking no, you don't want that. At least America has, like, some idealism about freedom of artistic expression and individualism, which is kind of what otaku is. Like, that's another thing that I think Libido Kamen might not... Maybe he does think of it this way. I don't know. I haven't watched all of his videos, and maybe he hasn't talked about this in a video. But, like, in a lot of ways, the rebellion, the counterculture that otaku is, is kind of based around... Uh, a semi reje- a rejection of of i mean honestly i hate framing things as collectivism versus individualism it's the most retarded dichotomy ever and it's the only thing anyone ever talks about with japanese culture it's actually stupid uh so take this with a massive grain of salt because it's like babies first learning about japanese history and culture and ideology uh it's it's actually fucking stupid uh but there is it's it's also something that you can't really ignore when you talk about this. Uh, otaku is uh, in part a rejection of collectivist values in favor of some more individualist values, not in the same way necessarily as as they, it's done in the West though. It's kind of a unique thing. Like when people say that, they think about like the rugged individualism of America. Uh, but that's not really the same thing. What I'm talking about is uh, closer to uh, the maybe the lying flat movement in China or something like this, right? Where it's it's sort of like a a life sucks dropout type of situation, uh, where uh, uh, like, but even then, it, it it's too basic to talk. I I don't want to talk about this because it's it's too simplified and dumbed down to the point where it just abstracts away any of the reality of the situation. So I shouldn't have actually brought that up. It's it's stupid. Uh Yeah, I don't know. I I don't I don't think it's too much of a problem is my point here. Like I don't I don't think uh as much as things are bad, right? Like like the Tokyo laws, you, you guys if you if you're a a fucking degen otaku, you you know about these these slightly more recent laws that have gone effect into what you can and can't uh, show in Tokyo. Uh, there are certain things that are censored now, which is a damn shame because I liked those things. Um, I, I don't think that has anything to do with with the, the, the Western politics, though. Like, I, I don't really see how, like, that that was... You'd have to You'd have to show me some sort of you know, cork board with, like, strings, you know, red strings going from picture to picture with the connections to show me how, 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 uh, Yahwehism did this. Because I don't, I don't really find that, I don't really understand that. Uh, anyway, so I've talked about this for way too long. Man, it's so strange. I'm watching this newest Adam Ragusea podcast, which is Ask Dairy Fan Farmer Manjeet. Uh, what about the calves? Clean raw milk? Does milking hurt? Podcast episode 65. And it's basically just a, a, a quick Q&A with this dairy farmer. Um, and uh, it's fascinating. I really recommend listening to it. But what's actually or especially interesting is the comments. Now, why it's interesting is the, uh, 
I don't know what to even call it. The 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 massive disconnect between the the vegans in the comments and both what the actual dairy farmer had to say and like what the people who uh, seem to be or at least claiming to be like experts. You know? In the comments. So, like, for example, a bunch of comments that are talking about as vegans or, or animal activists who say, like, oh, they, they dodged the question, it was all very cagey, blah, blah, blah. Dairy industry is literally, like, the most unethical industry. That it needs to be completely... all. I mean, it's just fucking ridiculous to say that all animal agriculture needs to be abolished. You can make the argument that, the, like, people should eat less meat and that the, the animal agriculture industry should be shrank I'm okay with that argument I think there's some reasonable arguments for that abolished I don't really understand where that's coming from but there's also the massive question of uh, I mean this is the, the biggest question which is why they just this is why they say that right is because uh, veganism is unfortunately kind of antithetical to to, to, to helping the climate or at least the practical aspects are right or maybe i should say animal welfare is antithetical to to what's good for the climate so what i mean by that is um what's bad for emissions is cows right like the more cows you have uh the the more they're burping methane into the atmosphere and the more you have to grow feed which uh, you know, increases your carbon output and so on. So, the more cows you have and the longer you have them, the worse your environmental impact is. Uh, and, therefore, the best environmentally thing you can do as a farmer is to use whatever inhumane industrial practices you can in order to absolutely maximize your yield for the minimum input. You want the fewest amount of cows eating the le least amount of food uh, that is, you know, the least natural in order to have very intensive farming practices so you can get the most milk out of it for the least environmental cost. Of course, they don't want this, right? Because the, the cows would be sad or whatever. <laughs> can you imagine caring about that? It's crazy. Um, but, uh, yeah, the cows would be sad. So they don't want that. They want pasture-raised, free-range cows. Uh, they'll, they'll, like, do whatever the fuck they want. Problem is, those guys, you know, you can't milk them as much. So in the end, they just say, well, we have to just genocide all the cows for their own good, which is a very strange stance to take. Like, it's a much more abstract, like, weird, fucked-up stance than I think most most vegans, like admit to themselves like we have to genocide all the cows for their own good is such a weird argument it's crazy how like popular it is for being such a weird argument i'm not even here to say like it's it's necessarily a stupid argument like i think you could have a debate about that and and it wouldn't be retarded uh it's it, it's just a weird argument you know like you wouldn't expect that sort of thing like, oh, well, what we need to do is genocide all farm animals for their own good. You wouldn't expect that to be, like, super popular, showing up in every grocery store and advert across the, the West. Like, that seems like kind of a, 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 an obscure thing, but it's actually trendy, which is kind of weird. Um, so those, those are your three options. Either you have happy cows... Uh, okay, there's actually kind of an argument here, right, which is that, like... Well, if you have pasture-raised cows, uh, you you have these massive pastures of grass that absorb CO two. So let me talk about actual environmental impact of of farming, by the way, because it seems like most people like just they just like see whatever they see on the internet without like like looking it up, doing like even curse. I mean, I haven't done much research. I'm talking like all you have to do is read a few Wikipedia articles. Like it's not even that crazy. You just have to like it. It's really not that difficult. So. The thing with cows is, um, in terms of CO2, it's a closed system, right? Like, they, 
uh, let's, it, it's so different, like the different, like compared to like industrial farming practices with like what they call confinement farming versus like pasture farming. So let's just talk about pastures because I don't really know much about confinement and it, I think there's probably like ethical arguments against it. I don't know. I mean, look, I'm, I'm not claiming to be an expert here, so I'm just going to talk about pastures because remember, the only thing you have to do to poke holes in the argument is that the argument against animal agriculture is just is not like oh industrial farming is bad because pretty much everyone agrees that there are huge problems with industrial farming uh like that's their best arguments are all industrial agriculture is bad um the thing is industrial agriculture is kind of bad across the board not just with animals but also plant agriculture crop crops there's there's many many problems with it and i think those are their strongest arguments because they're the ones that are true uh, but that's not what veganism is. Like, let's be clear here. So in order to poke holes in, in veganism or like any sort of any of these sorts of things, what you actually have to just do is show that there are ways of doing this that aren't industrial farming um, and that are fine. Uh, like they don't because I mean, they, what they've done. Well, whatever. That's what you have to do is, is get them to admit that there's, it's possible, in which case. You're not actually against animal agriculture, you're just against industrial agriculture, which is fine. I'm also, you know, I think that's also a reasonable thing to be against. Uh, so, fucking pasture raising things, right? Uh, all of the CO2 is a closed system because you have, you know, the plants, they absorb the CO2, they, the, the, the CO2 is emitted, it's absorbed back, it's a closed loop. The methane, which is the biggest problem with cows, comes from ruminative digestive digestion or whatever they basically burp and fart methane um the thing about methane is <clears throat> the big scary thing that everyone always says is oh methane's actually way worse for the greenhouse effect than co2 is which is true it is what they don't say is uh, it's also a little like that's the that's the first thing that you should uh, acknowledge yeah, true, correct. It is way worse for the greenhouse effect than CO2 is. CO2 gets pumped out into the atmosphere, but then it gets reabsorbed. How does it get reabsorbed? Well, mostly through like plants breathing it in and shit, right? Plants, they breathe it in. Uh, there's also, you know, sometimes it gets trapped in like soil or ice and these sorts of things in the ocean. It becomes carbonic acid, whatever. But like the big way... I mean, firstly, none of this matters because I, I propose uh, spraying cooling aerosols into the atmosphere, so the greenhouse effect shouldn't be a problem if we just stop being pussies about aerosols, but uh, let's, just, uh, let's just pretend that aerosols don't exist for now. Um, methane, while it's, it is much worse for the greenhouse effect, it also is not naturally absorbed by, by uh, animals at least not like real ones the only living things that absorb methane is there are certain bacteria in the soil and these are actually fairly prevalent like it's not a small effect like there is actually a pretty reasonable amount of methane that gets absorbed by bacteria in soil um it's not yeah it's not a small thing but most of the methane in the atmosphere just gets broken down through chemical effects like just through chemistry uh, it's not as stable as CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, it doesn't last as long. It just dissipates. So if you... Um, yeah, which is one of the reasons why um, abolishing animal agriculture or dealing with this methane problem is like a relatively high priority for a lot of people is because it would actually have very short-term effects. Like you could... You could do it and you would see results in like less than 10 years because all the methane would just dissipate naturally um yeah and methane levels are on the rise in the atmosphere so uh yeah that's the deal that's the deal with methane um as i've said before there are well, I don't know. I don't want to go into a whole fucking veganism debate. I always do this. I should just debate a vegan. I'm going to, like, put out a call to any vegans who want to debate me. I might do a vegan debate live stream. That could be fun. Um, 
I mean, in the end, most of the the issue is really uh, um, fucking the the animal welfare shit, right? Like this idea that um, I, I, it's just very strange, right? Is the the dichotomy between what the person in the dairy industry is saying and what the people claiming to be vets are saying, or not just claiming. I mean, the experts, right? I mean, who are you going to trust? <laughs> Some random vegan on the internet or like people with veterinary, veterinary degrees and farmers who work with cows every day? I think I would trust the, the, the latter camp um, more so. But they say, all of them, united, no one disagrees with this, that uh, cows don't give milk if they're stressed out and if they're not happy that you have to, cows have to be in a non-stressful, relaxed environment in order to give milk at all. And so dairy industry is one of the most humane farming industries because they literally have to keep the cows happy or they don't get product. And the happier the cows are, the more product they get. So, and you know there's plenty of evidence for this like you can just see what happens if a cow's really stressed out it will just not give milk you can just see that and cows voluntarily walk into the milking stations to get milk so there are places with literally that have sit- setups with automatic milking machines where the cows they 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 no one even a human farmer doesn't even milk them the cows just have this place they can go to get milked and they will voluntarily go in and milk themselves uh, just because it's uncomfortable for them to be full of milk. Uh, and so they, they like it, right? Like, they, otherwise they wouldn't do it. Uh, that's about as much as we can really say comfortably. Uh, the vegan argument, or at least the anti-this argument, seems to be like, oh, but the problem is that they, they, uh, these cows are, are, are pregnant a lot that they have to give birth a lot. They have, like, repeated pregnancies. I should probably look into this, because I don't really know, but that's how uh, uh, most animals are. Most animals, they most female animals, they just get pregnant a lot. Like, that's just how it is. Um, I don't know to what extent, uh, you know, there's obviously a, a part where it goes too far to the point where you're harming the animal, but uh, that is the case in just most mammal species. I mean, even human females in the wild (laughs) would have gotten pregnant much, much more than we do we, as if I can get pregnant. But yeah, you know what I'm saying. People, People got pregnant a lot back then. People still get pregnant a lot. Cows, they probably got pregnant a lot back when they weren't even cows, back when they were Uruks or whatever the fuck. It's just how it is. Just how it is. But I haven't done that. I haven't looked into it. It's possible that there's that they're, they're going way overboard with this shit. So I don't know. I don't eat that much. Well, I guess I do eat a lot of cheese. But uh, I like cheese, and I'm not gonna stop. Even if I, you know. Even if uh, cow's happiness is simply like this is the fundamental thing, right? Vegans get they 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 love to think they win an argument when retard normies who have never like had to have a logical thought in their mind or have their beliefs challenged when they just resort to saying like lol bacon in an argument against vegans right they vegans are like aha i have won you have you have no longer got an argument because you just said lol bacon without presenting any real moral argument but that actually is a real moral argument which is just that like my enjoyment of bacon is more important morally than the happiness of a cow that is the that is the argument they're making uh and i don't know like the thing about it is it's a question of it's like not a question with a definitive answer like these moral questions they're very abstract so in the end no one wins which is very dumb it's a it's a whole stupid debate okay i'm doing more research about this methane thing Um, okay, so, uh, I've read about this a little bit in the past, but not enough. I'm actually reading a really interesting article right now. Okay, so, 
uh, I said methane is broken down in the atmosphere. Methane is way, very short-lived compared to carbon dioxide. Um, but when methane is broken down, not just in the atmosphere, but also by uh, bacteria that break down methane as well, it breaks down into CO2, okay? Uh, at least that's one component of it. Uh, so you get this more intense greenhouse gas, which is then broken down into CO2, the classic, the most abundant greenhouse gas. The thing about farming, animal farming, grazing, pasture, you know, pastures of, of grass, is that this is a really great way to actually reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, that uh, cows can't create methane out of nowhere, right? Uh, okay. This, this, let's think about it as, as sort of a closed loop. Like, the cows, they, they create the methane via the bacteria in their gut when they ruminate. Um, but that bacteria is converting something into methane, and what it's converting is plant matter. Um, and that plant matter exists because it absorbs a whole bunch of CO2 in order to breathe and live. And that CO2 comes from the atmosphere, and a large part of it, in fact, the majority of, of, of uh, enteric methane, which is cow bubs, uh, doesn't, doesn't get into the atmosphere. It's, it's oxidized immediately, or it's absorbed into water or soils. It, it, it doesn't even get into the atmosphere. So most of it is just immediately reabsorbed. And the stuff that does get turned into CO2 or all that, all, everything that gets reabsorbed is basically going back into the, the same system that created it. So net methane doesn't go up, right? If you're, if you're asking for, what I'm saying here is that the reason methane levels have increased is probably more due to human activity outside of agriculture than agriculture itself. Because we've also done a shitload to reduce methane. Uh, like, if you, really, if you really want to reduce the amount of methane going into the atmosphere, you should be in favor of draining all wetlands and cutting down all rainforests because those are the biggest sources of methane. Uh, but of course, because wetlands and rainforests absorb so much CO2, they offset any greenhouse effect that they might create. And when you graze livestock on a pasture, uh, that stimulates the growth of plants, right? They're con the grasses are constantly getting cut down so they need to expend more energy to regrow um, and that means they need more co2 so uh, therefore it's basically a closed loop it's basically a closed loop um, because the methane just breaks down back into co2 which is then real if you if you i mean obviously this uh, this might not be the case for um because the soil is very important, right? The fact that these big pastures are covered in soil, soil is a big methane sink and CO2 sink. Um, like soil itself, not just the grass. Because the grass absorbs the, the stuff and then puts it into the soil, basically. Uh, so it's put, it, might, it might even be, having bigger pastures might even be a good thing. I don't know if grass is better at absorbing CO2 than, uh, I don't, I don't really know how good it is compared to other plants, but, um, I don't know. To me, it seems pretty clear that, like, this is not the, the reason why methane, okay, so, so all of the land in, like, land, right, you have land, before humans got there, like let's say in America, or before before it was widely farmed, stuff lived there, right? It was it was wild, but it was a bunch of guys living there, not human guys, but but, but animal guys, and a lot of those animal guys were wild ruminant animals, right? Goats, and, well maybe not in America, but like in Europe, goats and sheep and urks and all of these things, all sorts of wild ruminant animals, they. Like, they were very widespread uh, until humans came and basically kicked them off. Like, it's questionable 
that I'm I'm still reading this, so I I don't actually know the full story yet. But it's it's not even fully known if the amount of ruminants has increased with the modern agricultural practices. That the amount of ruminant animals might have basically be the same. That there's only a certain amount that the land can sustain. Um, and in fact, modern cattle they don't you know there's they're often slaughtered before reaching their full maturity, so they they die even sooner. Therefore, they don't produce as much methane. Um, that like so obviously the question that you should be asking is like well where's all this methane coming from then? Well, it's coming from burning shit basically. It's it's the same same stuff that's producing CO two. It's it's burning biomass, it's burning fossil fuels, stuff like that. Okay, I'm still reading this. It's very complicated. I, I'm kind of mad now because this is all like extremely interesting. And to hear this all dumbed down to uh, cow burps uh, ruining the world is, is actually like an evil level of like dumbing down this actually interesting science. Because the, the, the real answer is not actually the, the impact is nothing or actually the impact is good. It's the real answer is, as with everything, the, it's complicated. Um, but if you, at least according to this article, which has, I mean, this is not a, some meme. This has sources and stuff. This is a proper long-ass scientific thing. Um, it's It's possible to fuck it up, and it's possible to do it right. So the way they measure the amount of methane produced by cows is they basically just stick a mask on them and then just measure how much methane comes out in their burps, uh, which doesn't account for the fact that, that the vast majority of the methane never makes it into the upper atmosphere because it oxidizes or is reabsorbed uh, lower. Like we're talking like maybe only 10% or less makes it into the upper atmosphere to actually have a greenhouse effect. Remember, that's where the greenhouse effect happens. If it's not making it up there, then it's not having any impact on the greenhouse effect. Uh, but it seems like the best option is pasture raising cattle. Uh, this is something else. I really want to debate a vegan, man. Any vegans, come talk to me. Uh, there's a vegan argument about land management, right, which is uh, animal agriculture is really bad because it's it's uh, inefficient use of land. Uh, like you can feed the same amount of people on a much much smaller amount of land with crops versus animals. The thing is, we actually have plenty of land in the world. In fact, the places where they do like cattle grazing are the places with loads and loads of land that is not being used. So like America and Australia are the biggest ones. Uh, and having all of that land be grass instead of cities is good, actually. This is my, this is my contention. This is my contention with the vegans. Actually, the fact that you need to have a bunch of, 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 of like, a, a lot of space that is used to just grow plants rather than, um you know, cities and roads, it turns out that's actually a good thing. It turns out that's good for the environment. It's a problem. It's a problem if you use that land to just grow corn, which is what happens in America a lot of the time. You use this land, you just grow corn on there, mono, monocrop corn with loads of nitrogen fertilizers and nothing else. That's bad. No one's saying that's good. If you use that land to be like, just grow grasses with no cattle on it, it's also bad. And here's why. Because when those grasses don't, aren't grazed on, like grass is designed to be grazed on. Like other plants don't grow back in the same way the grasses do. Like it's part of their natural life cycle is that they, they're grazed on. If they're not grazed on, they grow really tall, which means they shade out all the other plants. And so you don't get like biodiversity. Because uh, they, they just, yeah, they grow too tall to, for anything else to get light. So they, they shade out all the other plants, and and then uh, they just die uh, at the end of, like, a year. And then their seeds go out. It's kind of like how, like, you know, grasses that we call grains work. 
is that they grow for a year, they don't get grazed on, like wheat. Wheat is a grass. So wheat, natural life cycle, is it grows and then it dies, it dries out and it releases its seeds into the wind, which would then spread and so on, except, you know, when we cultivate wheat, we collect those seeds to plant and to harvest. Um, but when these grasses are grazed, oh, so, the, sorry, the important part of that is that when that dies, when, when those grasses die, they release all of the CO2 they've captured in their lifetime back into the atmosphere, uh, which means they don't actually, like, or maybe not all of it, some of it goes into the soil, but a lot of it. Uh, whereas when they're grazed, these grasses never grow tall enough to reach the end of their life cycle. They just sort of keep going, like they don't die en masse once a year. And so they, they absorb way more carbon dioxide, which is good. And if you have uh, large fields of grass with, with not enough animals to graze it, and that grass dies in the summer and dries out, uh, you get wildfires. And wildfires are outside of the things humans do and outside of volcanoes. Wildfires are the worst thing for CO2 emissions. Uh, like, they are bad. They are very, very bad for CO2 emissions. I mean, if you live in America or Canada right now, there's a bunch of wildfires in Canada, right? The, the, you know how bad it is for air quality. It's fucking very bad. This is actually, like, not a meme. The, the BLM, the original BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, literally advises raising cattle in places where grass wildfire, like in grasslands where wildfires might occur as, like, a preventative measure. So one time I was in Paris, Paris, as a kid, um, with my family on holiday, and it was the middle of summer, and uh, there were, it was very hot, and there was an ice cream stand, and I wanted ice cream. Now my dad uh, lived in Paris for some time as a, a, a young when he was younger. So he speaks pretty good French. Terrible pronunciation, but the vocabulary is there. Like, he, he can make himself understood in French. Uh, but for some reason, he decided, no, no, now's the time to make my child uh, speak French to a stranger in a high-pressure situation. Uh, now, if you don't know this about France... Uh, France is like the only country that just refuses to accept that English is the the lingua franca of the world. Uh, and so they consider it like, or at least this is what I've been told, it's considered like somewhat rude if you don't at least make an attempt to speak the language, especially if you're English. Um, every other country on earth has just accepted the fact that people are going to speak English if they're foreign even if they're not English or American, because that's what a lingua franca is. And uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, France, but uh, a flawed standard is better than no standard at all. Even though, is English being the lingua franca actually, like, the best option? No, probably not. Uh, but uh, it's better than having no standard language that everyone knows. Uh, obviously, it's useful for me because I happen to be a native speaker. But even if I wasn't, having a language that you can be pretty sure you can go anywhere in the world and people will understand at least a bit of it, like the very basics, how to count, stuff like that, how to, uh, what, what, what toilet or bathroom means, you know, thank you, hello, basic words, like having... Having a basic, having some language that everyone's going to understand, you know, it's pr probably useful, probably good. Uh, at the very least, I wouldn't consider it rude if a tourist didn't speak English when they came here. Uh, you know, obviously I wouldn't consider that rude. No one would consider that rude in any country. You go to any country, you go to like Tokyo, the signs are literally in English uh, under the Japanese. Uh, they do, like, train announcements in English. Not just in Tokyo. They're in lots of different places. I've been to loads of different countries. Sometimes they literally just do, like, announcements in English and stuff. Uh, like, it's not... 
strange. It's not, and no one would consider it weird. Like, if, if I were to go on holiday to China, for example, no one would be like, oh, you don't, you don't even try to learn Mandarin before you came here. Uh, like, they might think that, maybe. But no one would really think that. No one actually expects you to do that. Because uh, that would be absurd, right? Except for the French, who for some reason think they're special and, and uh, think it's rude that if you don't, like, make an attempt to butcher their language uh, and have, like, laws against, like, having too much shit not being French. It's, it's a terrible... What are these guys up to? We haven't... Uh, look, France, I understand. Me and... <laughs> We have a the English and the French. We have a we have a spotted history. We we haven't been at war for a long time. Okay, we've been we've been allies for a long time. You don't you don't need to keep up this charade. Just let let just accept just accept English as your as the the you know an option. Or maybe I've just been lied to, and people in France don't really give a shit. But what I've heard is that. Uh, you know, it's considered rude if you don't at least make an attempt to speak French. And, you know, I learned a bit of French in school. So, you would expect I should be able to speak un petit peu de français, you know? Uh, and, uh, you know, je parlais un peu de français uh, parce, parce que j'étudiais dans l'école uh, Mais je ne comprends pas tout le français. Euh, je pense que c'est très difficile. Euh, there you go. That's my French. That's my the, the, as much French as I can remember right now. If you want to sound French, actually, what you do is you just emphasize the last syllable of every word in the sentence when you speak. So, like, uh, je ne comprends pas du français parce que I don't even know what learned is. J'étudie tous les ans, <laughs> all the years. <laughs> I, st I studied all the years. Uh, I don't know, fucking, I don't remember French, stupid language, actually I like, I don't know what I'm talking about, French is a great language, one of my favourites, I like, I like speaking French, I like hearing French spoken, it's a, it's a very pretty language to me, uh, anyway, uh, I was there on summer holidays, and the second that my dad is like, okay, go up to this complete stranger, and complete a purchase, all of my French knowledge disappeared out of my head, um, so I go up to this guy, and I'm literally, like, he didn't even, he could have told me what ice cream was in French. He didn't. <laughs> um, by the way, ice cream in French is glass. Glass. Which I think just, which is strange, because doesn't glass mean, like, glaze? Um, I get, oh, I guess it's, like, short for la crème glacée. Uh... I'm not sure. I'll have to ask my French friend. No, I probably won't bother. Uh, anyway, I, I'm walking up to this ice cream cart, and I'm in my head panicking. I'm like, what the fuck is ice cream? What do I say? I just, I, like, I don't know what to fucking do. Um, and so my brain fucking panics, and I think I was thinking, like, ice cream is frozen... Frozen, freeze, freeze. And then I, I think that's what got into my head. Um, and then... Uh, so I go up. <laughs> this is so embarrassing. Why am I telling this story? I was, I was pretty young, but I was not young enough to the point where it was, like, cute. I was like a teenager, like a, like a, like 13 or something. Um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, I go up to him. And bear in mind, so my school, I went to an international school, so we had to learn two languages. We had to learn French and Spanish. And so in this high-pressure situation, what I say is, uh, une fraise pour favor. 
<laughs> so what I've done there is, um, firstly, I've obviously mixed up French and Spanish, because por favor is please in Spanish. What I meant to say was s'il vous plaît, which is please in French. That got mixed, mixed up in my head. Um, fucking immediately the second I said it, I was like, oh God, why did I say that? That's the wrong language. This is why you don't learn two languages at the same time uh, when you're a child, because they just get mixed up in your head. Uh, probably a terrible fucking idea. I don't know whose idea it was to teach kids languages like that. Not how you learn a language. You cannot do, you cannot do that. Uh, because the second you panic, your brain is just going to fucking freak out. And the second thing is that I said, une fraise. Because I, for some reason, I thought fraise meant ice cream or ice or something. Because I guess I went like fraise, freeze. I knew it was a word. What's strange is that coincidentally, fraise actually does mean something that would be relevant if you went up to an ice cream stand. It means strawberry. So he gave me a strawberry ice cream. I'm not normally the type of person that... I'm, I'm a vanilla or chocolate type of person, personally. Not normally a strawberry ice cream kind of person. Uh, when I was a kid, I was chocolate-pilled. These days, I'm vanilla-pilled. Um, I hate how vanilla has become, like, uh, a shorthand for boring. Because vanilla ice cream is, like, arguably the best ice cream. Better than fucking strawberry, I'll tell you that. But anyway, somehow, my brain fart ended up just completely randomly being a word that you would say at an ice cream place that that made sense. So, you know, that was an embarrassing experience. Because then I had this strawberry ice cream, it's like, I'm not going to not eat it. So I ate it. It wasn't terrible, it was fine, but it was not my preference for ice cream. Um... Anyway, uh, fuck the French. Guys, I've been posting more on my blog, and I'm going to post more on my blog in the future. Probably. Shorter posts as I move away from centralized and general social media. So, get your RSS feeds ready, okay? It's, it's crazy to me that people don't use RSS more. Like, it's such a good technology. Why don't more people use RSS, it's like Zoomers and shit? It's like exactly what Zoomers want. It's a scrolling feed of everything you want to see. Except it's, you know, on your own computer. It's easy. RSS, guys. Come on. Subscribe to my RSS feed on the blog. Um, or just use it for your... You don't have to follow me, but follow whoever you think is interesting on RSS. Um... You can even follow YouTube channels. Uh, not what I wanted to talk about. On my X60, I've been using light themes. And I've kind of become light theme pilled. I know, it's crazy. Is it just a rejection of whatever's popular? Maybe. But what I actually think it is, I think it's about monitors. Like... On my Mac or on my desktop, having a light theme is blinding. But I think people just have their, like, screen brightness too too high. Because, you know, on the X60 with a lower quality screen, or even on a ThinkPad, like, just turn the brightness down, and then suddenly, I actually almost prefer it. The contrast is really better. Like, black text on a white background is the most easy-to-read thing in the universe. Um... So yeah, I don't know, kind of kind of light theme pilled. I'm kind of thinking this tendency towards dark themes, I think it's because all of the screens are too, too high quality and too bright. I gotta say, the TF2 community is retarded. I'm gonna be honest with you, it's actually insane. So, TF2 update shift, shipped. Yay, TF2 update. Now look, I have like 700 hours in the game, okay, compared to a lot of these people, I'm a noob, which is probably why I'm less cynical. 
probably why. But instantly, only people shitting on it. No one is happy about anything. Zero people are pleased about this update existing. I mean, it's insane the amount of just just vitriol being spewed. They, and the shit is so fucking minor. Okay, some of it's not minor. But, like, who gives a shit, man? Mainly because any of the problems... Okay, not every problem will be fixed or changed. It's a complicated situation. I haven't played it yet. It's late for me. I'm gonna go to bed soon. I don't have time to check it out. I'll check it out tomorrow. I need a day to go through all the new maps and changes and stuff. Okay, but... People are mad because they didn't include any community fixes. I'm also mad about that. Very underwhelming. They should have included those. Very silly. Don't know why they didn't. Seems like a no-brainer. It's literally the community doing your job for you. Don't understand that at all. Just straight up do not understand that. Makes no sense to me. Yeah, this is my complaints about it. Right? No community fixes. Just a strange decision to me. Just an odd decision. I would like. I would love if there was some sort of a explanation from Valve as to why they chose chose to do this. But I just don't understand it. It just seems like an odd decision to me. Um, but the the main things is they added a bunch of new maps, and uh, they also added the versus Saxton Hale game mode to casual. A versus Saxton Hale. Is not something I give a shit about, so who fucking cares? Uh, I, I guess a lot of people care about versus Saxton Hill. I do not fucking care about it at all. And you will never get me to care. Uh, but, yeah, sure. Oh, it crashes. It, the, you load vers- versus Saxton Hill in Valve Casual and the server crashes. It's broken. You think they're going to leave it like that? You really seriously think they're gonna like that's not just going to get fixed in a week? You really think they're going to leave that in the game? Come on. Why are you complaining? If It's funny. It's funny. I went in fucking casual TF2 server. Someone accused me. I Very, very lukewarm defense. Someone was like, oh yeah, I guess if you don't care about the game, it's okay. Come on, shut the fuck up, retard. Like, okay, let me tell you a story, okay? Yes, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a TF2 noob. But I come from a land called Counter-Strike Global Offensive, okay? Back in the day, famous incident happened. Valve, they changed this weapon. They added this new weapon called the R8 Revolver. And this weapon was ridiculously, comically overpowered to the point that it no longer made any sense to buy anything else. It completely ruined the game. They left this in for like a week before they fixed it. It wasn't like they immediately revert, like, they didn't give a shit. They let, they let it go for a whole week. All matchmaking games were just shit fest with the R8. And at the time, obviously everyone was very mad. Uh, but looking back on it now, it is universally considered to be, oh yeah, that was a really funny week when ev- all of matchmaking was just the, the, nothing but the R8 for, 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 like, that was funny. Like, it's universally... Just this this funny event that happened in the, the lore of Counter-Strike. And then they reverted it, and the R8 is now, like, barely used. It's like, yeah, there was this one time when that happened. Okay, it's not a big fucking deal. If, if, if something crashes your game, that's just fine. I mean, it's not fine, but, I'm, I mean, it doesn't matter to me. It's not, you wouldn't expect this from a big studio... Like, surely Valve can test their shit better. I agree. It's unprofessional. But also, this is Valve we're talking about. They do shit like this. Uh, Some of the maps have, like, missing textures. Also, unacceptable. Seems pretty easy to go through and check that before you launch, right? Like, that's very strange. Again, just all around strange decision making. But it doesn't ruin the map. It's just a, it's just like a, a little bit unprofessional, or it's it's pretty unprofessional. You would expect that from maybe an indie dev. You probably wouldn't expect it from Valve. But these programmers are getting paid a lot of money. You know, it's just, it's strange that this sort of thing slips through the cracks. But also, it's fine. 
they will get fixed. They're not going to leave that in the game. Obviously, they're not going to leave that in the game. Um, so, like, what are you worried about? You you play... Oh, no, I have to look at a pink and black texture for, like, three days until they fix it. Or a week until they fix it. Or whatever. Yeah, who fucking gives a shit? Um, you know... Like, okay, they changed CP Steel. Now, again, this is just my personal opinion. I fucking hate that map. I don't give a shit that they changed it. Maybe this is why. Maybe it's because I don't play versus Saxon Hale and I and I hate CP Steel. Maybe that's why I am not bothered by any of these changes. Because they changed Steel and uh, people who have never played the new version of the map have no idea how it plays. Because the update hasn't been out long enough for anyone to know how the new version plays. Already saying they ruined it. They ruined Steel. They fucked with it and they ruined it. We've known that they were going to change... St- I don't know if these people don't pay any attention to like any of the people who do Valve leaks and news. Like We knew they were going to change Steel like two weeks ago. That got leaked. Like Everyone knew that was going to happen. This, this shouldn't be news to anyone. It was like a very expected part of the update. Everyone knew that this was going to happen. I don't know how... I guess people don't watch this stuff, but this is not a secret. So the fact that it's coming as a surprise to these people is strange to me. So you don't follow, like, TF2 leaks, even though you're a TF2 player? Strange. You know, I, I bet that I will prefer the new steel because... It can't be any worse than the old one. But I will also probably not play it because I don't like that map. Which is fine. It's okay to have differences of opinion on maps. I like Dust Bowl a lot. A lot of people hate Dust Bowl. Um, I hate Egypt. Some people like Egypt. I hate Double Cross. Some people like Double Cross. I don't hate Double Cross. I just am not a fan of it. Um... You know, it's okay. It's okay to have differences of opinion on maps. They added a bunch of new shit. Like, they added a bunch of maps, mainly. That's the big thing. I mean, cosmetics, who fucking cares? But they added a bunch of new maps. And some of these maps look pretty cool. People are complaining about them, of course. Not just because some of them are missing textures, which is, you know, a legitimate complaint. But, like, I don't know. It's not been long enough to have... It it literally just came out 10 seconds ago. How can you have opinions about the gameplay? How are you allowed to do that? You you simply cannot. Insane. Uh, I don't... I don't fucking understand it. I don't understand it. Just chill. It's just a video game. I wish they'd... There's there's this guy working on a a community anti-cheat to help solve the bot problem using AI. That might that might be cool when that happens. You know, but I don't who's fucking playing on casual servers these days? Everyone plays on Val- on community servers who actually cares about the game. Um, it's like, you go on fucking Valve... Ca- like, after playing Uncle Topia for so long, the main thing I that's actually a problem on Valve Casual isn't the bots, it's the balance. Like, you have to requeue like, five times just to find a, a game where one team isn't rolling the other. Like, it's it's not fun to just roll someone and, and just keep them at the first point for the whole game. And it's not fun to get rolled either. Like, this is why Uncle Topia has the scramble vote feature, which is great. I didn't realize how good it was. The, the team balance is just so bad in casual servers. Like, the ideal TF2 match is... 50% of pe- of players taking the game seriously and playing meta and 50% of players on both teams play uh like playing meme meme more casual play styles uh because that way if you want to play more casually you can still get kills 
And if you want to play more seriously, you can still have serious, more serious fun. You know what I'm saying, right? Um, that's the ideal composition of a of a casual game. Uh, hold on, I got an email from someone. What is this? Oh, okay. Look, beggars can't be choosers. And right now we're all using the beggars bazooka. And we can't be choosers. Just like the beggars bazooka fires rockets unpredictably. We also live in an unpredictable world. Stop seething. Just relax. Just re It's only a video game. It's a great video game. They, they simply... Valve couldn't kill TF2 if they tried. Like, they, I mean, what, you, you can't do it. It has, like, the only thing they could do would be remove community server support. I don't even think that's possible. You, you can't, you can't ruin TF2 by adding new stuff. Even if the new stuff is bad, no one's forcing you to play it. And I, I doubt that it is bad. Now, if I were to do some complaining, it would be, I think it's an odd decision not to add community fixes. I already said that. Strange. Strange decision from Valve. And, uh... <sighs> In my honest opinion, the game already has too many maps. I don't know why you need... I don't, I don't know... I don't, I don't see the point. Like, there's too many goddamn maps. And most of them are bad. Like, you can list the good maps, really. Like... I, 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 you CSGO is like the most played game in the world and it has like five maps, you know, and most of them have been around since 1999. Like you, you don't need a million maps. I used to play just nuke. I played only nuke for years in CSGO. One map. Adding new maps doesn't matter like that much. It's, I don't, maybe, I mean, maybe, I'm a, I'm a little bored of, of, of Upward and Badwater. Are any of these maps going to be as good as Upward and Badwater, though? I doubt it. Because no one's, the thing about Team Fortress 2 compared to Counter-Strike Global Offensive is that, that there are actually, like, established rules about how to make a good CSGO map. Like, people have kind of figured out how to make a good Counter-Strike map, because Counter-Strike's been around for a long time. Like, it doesn't really make sense to compare CS, uh, uh, TF2 to TF Classic and TF Quake, because they're so different, like, gameplay-wise. All the classes have very different roles. I mean, they're just not really comparable, it's just very different. Um, TF2, while it's an old game, doesn't seem to have... Maybe I'm wrong, but... Like, people still haven't really figured out. I, I, 5CP, they figured it out, I think. But Payload, I just don't think they figured out how to make a really good Payload map. I feel like Badwater and Upward are the best Payload maps by accident. Like, I, I don't... Obviously, people made good design decisions when they were making them. But, like, I don't think that they realized they were making masterpieces when they made them. Uh, like, I... Or, you know, I, I don't think the people who made Bread Space realized how badly they were fucking up. Um, so no one's really figured out how to make a good Payload map. And Payload is my personal favorite game mode. Um, I guess I'm a casual scrub. You can say what you want about me. Uh... Look, all I'm saying is just, like, what is it doing? Like, you'll find any... These people will find anything to complain about. I swear to God. It's fine. It's fine. Who cares? If if it's, like... Maybe it's just me. Look, maybe it's just because I have no intention of... Playing versus Saxton Hale. And I have no intention of playing CP Steel. Voluntarily, I only play CP Steel when it's voted for an Uncle Topia. I 
and I, I, I never vote for it. It's not a good map. Some people love it. I don't like it. It's too cramped. <sighs> There's not much room for interesting movement, which is why I play the game. Uh, other people play the game for different reasons, and that's fine. Just, I'm just requesting that everyone show. That's all I'm doing. Is I'm just requesting that the, as a, it's a, it's such a Reddit community, man. Like, fucking, I need to just stop. I I don't know, man. The TF2 community is is absolutely retarded. Like CS:GO community is too big to to be a monolith. I feel like, you know. Like, it's, it's, there's too many people in too many regions with too much variety to even really, like, make broad statements about the CSGO community. Um, like, maybe they like gambling too much as, like, a rule of thumb, and they're too Russian and too angry. But, like, it's fairly hard. Uh, whereas the TF2 community is way more tight-knit. Um, and that's actually a bad thing, because they're the most annoying fucking people you'll ever meet in your life. I just want to play the goddamn game. I just like the mechanics of the video game. I don't really care about source filmmaker animations. I don't really care about fucking weird game modes. I don't care about cosmetics. I really do not give a single shit about cosmetics. I think all unusual effects look bad. All of them, without exception, look terrible in all situations. They're gaudy and bad. I, I, I don't care. I simply do not give a shit about any of this stuff. I don't care about um, fucking Highlander. I don't really care about Sixes. I'll watch gameplay. I'll watch Banny. I'll watch Habib. But, you know, I'm not playing it. That's it. That's not even. I don't even know why I brought that up because that's only a small part of the community. That's like not even what the community cares about. I'm basically on the same page as most people with that. Um. That I don't. I don't fucking care. I don't care about the voice actors. I don't care about the comics. I've never read them. I don't plan to. I don't care about the lore. I don't care about the stories. I don't care about the characters. Yeah, I like I like the meet the team shorts. They're funny. That's about it. They're not that they're not funny when you've heard the same jokes about them a, a million times. That's when they're a little less funny. Um I still think Putis is funny. Or it's not necessarily funny as much as it's comfortable. It's comfy. You go in the game, you hear a, a, a heavy, he says Putis and you're like, "Ah, yes, I'm home." You know? I just want to play the goddamn game. I like the way it feels to play. I like the movement and I like shooting pipes at people. That's my main main deal. I I like when you can you can move in an interesting way around the the map, around a 3D environment. I have fun just jumping around without even fighting. And then I also like the feeling I get when I shoot a pipe and it collides with an enemy. That's that's a good feeling. That's how that's that's how my opinions about Team Fortress 2. I don't care about the art style. All these people, oh cosmetics are ruining the art style. Like when I say I don't care about cosmetics, unlike everyone else who says that, I actually don't care. Meaning I don't care if they're in the game or not in the game or what they look like. I don't fucking give a shit. I don't care about the art style. I don't care about the sanctity and holiness of anything. I, frankly, if it doesn't impact gameplay, I do not give a shit. You can argue there are some cosmetics that impact gameplay by being, like, confusing color-wise, where there are some cosmetics that can that are, like, red, that you can, you know, equip as blue, and it can be confusing. That shit's bad. That shit shouldn't be in the game. But other than that, I really don't care. I couldn't care less. 
I'll tell you what does bother me is the lock and loads animations and model. There's a community fix on the workshop to fix the lock and loads model and its animations. Uh, and I didn't add it, and that's annoying to me because I use that weapon sometimes and it always bothers me. Uh, but it's also kind of funny the way, like, how broken it is. It's kind of funny, it's kind of amusing. I'm okay with a bit of jank. The game's janky. Jank equals depth. I made a video about that once. Jank is depth. It's fine. A little bit of a janky game, it's not going to kill you. It's fine. If Valve really wanted to make the game better, they'd remove Sniper as a class. But, obviously, they would never do that. If Valve really wanted to make the game better, I don't know. There's nothing. Just I'm fine. I don't care if the game's abandoned. Just leave it, or don't leave it. Update it with whatever you want. Literally, do whatever the fuck you want with this game, because you can't really do anything bad to it unless you like seriously fuck with the fundamentals, which no one would ever do. Like who? I don't understand what's what's such a big deal about what's like. Like, okay, when I first heard, when someone said, hey, if you try running the versus Saxton Hale game mode, it will literally crash your game. That is fucking hilarious to me. That is absolutely hilarious. How anyone can be mad about this boggles my mind. Literally, billion dollar tech company, Valve Industries, updating one of their most popular games... And it just crashes instantly with a game mode that has been around for years on community servers. And like, we know how it works, right? It's not like some janky thing that they made up and are experimenting with. Like, there's a, it already existed for, for a long time. And they somehow fucked it up that bad. That is fucking, that is just funny. Like, that is objectively funny to me. I don't know. But am I crazy? Am I the jokester? Crazy? I went crazy once. I was crazy once. Um, cause it's like the R eight, you know. We'll just sit back and we'll just think about this at some point in the future. At least I will, and I'll find it funny. And right now I find it funny, cause guess what? I'm not fucking playing it, cause I don't want to play that stupid game mode. Oh, hey, have you ever, you know, fighting a bullet spot? I, I don't understand why anyone plays all of these stupid game modes. I'm not playing fucking Man vs. Machine, and I'm not playing versus Saxton Hill, because fighting bullet sponges is not fun in a video game, and I don't understand why anyone finds it fun. I've, I've, I've watched a bunch of people play these game modes. I don't understand the appeal. One fucking ounce, I don't, iota, one iota, it doesn't make any sense to me, like, you just fire your gun at the same guy a million times, and he just doesn't die, how is that entertaining, I don't get it, uh, but, you know, to each his own, you play whatever makes you happy, I guess, if you don't like the Valve Saxon Hale, did you know, oh, this is the other thing, so, so this is what's confusing, is that you've got the same people who are complaining about two things. Firstly, uh, they didn't the, the update doesn't do anything, right? Like, it's too small. It's just some maps and cosmetics. It doesn't change any of the... There's no balance changes. There's no fixes. It's, not, it's, it's barely, you know, it's, it's such a minor update, it doesn't even matter. If you, if you play on community servers, you basically wouldn't even notice that an update even happened. Right? Like, oh, the map's so, the, the update's so minor. But, also, at the same time as the update being incredibly minor, uh, and to the point where, uh, fuck Valve for not trying, at the same time, uh, also, it's terrible, game-breaking, ruining, it's gonna ruin TF2, Valve is killing Team Fortress 2, they've ruined everything, they're gonna kill my family, it's like, what the fuck, how could, what are you talking about? Okay, I've talked about this for way too long. I've been thinking more about HS2. I actually think that the Green Party is correct. I think that that money sh 
like not because there's anything wrong with HS2. I, I disagree that, that with all of the like environmental concerns that they have because I feel like they're dealing with it pretty well. The the people who are constructing it, like I I feel like it's not that bad, but the money would be better spent improving infrastructure in like local infrastructure in like the north of England, rather than every all the money goes to London, you know. Uh. Like, it's just, the high-speed trains, like, they're nice. I don't have a problem with it. I It would be, the ideal situation would be, we do both. But there's a limited amount of budget for transport. Um, I think it's too late to abandon the project now. But I, I understand why people have a problem with it. I'm thinking about, um, so Neo Cities have started, like, enforcing copyright claims more if you don't know i use neo cities to host my website which you can find at no thank you the neo cities the o's are zeros and neo cities is good for a couple reasons uh it's free uh up to one gigabyte of storage which i mean i've used 0.7 percent of my total storage like text doesn't take up much space so uh yeah I don't even really use images there. I pretty much just post text posts. So you you have a plenty of storage as long as you keep your website simple. Um, uh, and it's very easy to use. Uh, they have like, it has like an inbuilt, you know, text editor thing. So you can edit your HTML without having to constantly. I mean, not that I ever use it. I make my posts in Vim and then upload them but like if I make a mistake I don't have to go back and re-upload it which is just like a minor quality of life thing but it is pretty useful for example I just realized I had broken my RSS feed I had accidentally forgotten to close a tag in the XML file so I I mean instead of having to like turn on the computer where I have well I, I mean I guess I wouldn't have had to do that but I could just go onto the website and edit it from any computer which is useful uh so that stuff's good. Also, Neo City is like pretty well known and trusted. Like it doesn't seem like a dodgy URL, I think, which is good, because people are retarded. Zoomers, they don't they don't trust. Um, well, it's not their fault. Okay, they've been trained not to trust uh, URLs that don't have like like you know what I'm saying, right? There's a there's a good reason why people don't trust free URLs. It's because like spammers use those sorts of services, which is a shame, but it is what it is. Um, but Neo Cities is relatively well trusted, uh, and it has certain features. Uh, like being able to follow people on the site. Not that I ever use that because I would just use RSS, but you can use that. I think it's even possible to like automatically generate an RSS feed, although when I tried that, it didn't work. Um, I still just do mine manually whenever I make a blog post, uh, which is kind of annoying, but it's not like that bad. Yeah, so those are really the advantages of Neo Cities. I mean, it's it's nothing too crazy. It's just it's free. Oh, and it also will let you change your domain, which is not something I think I need. But like, if I if I does it actually let you change your domain? I don't know. Anyway, the main thing is it's free. That's it. <laughs> uh, but uh, there are also problems with Neo Cities. Uh, the first, I mean. The fundamental problem with all of this stuff is that uh, it's it's not okay. How do I how do I phrase this? How do I pr- frame this? Like the ideal small web situation is that everyone is literally like hosting their own website off of their computer. Um, the problem with that is well, there's a couple of things. Uh, it's probably not a good idea. For an average person to host a website like off a Raspberry Pi or off an old laptop or something, because uh, it's just well, it's a bit of a pain to do. First of all, like it requires, it's kind of annoying to to set up port forwarding and stuff. Like it's not like a massive pain. You have to get get yourself a domain. 
I don't know, it's, it, you might even have to, f I mean, it's likely that you'll have to fuck with stuff compared to, like, or regarding, like, having a dynamic IP, you know, you have to use some service to, you have to either call up your ISP and ask them for a static IP, or you have to use some sort of service uh, that will, like, keep track of your dynamic IP and update the DNS record, which is just kind of a, a pain to do. Uh, and then also, like, having open ports and stuff like that is a little bit of a security risk. Uh, like, uh, I don't really know what I'm doing enough there to, to like, be confident in that. Um, I mean, I, I, not that I'm saying I would never do it, but it's not something that, like, the average person... It's probably... I mean, it's a little risky, is what I'm saying. It's not very risky, but it is slightly risky. And then the final thing... Well, also, you have to have a computer on all the time, which is probably not a big deal if it's just, like, as I said, a Raspberry Pi or something. Uh, it's not really a big deal, uh, but it's definitely less reliable, like, than using someone's proper server that's made for this. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess the final problem with it would be that the idea is that you no longer have to... Like, you're, you, you, you retain some sort of digital sovereignty, right? You actually literally own the physical hardware that's running the, the website no one can like take it offline other than you uh, but the problem with just the way the internet works is that uh, you're still reliant on your isp at the end of the day no matter what if you're if you're hosting your website with like amazon web services or something then you're reliant on amazon but if you're if you're hosting your website on a raspberry pi in your house you're still, unfortunately, reliant on your ISP to some extent. Uh, <clears throat> which is, I mean, it's, it's, a, I don't know what, how the ISP situation got so fucked. But it did. So today, I didn't actually play any of the new TF2 update because my brain's been fuzzy all day. I think I slept weird or something, I don't know. But uh, instead, I just wasn't really feeling TF2, I don't know why. I wasn't really feeling gaming today. But instead, I was productive as a human being, so that's pretty cool. I made some music, and then I pretty much spent most of the day, at least the second half of the day, like, fucking with my website. Um, I am, like, super proud of how it turned out. Because I've been, like... As I've been expanding... I mean, I feel like... I don't know. Go to no thank you neocities.org. I think I'm going to, like, try and really hard to be more active on, on here. Because uh, it's a cool thing to have. And there's definitely, like... Way more stuff I could be doing with it than I am. Especially given the fact that, like, I've just thought about, I can easily host, like, audio on catbox.moe, right, up to 200 megabytes, and these podcasts can be, like, if I really compress the shit out of them, under 200 megabytes, um... I have to do some, I've managed to get a 12 hour podcast down to 202 megabytes with, with some variable bitrate encoding. I might be able to get it down below 200, if, but I don't honestly know if I can, uh, at 12 hours long. So I might have to make it kind of shorter. So I think I'll end this one at 10 hours, uh, and then post it on my website. So you might be listening to this actually on my neo cities so welcome uh fuck youtube fuck google fuck the fuck the corpo net we out here on neo cities motherfucker uh yeah i i updated i stole some code from someone else's website that i thought looked cool and created this like nav bar at the top which works well i created a little about page which has a cute image of you know and i made a a footer that like floats and looks way cleaner and is actually consistent between every page i added some like 
ASCII art for, type thing for my name at the top of the page that looks cool. Um, I've, yeah, just cleaned everything up, really. I've really just cleaned everything up on the website. And uh, I was also, like, thinking about doing some stuff with the web ring, but ended up not doing it. Oh, and I've created this page it's called Sounds, which right now is just a funny meme. That's, I, I think this probably isn't funny to anyone other than me, but it's literally just an iframe with my band camp in it. <laughs> so you just get a small version of my Bandcamp page, which I think is very funny, but I'm sure no one else finds that funny. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I'm not entirely sure what to do about this, because it would be nice to host my music on the website itself, but there's a couple problems with that. First of all, um, there's, I have a lot of fucking music. Second of all, um, Neo Cities doesn't let you host MP3s for free. So if I, I mean, if I want to like natively host MP3s on on Neo Cities, I have to pay money. Of course, Catbox is an option, but I would have to like. Can you imagine? I have like so much music. I would have to manually upload and link. Every, it's too much effort. I'm just not willing to go through all of that. Sorry, just simply too much effort. Um, and then finally. I think it's actually maybe a good thing to link to a Bandcamp because you people will like occasionally give me money through Bandcamp and that's nice. Uh like or really what I mean is I I since my music is already hosted in so many places, it's kind of redundant. I mean, redundancy is good for security or for resilience, right? Like if somehow all of these websites go down, it would be good to have my own hosted copy of all the music. But what are the chances that Bandcamp, Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Tidal, uh, and every single other SoundCloud, and Cy- and I also have it like two albums on Cybergrind.net, not Cybergrind, Cybergrunge.net, um, which is you know. So what are the fucking chances that ev- all of these go down? Every single one disappears. I think it's very low. I think the chances of that, like, it's it seems like overkill or redundant to act to host the music on my site, especially when, ostensibly, I'm it's supposed to be my job. Like, I am supposed to be making money off of this, at, at least theoretically. So, like, why have a version where I'm, it's impossible for me to make any money off of it, you know? Um... So that's why I decided to go with the Bandcamp link or the Bandcamp iframe, the f- the funny Bandcamp iframe. I'm not sure. I mean, I'll clean this page. Like right now, this page is literally a meme. Like I'm 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 almost certainly gonna do something more interesting with this, but I just can't think of anything. So if you have any ideas, let me know. Like linking to each Bandcamp like as an embed. One by one per album might be an option. I'm not sure, to be honest. I mean, I also kind of want to... I don't know if I kind of want to clean up my band camp, to be honest. Like, I I have... I fucking don't even like my old albums. I just want to, like, kill off No Thank You and start again. (laughs) I I don't think I'll do that, though. Oh, but yeah, go check out my, uh... My website, I have a blog on there. I host the Denpa Web Ring. Um, if you have a website, send, I'll I'll put you on the Web Ring. Also, I actually wanted to say something, which is that like, I I think, uh, if you're like maybe new to Web Rings or not super familiar, because I'm also you know not super familiar, I think people's opinions differ on this, but I personally think it's a good thing to be in multiple Web Rings at once. Because it creates like an interlocking structure within the rings. Like otherwise, each web ring is like an insular community with no access. You know, it doesn't like link outside of itself really. So I think having like some web ring members who are also members of other web rings, and then these web rings like intersect. That's kind of neat, right? It's like you get this this extra interconnectivity, which I like. Maybe you have like twenty web rings you're in. That's probably too many. But like just a couple, I feel like it's kind of based. It's it's actually a really good 
thing for for the interconnectivity and decentralization type of type of shit um so yeah uh i'm very happy with how the website looks right now i don't think i will be like changing how it looks anytime soon uh, on the, i can i can i can imagine adding like a dark theme button uh but that i don't know i'd have to figure out how to do that it seems kind of annoying but i do like the idea of hosting podcast hosting podcast on neo cities slash cat box that sounds very epic I, I fucking hate it when I see people who won't, like, try some interesting new technology in any way. It, it's, like, minor shit. Like, Mastodon, for example. I don't even like Mastodon. But I've seen a consistent... I think there are loads of great arguments against Mastodon. But one of the arguments I see most often is you open it up and you have to learn what a, an instance is. As if this is, like, difficult. It takes you two seconds! They're like, And they say, I don't want to have to do homework. Like, motherfucker... You know what I realized recently, or not that recently, but at some point, is that, like, most adults don't really learn anything for, like, decades. Like, you go to school, you go to uni, you go do whatever, you're a kid, you're learning, and then you do your job, and you have to learn how to do your job, and maybe that takes three years, right? And then, you just do the same job for your whole life, and you don't have to learn anything, and you, you, you don't really, you, maybe you get slightly better at it. But generally, you sort of do the same shit. Like, I mean, do people even have careers anymore in this economy? I don't know. But, like, you know, there are certain people, like, in, in CompSci, for example, or just in STEM in general, who probably do continue to learn throughout their whole lives in a good way on the job. Most people, you know, they go to work in some office somewhere doing fucking data entry or in Starbucks or whatever... I just do the same shit every day, and they come home, and they just vegetate in front of Netflix without, and they never have a critical thought. And maybe their their most thing they learn is like who the new Marvel character is, or like uh, maybe they watch an ed- edutainment video on YouTube and they can barely follow it because they are like room temperature IQ. Literally, these things are made for children. It's like, well, what do you mean you don't want to do homework? It's like, oh, I I would switch to Linux, but it's confusing. It's not confusing. Like, there's... N- th- like, it's... Th- I think there is a, a real... A real... Um, element of... Uh, like, like over-choice when it comes to Linux. Like, s- someone's like, oh, you know what? Actually, maybe I do want to move to Linux. And immediately, you're like, okay, here's 50 distros. Which one do you want to pick? Uh, right? And it's like, okay, now you have to... Now I have to learn the difference between all of these things. In reality, you don't. Because there's a bunch of... Di- there's, like a great website that, that like, lets you pick a distro very easily. Um, you know, just pick anyone. Distros don't really matter. The only thing about distros that matter is their package manager. And, uh, just go with a popular one. Just some, something Debian-based is probably a good first Linux. Um... You know, you'll be fine. Just don't pick Ubuntu and don't pick, like, Gen 2. I mean, look, if you want to dive in the deep end with Gen 2, that's fine, but it's not complicated. Like, it's really not difficult. And it's also, as well as not being difficult, actually interesting. Like, people don't realize that they already... They're like, oh, I don't want to have to relearn all of these things. It's so complicated. At some point, you had to learn how to use Windows. Like, Windows isn't actually intuitive. When I personally have to use a Windows computer, it's confusing to me. I don't know where everything is. I don't understand the file structure. You know, it's it's weird. Everything's, like, weird. It's fucking weird. It's not intuitive at all. It's, you, you just grew up using Windows, so it's natural to you. But if you take five seconds to learn what? you Commands you... I, I keep talking about this. You Commands you need are, like, CD, LS, CP, MV, MKDIR, maybe... And then maybe like like a nano, you know, to open something. Like that's it. That's but you can basically, and then and then whatever your package manager is, a sudo apt get or something like that, right? Sudo pacman s, whatever package manager you use. 
that's it. That's all you need. It's not difficult. It takes two seconds. You already, you just learned it. You just learned it. You, you don't even use Linux and you're listening to this. You just learned how to use the Linux command line for 99% of things you're going to do in your life. Anything more complicated than that, you can look it up if you need to, but that's pretty much all you'll ever use. And then beyond that, what even is there that's complicated? Like nothing. And what's cool is, if you want to dive deeper, you can, like me, you know, I'm not super advanced in Linux, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely far from it, but, like, over the years of using Linux, you actually learn more about how your computer works. Like, you can use Windows for a decade and have absolutely no fucking idea how the computer works. But you use Linux more and more, you actually understand the, the a little bit, you know, obviously, I'm not saying I'm some sort of genius or, or, or like, super knowledgeable about this. But, like, you slowly gather information about what's going on in the background of your computer, how it actually functions. And that's fucking interesting. I'm sorry, anyone who doesn't find that interesting, you, where is your fucking curiosity about the world? You're just going to use this thing, and if it breaks, you'll have no idea what's broken. And, like, you, you, just, don't, you just don't even, you're just, you're just happy to float around without ever having, looking deeper into how anything works in the world. Like, you, these people are fucked. I'm sorry, these people, there's something wrong with them. Like, oh, I don't want to do homework. It's not homework, it's fucking learning. You don't learn anything with homework. Homework is just boring because you just re-go over everything you already went over in school. It sucks, right? This is not homework. This is, this is, this is a curiosity about the world. Imagine, can you imagine being like, you know what, fuck, burn down all the libraries, right? You know what, I don't want my tax dollars spent on libraries because who the fuck wants to learn? Who wants to do homework? That shit's boring. You know, I just want to vegetate in front of Netflix all day. I just want to, I just want to watch Mr. Beast videos or whatever. I'm, I'm, I don't understand the, the logic in these people's minds. Like, I really don't understand the, uh, the thought process of someone like this, right? Like, maybe there are some times where I'm like, okay, yeah, this thing looks super unapproachable. And I, I don't think I have the capacity right now to, to go up this super steep learning curve, but it's it's all of i don't know it's like all of these technologies have smoothed out the the learning curve to such a point where where there's there's nothing right like you you sign up to some web app location web web app location uh you know some some platform and you you don't even need to make a password because you just sign in with your existing google or facebook or apple account or whatever so you you already have an account right basically there's the second you even click on it you sign up and then everything is like the same icons that you already are used to seeing everywhere else, which is stupid because I don't like icons. Give me text so I can actually read what it says, but whatever. And, you know, you, it's like it's supposed to be this ridiculously seamless experience. But in reality, it's like being trapped in baby mode. It's like being trapped in baby mode. It's like you're you're just sitting there playing with those like blocks that they give to babies. You just can't do much with blocks. You, you know, they get kind of boring after a while if you just have blocks to play with. Maybe at some point you want to move on beyond the blocks. Maybe you want to get some finger paints. Maybe you want to, you know, do some arts and crafts. Sing a couple nursery rhymes. But no, you're stuck in in this is just blocks, just only blocks. Uh, it's like, yeah, you know what? If you're playing with blocks, you're right. There really isn't very much to learn. It's it's a it's a very simple situation. There's there's not much to learn at all. All of the, every everything else has been taken care of by someone else. Uh, and and then your life will just be boring for the forever because you are just a, a, an innately uncurious person. I don't understand the logic. I uh, I I. I don't understand, I mean, I'm trying to figure out, like, what, I'm trying to relate, I'm trying to understand, like, in my life, yeah, maybe I, I don't want to pick up, you know, EVE Online as a video game, because it's, like, intimidating, right, or, but normally that's because there's a massive time sink, like, something like EVE Online or, or like, Umineko, you know, these, these huge time sinks, that's, that's intimidating to me, I'm like, yeah, you know what, I don't really want to, Spend, I don't, or not that I don't want to, but I don't know if I physically can spend a hundred hours of my life reading Umineko. Like, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. That's very different from five minutes of learning. I, I don't really understand it. 
like I, have, I don't understand I really don't understand like any even tiny level of complexity is just incomprehensible to these people it's not even that because if they put the effort in it's not even effort even framing it as putting the effort in is crazy it's literally not even effort it's two seconds it's it's five minutes maximum to understand the sorts of things they're complaining about like it's not even effort if the, if you just like stopped being a fucking retard for a second you would you would be be fine i don't it's it's just strange it's just very strange it's a, it's a completely alien mindset to me Man, the more I read about agriculture, the more fucking black pilled I get about like how fucked we are. Like, man, we are fucked. Sorry to mention this. Uh, sorry to bring the the mood down, but man, are we fucked? Okay, let me tell you. Let me tell you a couple of things. Let me tell you a couple of things about desertification. You you know civilization. The thing that we all live in, you know it. You know you're aware of it, right? Remember when it first started back in the day, uh, by the Euphrates, that kind of area. You know what they call it? They call it the Fertile Crescent, right? It's in the Middle East. Um, isn't it in Iran? Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, and possibly Egypt. You know that area, the Fertile Crescent. Uh, now, if you go there today, you might be a little confused because that shit don't look very fertile. Looks very uh, deserty. It's basically arid land. Back in the day, it was so fertile that that they managed to invent agriculture there. Okay, maybe invent is not true, but you know what I mean, right? To practice agriculture on a wide scale for probably the first time. But now, it's just a desert. Let me give you another example. The Roman Empire. Big empire. They had to grow a lot of food to feed all those people. Where did they grow it? Most of their food came from North Africa. In what is now the Sahara Desert. The Romans may have created, or at the very least expanded significantly, the Sahara Desert through degenerative agricultural practices by over-farming the land, essentially. So, you know, if you don't think this shit has very real consequences, just imagine what is now literally the Sahara Desert used to be the main place the entire Roman Empire got all of their food from. Which is wild to me. And don't think just because we have nitrogen fertilizers now that this somehow fixes everything, okay? In fact, it doesn't. It does the opposite. It makes things way worse. We're just withholding the inevitable, right? Like, um... Uh, it's like it's like you can you can plug up this hole with a a stronger plug, but that just means the pressure is going to build up even further. And yeah, it might take longer for that 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 plug to break and and all the the pressure to to come through. But when it does, it's going to be catastrophic. Um, that's the sort of situation we're in right now. I mean, most soil. I mean, it's all about soil. This is the thing. It's all of this stuff. Turns out it's all about soil. Oh, this is what I'm thinking. That, like, we have very poor soil management practices. Extremely poor. And it's very important. Because if you don't manage the soil well, it turns into a desert. And you can't grow any food there. And then we all starve and die. And the thing is, it's not even particularly difficult to regenerate soil. I mean, it's not easy, but we know how to do it. It's not like we need some crazy advances in science. I will explain to you now. What you need to do, I mean, the single worst thing you can possibly do is the single main thing that everyone does, which is loads of tilling 
and monocrops. This is just the single worst possible idea humanity has ever come up with. If you grow acres and acres and acres of one fucking plant, and every year, you know, you're leaving barren uh, fallows, and and you're fucking till it, deep, deep soil tilling, uh, you know, every year, no wonder you have to use nitrogen fertilizers, right? Your soil is going to turn into sand in, like, no time at all. It's, it's fucking disgusting crap practices. Um, no, I mean, it's, it might sound like, like I'm, I'm talking, how do I put this? It, it might sound like, a. Like, I'm, I'm speaking out of my ass here. Maybe I don't understand things. But I feel like it's pretty simple. You need, you need minimal mechanical and chemical disturbances to the soil. Soil is, is an ecosystem, right? It doesn't need to be tilled. It doesn't need to have chemical fertilizers placed on it. That just fucks it up. That just disrupts the balance of the, the microbiome of the soil and the plant root structures, or the, 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 the physical structure of the soil, right? Soil, when it's healthy, is naturally, like, aerated, because there are all of these tunnels left behind by mycorrhizal fungus and worms and the rotting uh, old roots. So it's, it's got all of these tunnels, which, which are very, I mean, they're very useful, for lots of reasons. It means the, the soil can absorb more water, which is really good for an infinite number of reasons, um, and retain that water. It doesn't just evaporate. I mean, that's what fertile... Like, if you picture fertile soil, it's moist. It's not dry and cracked. That's a desert. Uh, so, and that it ultimately comes down to leaving the soil alone. When you fucking... When you do, like, intensive tilling... It's not that there's no place for, like, a little bit of, uh, what do they call it, wide, wide forking, I think, is, is this, this, uh, tool that they use to sometimes, like, if your soil's too compact, you can do that, but you do it so that you can plant crops, and I'll talk about what sort of crops you should be planting, um, in order to make it so you never have to do that again, because you start this this cycle, you start the the ecosystem going, and then it basically manages itself. It it once you have, if your soil is too compact, nothing's going to grow, and it's not going to be able to retain moisture properly. Nothing's going to grow, so you might need to aerate the soil somehow with some mechanical action at first. But your goal should be getting it to the point where you don't need to do that again, by making the soil biology better, making the soil structure better. Um, and uh, the, the chemical fertilizers are obviously bad for a number of reasons. I mean, they're an ecological disaster when they run off into water, stream, like water streams and oceans and so on. I mean, the level of ecological destruction that these things cause is, is something that I don't think we can even really comprehend. It's just insane. Um, but it's also not good for your soil because it's it might be good for certain plants, but it's not good for the soil microbiome and the mycorrhizal fungi and all of these uh, other things. Right, like it's only good. It's a, it's a short term benefit for one sort of very particular thing, um, but it's not. I mean, it's just not good. It's 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 a it's ecocidal basically. Um, so you you don't do any of that. That's step one. Is minimal if any tilling. Um, of the soil, like just leave it alone, leave it alone. So that's the first important thing. Oh, another thing. So when you till the soil, it also like soil is is a complex chemical reaction. It's an extremely complex chemical system. Um, it's not just this inert. Like we think about it as this just sort of inert dirt that just sits on the ground and sort of just sits there and doesn't change. But it's really an active, ever-evolving chemical and biological system. Uh, and when you when you till it and you're exposing more soil to the air, it oxidizes. And when soil oxidizes, a bunch of chemical reactions happen, which make the soil again worse at retaining moisture, uh, worse for uh, harboring 
beneficial bacteria and, uh, you know, less easy for plants and fungi to grow in and destroys various chemical nutrients that are in the soil for, that plants would normally use to survive. And as well as that, soil retains a bunch of carbon dioxide, or, or carbon, right? Like when plants breathe in carbon dioxide, they deposit it in the soil. When you till the soil, that carbon, again, goes back into the atmosphere and produces a greenhouse effect, which is bad. I think everyone acknowledges that at this point. Okay, so I've explained why tilling is bad. Um, next is biodiversity. And this, this, I mean, it's pretty fucking simple. Don't just grow one crop. It t did you know plants actually feed the soil? Like, if you grow a wide variety of plants, including, like, things that people call weeds, and inc including things that you can't eat or sell, like cover crops. Extremely important. Cover crops, you, like... Never let your soil be bare, like at least as as much as possible. Try and try and make it so there are some plants growing everywhere at all times. Because if you think about it, you go into an, a nature place like a forest or f fields, meadows, etc. type of thing. Not not a human agriculture place, but a nature place. You're not gonna find bare land. You're not gonna find bare soil. Like there's always this symbiotic cycle between plants and soil. Um, and fungi and bacteria and so on and worms and insects that are that's going on and that if you take out plants if you just leave fallow fields that's taking out an entire part of that ecosystem like the the roots of plants they feed the soil uh, <clears throat> so there should always be shit growing and it should be diverse crops that all I mean, you can, so for, there are certain crops, I don't remember off by heart, I'll, I'll probably be, you can look it up, but there are like certain crops that will replenish the nitrogen in the soil, and there are certain crops that will capture nitrogen in soil, and this is the case for pretty much every uh, chemical you can imagine, right? Like there are, there are certain plants that will uh, feed soils in different ways, and there are certain plants that will take things from the soil in different ways, and if you just grow one, it's always going to disrupt the balance. Include This includes, like, agroforestry, right, where you have uh, trees involved in your... You're growing trees alongside crops. Um, and it also includes soy vegans livestock. Uh, animals and grazing is an extremely important part of an ecosystem. Like, you know, for as much as I see vegans talk about permaculture and sustainable farming or regenerative farming they almost never talk about the you know the role that livestock and animals play in nature uh in terms of keeping soil healthy not you know in terms of grazing which is good for uh, well it's good for a number of things it's good for reducing wildfire likeliness it's good for um you know causing plants to continue to grow um, therefore sequestering more carbon I mean plants are kind of designed to be grazed on right like it's part of their natural life so having them there and then obviously their poop is important fertilizer it's extremely important fertilizer and yes there is some runoff uh, but also you know there's there's always going to be like having poop in rivers is not bad that's kind of how, what rivers are made for um, obviously if you keep livestock too like, there, there's a right way and a wrong way to keep livestock, of course. But in this super mixed, biodiverse, agroforestry, regenerative farming utopia, you have plants and animals and trees and all, everything growing together. And uh, it keeps everything healthy. And you don't need to use fertilizers because animal poop is the best fertilizer. Uh, also, mulch. Shouts out to mulch. Uh... And when I talk, but also, like, not just, you should also plant wildflowers, native wildflowers, in your, wherever you're growing crops, because that attracts insects, which are an important part of the ecosystem. And also, various flowers can also be good for soil health. <clears throat> um, yeah. I think uh, that's pretty much everything. Uh, when you when you grow plants and you harvest them, 
you don't need to dig the roots out of the soil. Just leave them there. They'll decompose. The the saprophores will get them. And uh, those saprophores are a very important part of the ecosystem. So yeah, you you got to grow everything together. The problem is, well, there's a few problems, is that you might end up with less productive land in the short term. But obviously, in the long term, you're going to have soil that can still grow plants and, and everyone else isn't. So, uh, you know, you're going to win out there. But such as capitalism, it's, it's hard to justify long-term things over short-term gain. Uh, and also, some of this stuff is expensive. That cover, like, if you, can, if you have the choice between leaving land fallow versus planting cover crops, it's obviously going to be cheaper to do nothing than it is to plant cover crops. But again, at a certain point, you're going to have soil that works and they're not. And your soil, I mean, just overall, if you're, your soil, I mean, this needs, this isn't just the personal choice thing. Like, let me make this clear. This is not like, oh, we need to be petitioning farmers to do this. No, no, no. This is, we need to be petitioning the government to, like, set up proper incentive structures to just, to, like, you know, push people towards proper soil management and land management. Good land management practices. Like, there need to be fines, there need to be subsidies. I think subsidies is the best option. Like, there need to be subsidies for proper land management practices. There need to be fines or, you know, regulations against, uh, like, the super degenerative monocrop, monocrop industrial agriculture practices with all of these... I mean... I didn't even mention pesticides and herbicides. Like, that is the most fucking disgusting... I mean, you can imagine, right? Like, you, you, you use a bunch of... Insects are part of the fucking natural... site. Like, you should, don't need to kill them. That's fine. Your plants will grow better with them over the long term. It's, it's, it's confusing, but it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, if you have a monocrop, it's bad. Uh, the problem is you have a monoculture... A monocro- anyway, um, yeah, and herbicides, like, there's no such thing as weeds, they're not real, uh, just leave them. This is the thing, right, you, 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 you got all of these, uh, like, anyone who claims that these meat alternatives are better for the environment, you want to know how they're growing the soy? You want to know how they're growing the soy for the, uh, Oh my god, but you're gonna love this one. You wanna know how they're growing the soy for, uh, like, the Impossible Burger and stuff? So they use a GMO soy crop. Now, I don't have anything against GMOs in principle, uh, but in this particular situation, this common GMO soy crop is a herbicide-resistant GMO. And what this means is they can spray more herbicide on the land without killing their own soy crop. So what they're doing... It, like it's not the GMO itself that's harmful; it's the herbicides. Like they they're using this particular soy crop so that they can spray more herbicides. And I mean that's that's a that's an ecological disaster. I shouldn't have to explain this to you. It's literally a herbicide. It goes around. It's it's designed. It's poison. It's poisoning the soil. Like there's no subtle way to put it. It's just we 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 use soy that is specifically resistant to our poison soil poison so that we can go around poisoning the soil more. Uh, there is absolutely no shot, there is zero universe where that is more environmentally sustainable or regenerative than, like, having cows grazing on a, uh, you know, unmaintained, uh, not necessarily unmaintained, you have to maintain, that's not the word I'm looking for, what am I looking for, like, minimally interrupted, uh, biodiverse, you know, field, where cows can can roam around and graze and eat whatever the fuck plants they have and you throw some seaweed on there as well to reduce the methane in their burps or whatever um like there's no shot there's absolutely no shot that this like this idea is insane okay that's my soil rant i'm gonna keep doing more soil rants in the future please stick around for more soil content can someone explain this to me why are mussels considered like, fancy person food, rich person food, or middle class, whatever. Like, why don't poor people eat mussels more often? I'm talking about M-U-S-S-E-L, moule in French. You know? If you're fancy, you call them moule. Is it because they're French? 
like that's because normally we here in Britain consider anything French to be fancy. Is it because like they're commonly eaten in France and Belgium? Like anything you eat with a with a white wine sauce is considered fancy, right? But mussels are like one of the cheapest types, of, and clams as well. Are like one of the cheapest types of protein you can have. I mean, today I bought some mussels, and the ones available in my store, my local shop, like they're they're not great value. They come pre cooked. I think it's best to buy pre cooked mussels personally because they're normally not much more expensive, but um, it's just convenient. Um, but I, I've, I mean, whatever. The ones I get that are just in my local shop are pre-cooked and, like, vacuum-packed with a sauce already. And, yeah, that does save time making a sauce. Like, I guess that's kind of nice. But also, it's not super great value. Like, uh, you could get just mussels with no sauce for, like, the same price and get twice as many. I've seen that, like, in shops before. Uh, sadly, they they used to sell just just mussels on their own. They don't do it anymore. I guess no one was buying it except me. Um, but I don't understand why they're not popular, and especially why they're not popular with like poor people or like broke people. I don't know what to call it. Why they're not a popular food with with just normal people? Because like that that like this is the 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 bad like bad value for money mussels. It cost like two pounds something. I don't remember exactly how much. It was two pounds, I think, thirty or something. Like, that is an entire meal's worth of pro. Like, that was a quite a lot compared to any other seafood. That's cheap as fuck. Like all other fish, you're talking like five pounds for a meal's worth of uh, like a fillet. Maybe it's not amazing value, but again, if you go, if I could be bothered to get on a bus and go to the to a diff, go to a fishmonger and get mussels. I get them way cheaper. Which is not really worth it. Because I don't want to eat them that often. But they are a good meal once in a while. And Matt, I mean, I, if I really wanted to, if I was, like, being very frugal, I probably could, like, stretch that super thin over two meals if I, like, made it with pasta or something. Uh, probably not a great idea. But what I'm saying is, they're cheap as fuck protein. They're cheap, they're good, cheap protein. They're delicious, they're good for the environment, they're healthy, and they're cheap. What's to complain about? I don't understand. But I think they just have this association of being upper-class food for some reason that I don't really understand. Unless I'm missing something. But, like, I feel like it's cheap, some of the cheapest seafood you can get. It seems to me like the... I've been thinking about environmentalism more recently. Ecology. Deep ecology. Clink to deep ecology. So, let me give you my... <coughs> my situation here. Let me give you my situation here. So, as far as I see it from the research I've done, global warming or climate change isn't really the big threat. Um... Like, there are, there are multiple ways. I mean, firstly, even in a worst-case scenario, it, it it means bad. It means bad. Like, I'm not saying it's not a problem. It is a problem. It's a big problem. But it's not the biggest problem. Even though that's what often gets talked about as the biggest problem. You know, <clears throat> humanity can deal with, like, rising sea levels. It'll be bad if you live on a small island nation. Bad. Uh, and it'll be bad, you know, more extreme weather events and so on. Not good, but survivable. You know, civilization won't collapse because of climate change. It will just be fucked. It will be bad, but it's not going to, like, collapse civilization. What's the real threat to me is resource scarcity. Um, <clears throat> that, like, there's... It doesn't seem to me like we are ready to transition to renewables fast enough before we run out of the equipment that we need to build them. And even if we were, <clears throat> uh, there's there's a lot of significant problems with renewables. So this is what like deep ecology is about, right? It's like 
the the base level ecology is to be like well uh, you make wind turbines and then they give you energy and you don't have to burn coal. So therefore, wind turbines are ecologically friendly, coal ecologically unfriendly. But the deep part is you go, you take a look at one step further and you say, well, <clears throat> wind turbines are made of fiberglass, uh, which has to be manufactured in an industrial process. And uh, even if we can uh, transition the sort of consumer side electricity generation, to uh, renewables, those fiberglass uh, turbines have to be replaced like every, I think, 15 years or something like that. And they can't be recycled. Uh, and that requires this industrial process, which so far has not at all been attempted to transition to renewables. That, that whole process still relies on fossil fuels and so on. <clears throat> and shows no sign of not relying on it. Um, and then, you know, you have other things like, okay, well, renewables, the problem, one, you know, the big problem with renewables is that uh, they're not there all the time. Most of them, some of them are, but most of them, <clears throat> well, you need, the, the sun isn't always shining, the wind isn't always blowing, the waves aren't always crashing, you know, the, you, you don't get to control the weather and these environmental factors. So you need some way to store energy when you have a surplus in order to release it when you, you know, need it. And there's, there's, there's a deficit. <clears throat> excuse me uh, and once again there are not like super reliable technologies for this batteries are again reliant on all of these industrial processes that are just completely unsustainable uh, once certain things start running out i mean even to put it more like maybe an even more simple example for people to that will affect your daily life computers need like cobalt and stuff like that and that stuff is not going to last forever um, <clears throat> is going to run out. So essentially, the the like the real transition to renewables um, requires energy scarcity. Like, there's no, it doesn't really help. Like, renewables are good to sort of weather the storm, right? Like, you can sort of stretch it out for longer. But unless humanity like drastically reduces our energy usage, uh, it won't matter. It, it, it won't matter. Like, it, it, you're going to run out of shit to mine up out of the dirt. And then you won't be able to make new computers. And you won't be able to make... And you won't be able to make new wind farms. And you won't be able to make new photovoltaic cells. Uh, like, <clears throat> the amount of energy it takes to produce a... Uh, Consumer-grade photovoltaic cell, like a solar panel. It takes more energy to produce one of them than it will generate in its life. Uh, or uh, small scale wind turbines are the same way. If you like, if you ever see people who have like personal wind turbines for their like home, you know, like these sort of small scale ones, the amount of energy it takes to construct it is more than it will ever generate because of physics. Like the big ones, the big industrial ones that countries use to power their national grids, those ones are powerful enough to uh, actually offset to to actually be net positive. It takes a few years for them to get there, but they do eventually get there. But the small scale ones, they don't, they, they will never pay off the cost it took to make them. Like it's basically, you're using up more energy than you generate. And, and it is like, it, it, so like you need, you need to reduce your energy usage in conjunction with these sorts of things, right? Otherwise, like if you, if you create a, a, a solar farm that, never pays off the cost it took to create it before the solar panels need re replacing you you haven't really succeeded in doing anything right because downstream the it's still not sustainable <clears throat> so the way i see it there are sort of two options there are sort of two parts that are actually like feasible and they're both extremely abstract sort of pseudo fictional <clears throat> things uh, either we like go the, 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 I don't want to call it solar punk or whatever, but that, like we, we go that route where it's like, uh, you know, we, humanity drastically reduces its energy consumption. It's almost like, a uh, I mean, even that, like, 
energy consumption is just one part of it. There's also desertification, which I talked about. Like, the soil quality is just fucked. Uh, so, like, either we, like, en masse switch to sort of regenerative farming, which is not going to happen. Uh, I mean, it might, but it's that there is really seriously not enough pressure to do this right now. Even though certain regenerative farming, to, especially in Australia, it's, like, doing well. And there are, like, many indigenous farming practices around the world that are regenerative, like in Mexico, for example. Uh, <clears throat> and South America, there are some really great, like, traditional indigenous practices of, like, biodiverse, sustainable agriculture. But most of that is sort of being, like, it either has been already or is continuing to be, like, pushed out by uh, urban expansion and stuff like this. Um... So it's, like, barely surviving on its last legs. But it is possible. Like, people have done this for a long thousands of years. And uh, it's just... The question is really, like, can it produce enough food to actually feed a population? And we don't really know. I mean, it's possible, but it just means things will be more expensive. <clears throat> I mean, and the other thing is locally... Like, there needs to be locally grown, right? Obviously. Like, it doesn't matter if you're, how sustainable your farming practices is. Or if you uh shipping your shit all the way across the world like your uh, any benefit you might be causing is you're creating is is offset by the transport costs so yeah that's a whole other issue um it's it's this is this seems like th those two things resource scarcity like energy scarcity it's not that like energy will become impossible to access it will just become way more expensive like, having enough power to, like, keep a light on all the time and have, like, refrigeration and electric stoves and five computers with six monitors and whatever, like, that's going to become prohibitively expensive to the point where, like, the average person probably won't be able to afford that sort of thing. Uh, like, we, it seems to me like we might have to go back to a time of, like, uh, preserving food without electricity and low power. I mean, I, I, I made a little meme phrase, which is, like, the... The people who survive uh, in the future will be those who know how to, uh, who know 6502 assembly. Because compute, I, I mean, I, it just seems to me that it's going to be unfeasible for the average consumer to, to run like a GeForce 3090 TX fucking crazy gaming PC high pack. Like, it just seems like that's going to cost too much money in electricity for anyone to really use in the coming, well, like, at some point, I don't know when, but at some point, like, we, in case, if you think I'm being, like, crazy about this, I mean, <clears throat> it seems like we already reached peak oil, if you, like, uh, that was in 2019, oil production hasn't, re hasn't recovered from 2019, like, it's gone plateaued or, or down, um, and, uh, the thing about all of these, like, metals and minerals that we need to do electronics and stuff isn't that there isn't enough of it. It's just, like, so deep or hard to get to that it's unprofitable to extract. Like, the, the further down you... Like, there are... If you count the entire Earth, right, you, humanity could, you know... I, I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. Uh, so that's, that's option one, right, is we sort of revert to a, a more... A less energy intensive uh, mode of living with, uh, you know, uh, regenerative farming practices and uh, stuff like this. Uh, essentially, degrowth is what I'm talking about. And, you know, that has positives, but it also has big negatives. Like, uh, you know what, like, the entire medical industry basically relies on these sorts of industrialized processes that are unsustainable. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that's a bit of a problem <laughs> for a lot of people, you, uh, yeah, uh, and, the, and, I mean, there's, there's a lot of fucking people in the world, uh, there's, anyway, yeah, there's problems with this, there's a lot of problems that you can immediately think of with, like, I mean, anything, I'm not talking about anthemism, I'm talking about, like, future thinking-ism that just makes more sense, like, to me, technological development doesn't just have to be finding ways to fit more transistors on a chip it can be like finding ways to do more with less right that's like what i see as like the the best version of like if you have i mean people do this all the time right you can 
go on YouTube and find people running Doom on, like, all sorts of weird, crazy, fucking... Like, people run Doom on a pregnancy test. <laughs> right? Like, doing more creative and powerful stuff on lower and lower end hardware is going to be important. Because once it becomes impossible or, or very expensive to manufacture new electronics, and especially to power high-power electronics, um, like, the the societies that do well are going to be the ones that can scavenge... <clears throat> you know, whatever's still lasting. So all of the planned obsolescence, like smartphones and stuff, they're not going to work. But, you know, you can pick up a 6502 based computer from the 80s and it will still run perfectly fine, you know. Like, <clears throat> those sorts of things, the things that can uh, last, the, the, the things that are computers that are simple enough for one person to understand and repair with very available parts, uh, rather than, like, these things where you need super hyper-specialized equipment to even, like, manufacture or repair them, and the parts aren't super available, that's just my, that's how I see it going, um, like, sca scavenging electronics is, is gonna be, like, the, the way it keeps happening for, for a while until, like, the long-distance future when perhaps new technologies allow for a new form of manufacturing infrastructure to develop, like, powerful chips again. Anyway, that's option one. But option two is the sort of, uh, there's this thing Nick Land wrote called The Call of the Void, and in it he basically proposes, it's like the, the if you want to see Nick Land actually propose, like, a genuine political praxis, this is, like, the only place he's ever done it, really. Well, other than when he was, like, a, became a racist. <laughs> but, but, like, for, if you want to see pre-racist Nick Land actually develop a, a political praxis, read The Call of the Void. So in it, he, he basically says, the Earth is a complex demolition process, uh, problem. Like, uh, the central problem of humanity is, like, imagine you're on a tower block, and you need to dismantle the tower block while you're still living there. Like, that's really the, the central, like, problem that humanity has to solve. That, like, there are so... All of these minerals that and, and uh, you know, metals and resources are actually extremely abundant in the earth they're just deep they're just much deeper and hard to get to and that the uh and you know even if it's not feasible to mine them from the earth it's feasible to mine them from asteroids and stuff like this that like if you can become a spacefaring civilization and escape literally escape the like oppressive force of gravity um like then you go, you basically mine the entire earth down, and this is, like, way too sci-fi, like, to me, as much as I'm, like, yeah, this is a, this, 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 it seems, like, very sci-fi to me, you know, which is fine, it's fine to have things be sci-fi, the solar punk degrowth thing is also fiction, you know, the difference being that indigenous farming practices and permaculture and permacomputing and all of these sorts of things actually exist in the real world, like they have been proven to work. Um, whereas uh, this sort of, you know, the sci-fi version, the Nick Land, uh, fuck it, if the Earth dies, doesn't matter, we can just live in space and mine asteroids and have like a spacefaring civilization and demolish the Earth for its resources in order to create like hyper-intelligent AI that will guide us through the solar system and beyond and self-replicating robots to mine asteroids and stars and so on. Like, uh, that's, that's like, never been done. <laughs> you, you, you require a lot of faith in, uh, like, Nick Land's historical materialism about technology, which I don't really have because I've seen... I used to have it, but I've seen too many situations where it's... Fair. I mean, actually, you know what? He brings it up at the beginning of of Lord of the Void. He's, there's a quote right at the start that says, uh, the idea that we are no longer able to accomplish feats we once could do, like travel to the moon, clashes with the prevailing narrative that we march forever forwards. Not only can't we get to the moon at present, but the US no longer has a space shuttle program, originally envisioned to make space travel as routine as air travel. And for that matter, I no longer have the option to purchase a ticket to fly transatlantic at supersonic speed on the Concorde. Narratives can break. Now, yes, he counters this in the... 
um, in the in Call of the Void, but like I'm not convinced, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, yeah. I've discovered a community of people who, but listen, I mean, if you, if you know Counter-Strike, you know that there's always going to be people who are like 1.6 is the best Counter-Strike and every other Counter-Strike has been bad since then, or at least like not as good as 1.6. Like that is not even a rare opinion. Loads of people who, I mean, people who never played 1.6 have this opinion. Uh, people who were born after 1.6 came out and never played it as, have played like five minutes of 1.6 have this opinion. Now I've played plenty of, I've played like, 100 hours of 1.6, probably around 100 hours of Source, and... Actually, I've played less than 100 hours of 1.6, let's be honest. I've probably played around, like, maybe 80 hours of 1.6, maybe 100 hours of Source, and 3,000 hours of Go. I'm gonna be honest with you, 1.6 is not the best Counter-Strike game. Maybe I'm missing something, but, like, 1.6, the, the, the movement is the best of, of any Counter-Strike game, 100%. But the shooting, and especially the grenades... The grenades in 1.6 are dog shit, okay? They're absolute dog shit. The, and the shooting, it doesn't feel as good as Source or Go, in my opinion. It just doesn't. I mean, maybe it feels... Maybe it's, you have different opinions, but it just doesn't feel as good as as, as, or, or as Source as Go, or Go, and I'm assuming as CS2 as well, when that comes out. Uh, but the movement is absolutely god tier, which makes it, like, a great game to me, because I'm definitely a hardcore movement guy. Uh, but I've discovered that there's a community of people who are like, man, CS was best back in 1.5 or 1.3. 1.6 ruined it. There's a whole community of people who think like the the actually 1.6 was the the time that ruined CS, and that back in 1.5, and that was when it was peak, or 1.3. Those are the two that I see thrown around. 1.5 or 1.3. I never played those ones because you can't find them anywhere. Uh, but that's fucking wild. Apparently, they th they think that, like, the netcode got fucked, uh, in 1.6, and that, like, shooting, f like, felt better before, like, you could hit your shots more accurately or something. I don't know, I'm, I, th these people are wild, man, but I'm, I, you, and you look at some footage of, of, of people playing, like, the older versions of Counter-Strike, and, man, there is definitely something that, like, I wish the B-hopping was more powerful in Counter-Strike, to be honest. Like, there were, it looks way more like a, a more of a movement shooter. I, I, I don't know, man. I kind of feel like I want to go, like, if I ever made a video game, it would be a movement shooter in the Gold Source engine. Like, I can't imagine a better game than that. I know that's kind of, like, that does exist. I mean, there's TF Classic, which is kind of a movement shooter. And there's, a, a, like, Half-Life Deathmatch. Honestly, Half-Life Deathmatch is pretty boring. Like, I've played a decent amount of Half-Life Deathmatch, and I enjoy it. I enjoy Half-Life Deathmatch, but uh, it's very, like, repetitive, you know? Like, there's not much depth to the gameplay, in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong, but there's, there's, I feel like there's not that much depth to the gameplay in Half-Life Deathmatch. Um, and, of course, Half-Life Deathmatch Source is just unplayably bad. You know, you can still play, like, I don't know if people realize this, if you own Half-Life, not Half-Life Source, never play that, the original Half-Life on Steam, just open up the console and you could just type connect and you can, like, that's how you play, you don't, it's not like a dev separate game that you have to download, which I think, like, people don't realize, like, otherwise it would be way more popular, because, like, everyone has Half-Life on their computer. Anyway, sorry, I'm rambling about stuff now. Can I just spend the last bit of this podcast complaining about fucking some e-celebrity that no one cares about? I, I, I can? Thank you. I'm glad. Um, I I really don't harbor very much resentment towards, like, e-celebs that I don't like. Like, there are plenty of them. I don't really like, you know, the, the Kai Senat, I Show Speed sort of crew. Not a big fan of them. I just ignore them. I mean, there's a million billion different people like this and you know i don't i don't particularly like pokemon's content i don't particularly like uh i don't know there's a i don't i don't i'm gonna go through by name i named two streamers but like it doesn't have to be streamers you know what i'm saying like you go through life you find some shit you're like yeah not really for me not really for me 
and you move on. And sometimes you find the people genuinely annoying. Like, I mean, like, for example, I mean, I mentioned Pokimane. Like, I find Pokimane to be kind of annoying to watch and to listen to. But I don't, it's just fine. It's, it's not a big deal. I just don't watch Pokimane, right? It, I don't, if, you, if you're into that, I don't really, you know, it doesn't bother me. It's fine. I'm, uh, I'm never going to go out of my way to shit talk someone just because I don't like their videos. But there is one guy that as time has gone on, I just more and more, like, I've gone from, like, being, you know, the same as every other fucking e-celeb I don't care about into, like, okay, I kind of actively hate this guy. And that's C-Dog VA. He's just so unfunny and annoying. I just fucking hate this guy. So, obviously, he's famous, or pseudo-internet famous, for being on the Trash Taste podcast. Now, I don't like the Trash Taste podcast, in large part because C-Dog VA is on there, but also because I'm not the biggest fan of Giguk or the anime man. Uh, but, you know, Giguk's been a... They're both OGs, especially Giguk. Like, Giguk's been around forever, and I respect the fact that he's an OG. I don't really like his videos, I've never really liked his videos, but he's an OG, he's watched a shitload of anime, he's knowledgeable, he's not a poser. And also... Uh, he's autistic as fuck, which is based, and uh, he also did the uh, the Digibro vs. Giguk panel, which in my opinion is an all-time classic YouTube video, and that kind of redeems him in my eyes. He seems like a genuinely nice guy. Like, every time I see him, back when I was more watching anime YouTube and I would see him show up in someone else's stuff, he always seemed like a nice guy to have, like, just a chill guy. Even though I don't really like his videos, he seemed like a chill guy. No problem with it. And the anime man is a pretty similar way. Like, I don't really care about his videos. It, it, he is what it is. I'm not going to watch him. He doesn't have very good taste, in my opinion. But he has okay taste. He's not terrible. It's like, yeah, like, sure, whatever. He speaks Japanese. I mean, so that gives him some access to parts of the industry and the world that, that most YouTubers don't have access to. So, yeah, cool, show. This fucking guy, C-Dog V8. I've never watched one of his videos. Actually, I have. I watched one of his videos by accident. He just constantly shows up in other people's videos and just ruins them. Because <laughs> he's just so painfully unfunny and annoying and uncharismatic and yet is convinced that he's the hottest shit in the world. It's insane to me. I mean, the the least thing to complain about, to, the, the least important aspect of this is that He's on the biggest anime podcast, which they don't talk about anime as I understand it. I don't know. I've never watched an episode of Trash Taste. I don't like the philosophy of Trash Taste. I don't like the, the attitude they have towards anime. The sort of anime is trash and so am I philosophy. I don't like that. They don't watch the same anime as me. It's not really relevant to my interests. Um, but like, fine, you know, whatever. I don't care. What was I talking about? This fucking guy, he shows up in everything. He shows up everywhere. You go, I go watch a German video, he's there. I go watch a Ludwig video, he's there. You know, he's just always fucking everywhere. I, I, and it's just annoying. Because he's not funny. And he's he's annoying to be around. And he's, he's, he's way too confident in his own clout. I watch an Abroad in Japan video, otherwise, great channel. Every time he has fucking Sea Dog on his videos, it's so bad, it's so annoying. I don't understand how he's, and it's not just me. My dad thinks the same thing. My dad watches Abroad in Japan, and we were, like, like a year ago or two, whatever, he was talking to me about Abroad in Japan, and without me even mentioning it, he brought it up. He was like, that fucking guy that shows up in some of his videos. Why does he keep hanging out with this guy? And I was like, I know, right? This fucking guy. Like, the reason I'm thinking about this is I'm watching this VOD of Jama. He did a, a House Flipper Invitational stream. It's the least important thing ever. Who cares, right? But it's a fun stream. It's just annoying that Sea Dog has to come in and just, just ruin everything for no reason because he, like, thinks he's hot shit and thinks he's funny. Like... He, he, he comes in, and instead of, like, making a, a funny gimmick house, like, or, or putting some memes around, or maybe putting actual effort in, you know, it's fine if you want to make a meme one. Many people made meme joke ones. It's a German stream. It's meme. It's funny. It's whatever, right? Instead of that, what he does is he just puts a bunch of walls down, like, just walls and walls and walls to create a sort of 
maze-like structure, which it could be funny, I think, if he pulled it if he pulled it off correctly. But he, any he 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 then goes on to say it's it's like inspired by the back rooms, which is like it's it's like 2023, motherfucker. You're still doing back rooms. Come on. He's very much like this. He's very much like dead memes as a guy. Um, but like, even then, it's fine. If you want to do some back rooms thing, I don't really care that much. Like, I, I, I'll just move on. Like, I think it could be funny to make like a, oh, and then you go down into the basement and there's the maze section of the house. Like, that's kind of an amusing idea. But it was his only idea. So he just makes the entire house this maze. Which isn't a maze, because it's just, a, it's it's not actually, that would be interesting. Instead of that, it's just like one path that's just like snaking around. And then he covers all the walls with the worst fucking memes you've ever seen. Like, I'm seeing memes in this house that literally from 2013. I'm seeing Shrek memes! There are fucking Shrek memes! This is insane! This is insanity! And he didn't even get them! He just asked his Discord for it. He couldn't even be bothered to go through the effort to like put his own memes on it. He just asked his Discord to do it. He just grabbed them from his Discord. And it's like, yeah, his Discord has... It's so bad. It's so bad. It's just so bad. And then the thing that annoys me about this is not just that, like... Okay, fine, you make an unfunny submission to some stream, who cares? It's the fact that, first of all, he made his... Because he made it this, like, long-ass snaking corridor and nothing else, it's really long. So his segment takes up way more time than everyone else's, which is just, an, like, it's just intruding. It's just annoying. Just don't do that. And then secondly, he keeps butting in. He keeps butting in to everyone else's segments and just going like, hmm, where's the maze, though? Like, yeah, it doesn't have a maze in it. I thought you had to build a maze. You're not funny. You're just not... F please stop. You're, you are, you're not funny. You're not entertaining. You're not charismatic. You're just annoying. To everyone who's over the age of 12, we don't want you here. And it's not just me. Germa's chat fucking gave him a, the lowest grade possible. They clearly hate him. He's an annoying... I don't... Look, he just seems like an annoying... As Not just as a... Not just his videos are bad, but he seems otherwise fine. Like 90% of these people. He just seems like an actually annoying person. He's the sort of guy that will get out, outed as like a pedophile in, in like two years time or something. Because, like, there's something, something's off with him. There is something, like, deeply wrong with him. Maybe not a pet. I think he's gonna, like, do something weird to a woman. Because, like, he's, he's way too, like, like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to put it. I, I, it. I just feel like it's gonna happen. Okay, this is a stupid segment. Apparently, the reason people like him, like, his gimmick, is that apparently, like, Americans find his voice, like, really sexy and cool. It just sounds like a completely normal... Well, it actually doesn't. If you're from the UK, then you know that, like, if you if someone says they're from Wales and they have that accent, they are comically posh. So to me, his voice just reads as, like, comically posh. I think to Americans, it reads like, I don't know, classy Englishman. But he's not, like, the, the, there's a, a, a difference, right? Uh, if you sound like that in England, you're just from so the south of England. You're just from, like, you know, London or whatever. And, and you're, like, middle class. If you sound like that in Wales, you know, you are, you are upper middle class to upper class. It's been a few days since the TF2 update came out. And while I haven't had enough time to evaluate all the maps, I want to give some 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 cursory thoughts to the ones that I have played. Um, so I haven't played Pelican Peak. I haven't played Reckoner. I played a little bit on Reckoner. It was okay. Uh, but, but only one match. I also only played one match. Or I played one match on Hardwood. And it did not seem very good to me. But I've only played one match. Uh, I've not played on Sulfur yet. Cashworks, I am willing to say, is actually kind of a bad map. Uh, it's too long. It's like the distances between points is too long. There are like three chokes between each point. Um, it's way too like there are there are spots where sniper sight lines are egregious, where wrangled sentries are ridiculously overpowered. Fighting through the chokes is often just not fun. 
like the chokes aren't interesting in any way like it just gets kind of spammy in and not even in a fun dust bowl kind of way just in a sort of boring way um not a big fan of cash works to be honest with you uh yeah i don't i don't really like any of the points i'm thinking back through the map none of the map to me is fun to fight over maybe i need time to adjust to it maybe i'm judging it too soon but I have not had any fun <laughs> on cash works. Uh, Phoenix, I think, is interesting. The last is good. Uh, the rest of the map is okay. It's actually, weirdly, I've been having fun playing Soldier on Phoenix. I don't play Soldier at all. I don't know why. For some reason, I seem to like do okay with Soldier on phoenix um it's it's not a bad map it's not great it has some problems i mean the whole like first two points i just find to be well the first point isn't too bad the second point is a it's a bit weird like i'm not saying it's bad necessarily i just find it kind of weird i'll need time to get used to it um it's it's okay. It's a, it's so far I would consider it to be okay. I would need to play it more to really decide if I like like it or don't like it. Uh, Venice, I have only played half a match on, so I, I can't really judge it. Rotunda, I I quite like Rotunda. I didn't like it at first, but it's grown on me. It's pretty good. It's not amazing. It's not my favorite King of the Hill map, but honestly, it's it's pretty good. It is pretty good. I like the way it looks, I like the way it plays, I like the point, it's good. I haven't played on Shark Bay yet, and finally, Selbien, uh, I'm sure is a good map, I have nothing against it as a map, and it has a cute seal on it, which is incredibly cute, and I love it, um, and the map looks nice, and whatever, but the game mode, this, this player destruction game mode with the seal, I just cannot make it work for me. I, I don't know why, but like the second I'm playing this game, it's like I lose all of my skill. I have just had terrible game after terrible game on this map. And it's not my teammates, because like my team can be winning. I am just incapable of doing well in this game mode. I have no idea why. Uh, not the map's fault at all. Definitely my fault. I don't really know what's going on. It shouldn't be that difficult. But for some reason, I just lose any ability to play the game well. The second I'm playing player destruction, apparently, I have discovered. So, um, yeah, makes it kind of hard for me to judge the map objectively. <laughs> it's not the map that's bad. Like, there is nothing wrong with I I think the map's pretty good. I mean, it looks great. It has the seal. You can't go wrong. I am just incapable of playing well on it. Uh, so, yeah, those are my opinions. I... Uh, yeah, I don't believe I've played any of... That's that's all the maps that I've played. Okay, that's the end of this uh, podcast. Hope you enjoyed. Head on over. If you're a, a YouTube listener, this, will, this, this and future podcasts are on my website, hopefully. Hopefully. If they're not, then there's like some something in a pinned comment or in the description about it. But hopefully... Everything's on my website. Oh, whoops. I accidentally pressed record. Well, I'm off to Estonia. So, see ya.